Sick Heart, written by J. A. Huss, performed by Lessa Lamb and Troy Duran. Chapter 1. Anya Kurt van Breda's body conjures up images of sculpted marble, the pages of a master's sketchbook, or the god Adonis come to life. Eyes are drawn to him, and once your gaze lands, it's caught, like a prisoner. He is a cage with steel bars and bulky locks with large keyholes. His dark hair is cropped short, but he runs his hand over his skull like maybe just yesterday there was something there. Something to feel that has since been removed. He pauses for a moment, taking in the ship and the people around him. This gives the reporters an opportunity to swoop in, but one of his entourage pushes the people back with force. And even though I can't hear what he's saying, I read his lips. Get back! Get the fuck back! He's pushing them, hard, making a scene. But it works, because Court is ushered into a cleared area by some mercenary types, and I get an even better look at him as he's led down the stairs closest to me. No shirt, so I can see the dozens of tattoos on his upper body with perfect clarity as he walks towards the command center. He looks over his shoulder down the main deck of the ship. His father's ship, so he's probably been here many times. His expression is flat and unreadable, and if I were pressed to pin an emotion on him, I would call him indifferent, maybe even apathetic. I'm six stories up in the reception room above the command center, which is not that close, so maybe I'm wrong. But I doubt it. I'm very skilled at reading men. I've read up on Court Van Breda. He's the reigning superstar of the underground fighting ring my father and his ilk are obsessed with. Court was on the cover of Ring of Fire three months ago when this match was announced, and after my father was done with the magazine, and I was sure he wouldn't notice that it went missing, I took it and read every word about the man they call Sick Heart. He's ruthless, they say. Undefeated for the past 22 years, which is almost unheard of in this world we live in. He has won every fight they've put him in since he was placed in his first fight-to-the-death match at age five. There are no real records of those fights, no vids or even an article. Five-year-old fighters aren't newsworthy. They almost never turn into a sick heart. But I wish there were. I would like to see those fights. My mind begins to picture this man as a boy all those years ago, and all the things he's had to do to stay alive since then. I quickly rein those thoughts in. There's no point. He is six foot two, 175 pounds, and covered in tattoos. The Ring of Fire article was obsessed with his body art, and so am I. Skulls. He's partial to skulls. And each one, if the rumors are true, represents someone he's killed. He didn't admit that in the article, of course, so it's just a rumor. But there are rumors, and then there are reputations. Court Van Breda, the sick heart, is more of a reputation guy at this point in time. So even if you've never seen him fight, it's not hard to imagine that the rumor might be true. His eyes in the photographs I studied were a deep, soulful, silver gray. And when his gaze wanders up the side of the command center, it feels like they land right on me. I take a quick step back from the window. I don't want his attention. No one in their right mind wants his attention. Men like him, men who fight in these fights, 
they don't make it to 27 years old still psychologically intact. It's not even remotely possible that Court von Breda is sane. The article didn't mention much about his personal life, didn't say anything about his wives or where he lives, didn't give up anything about his hobbies or interests. In fact, it talked more about the entourage of friends following him down on the deck right now than it did him. Two are not fighters themselves, but trainers in court's camp. All the Ring of Firefighters run training centers. It's the only way to keep these fights going, because there is a dead body at the end of every match. These men, they only exist to kill one another. This is Court's last fight. I overheard my father saying so a few weeks back, and Court is not the favorite tonight. He's been around too long, and at 27, he's two years older than his opponent, Pavo. That's two additional years of abuse. Two additional years of hardcore training, the type of training that breaks a body down quicker and quicker with each passing year. Two years is a big deal in the ring. Court has had at least a dozen more fights than his opponent tonight, and in this world, too much experience is a liability. The article was mostly the rules tonight, the opponent, the prize, and, of course, the ring. There are no rules. It's fight to the death by any means possible. The opponent is Pavo Vervonal, a ruthless man I've known my whole life because my father owns him and the training center he runs. The prize is complicated, as is the ring, because it's not a ring at all. It's a ship. These fights never take place in a gym or an event center. That's far too dull and banal for the people who run my world. They need drama. They thrive on it. The ship, called the Bull of Light, is definitely dramatic. It's a massive floating oil rig installation vessel currently carrying a fully assembled five-story oil rig that will be carefully placed on a platform in the Gulf of Mexico sometime next week. But for now, is being used as a hotel for over 150 invited guests. We're in the South Atlantic, somewhere between Villa dos Remedios and French Guiana. My family arrived yesterday. Pavo, the sick heart's opponent, is family, for lack of a better word. He needed time to acclimate to the sea because he trains in Thailand, so we came early. I guess Court Van Breda didn't feel the need for the same consideration because the fight is tonight, and he obviously just got here. The ship is not just the ring, but also the prize. Part of it, at least. Court's father, for lack of a better word, is Udolf Van Houten. He currently owns an 81% controlling interest in this massive $2.8 billion ship. But if Pavo wins tonight, my father will knock him down to 49%, and the majority of the ship's profits will change hands. The prize is as complicated as the ring, because if Pavo loses, I will change hands as well. I wonder what the sick heart thinks about that. I take a quick step towards the window again so I can watch him as he approaches the command center. And just before he disappears inside, he looks up and pauses, watching me watch him. Then his friend pushes him inside and he disappears. I walk over to one of the overstuffed leather couches and take a seat. It's nice and cool up here in the reception room. Almost chilly, since I'm the only one here, but I enjoy it while it lasts. It's sticky hot outside, and later tonight, after the fight is over, all the important people will be up here for the celebration, 
and I will have forgotten all about what it feels like to sit in cool comfort, alone and unbothered. And just as those thoughts manifest in my head, right on cue, the door flies open with a bang, and Bexy, my nine-year-old sister, for lack of a better word, comes racing in, squealing with delight. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! OMG! 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 Did you see him? She places a hand over her heart and sighs. Ah, uh, I'm dead! Dead, Anya! Were you looking? I nod at her. Of course you were looking, she giggles. You should have seen the lady crew from the laundry. They were all dying. Dying, Anya. Falling over dead. He's so gorgeous, don't you think? I, of course, do not answer her. But someone else does. No. Bexy and I both turn towards the door to find Pavo walking into the reception room. He's looking very put together. Short-sleeved collared shirt, dark pressed jeans, mahogany hair slicked back. He even smells good. He walks over to me, extends his hand, and pulls me to my feet. He spins me around, leans his mouth into my neck, and whispers, Do you find him pretty, Anya? Are your panties wet for him? I roll my eyes. Bexy makes a face. You're gross, Pavo. You should not talk to us like that. Pavo laughs. Get the fuck out of here, you little baby brat. I need some time alone with your sister. She doesn't like you, Bexy sneers at him. In fact, she hates you. Doesn't matter, does it? Pavo licks my ear. Bexy and I both make a face, but I don't move, and neither does she. It doesn't matter if you like me, does it, Anya? Because after I win this fight tonight, you're mine. Forever. Bexy frowns. She's not yours, and you're not going to win. Court is. Pavo pushes me off him and crosses the distance to Bexy in an instant. Her face is red from the slap before I can even move to stop him. Shut up, you little whore! Go find your stupid daddy. Anya is mine. Bexy, not the kind of girl who can be deterred by a single slap, plants her hands on her hips and tips her chin up. No! You can go find my stupid daddy and make sure you tell him you called him stupid because I will if you don't. She points to her cheek. I hope it's nice and red. So when he asks, my dearest Bexy, why is your cheek red? I will say, fucking Pavo did it because I told him he was going to lose and Anya would never have to let him lick her ear again. She screams this, then makes a face and shivers. Girls don't like ear licking, Pavo. Even a child knows that. I love her. I really do. She is the very best thing about my life. But Pavo is just like any other fighter in the Ring of Fire circuit. Ruthless. Violent. Intolerant. Insane. He grabs her by the hair and drags her through the open door. My mind follows the sound of their feet stomping on the metal stairs as they descend. Then, Bexy is screaming and wailing, and I know she is putting up a fight. I let out a long sigh and sit back down on the couch. Less than a minute later, Pavo is back. He slams the door closed as he enters, and the banging echoes off the high ceiling of the large room. She is a stupid little whore. Stupid fucking whore. I don't say anything. There's nothing to say anyway. 
Pavo will rant no matter what I do. And even though I'm 99% sure that Father won't beat Bexy over this, it still makes me mad that Pavo caused a scene. I don't like scenes. I like calm. You are mine, Anya. You know that, right? When I win tonight, you will be mine. That's my prize. Your father can have control over this stupid ship. I don't want it. I will take you back to Thailand, and you will never see that stupid bitch of a sister again. Do you hear me? Of course, I hear him. He's yelling in a reception hall that echoes. The door bangs open again, and both Pavo and I startle and turn. Oh, hey, the man says with a broad smile. He's one of Court's friends, the inner circle entourage people. Mart, if I remember his name correctly from the Ring of Fire article. But then he's pushed out of the way by... I stop breathing. Court von Breda's steel gray eyes find mine. But he looks away, searching the room. Then, without comment, he turns toward the bar at the far end and starts walking that way. Pavo and I are silent as Court reaches for a bottle of electric blue liquid on the top shelf. But then Pavo snaps out of it. What the fuck do you think you're doing? You can't take that. It's Bokori. He's referring to the bottle of Lectra in Court's hand. And Pavo is right. Court is insane if he thinks he can just walk in here and steal a hundred thousand dollars worth of Lectra. Since Court's father is the host tonight, the rest of the families have to bring gifts. This bottle is the Bokori family party favor. It goes to the winner. And clearly, there is no winner yet, so... Did you hear what I just said? Pavo is crossing the room. You can't fucking take that. Listen, Mart says calmly from his position by the door. You can argue with him all you want, but he's taking the fucking bottle. If you want to have your fight right here, right now, well, I'm pretty sure that's not going to go over well with 150 VIPs currently placing bets in the topside mess hall. So you should maybe shut the fuck up and back off before he and I kill you and put an end to this night before it starts. My mouth makes a little O shape. And then I laugh. I can't help it. This is the first truly funny thing I've witnessed in a very long time. Pavo is speechless. First, my bratty nine-year-old sister yanks his chain. Now his current mortal enemy is stealing something precious. Something he very much thinks is his. And there's nothing he can do about it. Court turns and heads back towards his friends at the door. But his eyes narrow down into slits as he passes me. I meet his gaze and realize he is everything they say about him. Ruthless, violent, intolerant, insane. Just like every other fighter in the Ring of Fire. But I drop my eyes quickly and then get a good long look at those skulls on his body. This is the moment when I believe the rumors. This is the moment when his reputation sinks in. This is the moment I know in my heart he is sick. He has won 35 Ring of Fire death matches. This does not include all the people he fought on his way up as a child. Because there are a lot more than 35 skulls on his body. A lot more. When I look up again, his steel gray eyes find mine. And I feel like his next victim. Chapter 2 Court Hot. Everything about this day is just fucking hot. 
So before I even get out of the helicopter, I take my shirt off and throw it aside. We exit. Mart first, so he can speak for me. His loose button-down shirt flaps in the vortex of wind created by the propellers. His slicked-back hair barely moves, and even though this day will turn into something shitty and dark no matter how it ends, I take a moment to internally grin as I admire Mart's commitment to his fucking hair. Everett and I jump out next. He's nervous, I can tell. But he's still very young and those nerves are for me, so I don't complain or poke him when he presses too close. Rayner brings up the rear. His bulky body outgrew the fights long before they got too serious. He was lucky in a way. All that muscle made him far too slow for anyone to take much notice of his strengths. But he's a damn good fighter. God help you if you find yourself this man's target. He's pushing people out of our way like the Hulk, shoving this way and that. People stumble backwards and then decide they don't want to push him and stay where they land. We walk forward towards the Bull of Light command center and I look up, expecting to see my father pointing me out to his friends on the bridge. He's there. And he does point. But my attention goes up one floor higher where a blonde girl stands in the window. She takes a step back when she realizes I've noticed her, but reappears a few seconds later just before Everett and I pass through the door out of sight. The stairs leading up are crammed with workers, but they press themselves against the open railing so we can pass. None of them look me in the eye. Who was that girl? Everett reaches for my hand, but I shake him off and shoot him a stern look. Sorry. His voice is low, just a mumble. But I don't like this. Shut up. Mart's words are harsh and curt. He's not in the mood for whining. This is a fight day. First one in over a year. First one Everett has ever been to, as well. Which explains his fear. Don't be a dick, Mott. Rainer grabs Everett and holds him in place as I keep moving. They stay several steps behind me after that. I can hear Rainer whispering something to the kid, but he's being discreet, so I don't catch the pep talk. I can imagine it, though. He's gonna win. Don't worry. He always wins. Which is true. If you're still alive at the end, you win. And I'm still here. Pavo Vervanal is no slacker, but I am going to win. He will lose. We trained together when we were small, and he was good. But we went our separate ways a long, long time ago for a reason. Only boys like me end up where I am. He is no me. Suddenly, Mart stops, and when I look up, I realize there's a crowd of people on the landing just below the command deck. We just want an interview. It's an older woman making this demand. She's still pretty. Was probably someone important 20 years ago. But she wears too much makeup and her clingy, revealing red dress is far too much for this sticky day. Her cameraman stands behind her, his equipment perched on his shoulder, his eyes only on me. There is a flashing red light indicating that he's already recording. You know press time isn't for another three hours. She's not going to get anywhere with Mart. He has one job. Keep all the no-brain fucks away from me. And he's pissed about the ambush. You don't have to know him to hear the anger in his voice. Just a word. The reporter pushes her hands in the air, one clenched into a fist and holding a mic. Just one question. It's for Ring of Fire. One question. Then her gaze lands on me. Court, do you think the prize is fair? She only wants me to answer one question, and that's the one she asks. Like I give any fucks at all about the prize. Nothing about this fight is about me. Not one moment of it is about me. Mart is beyond pissed now. He doesn't do interviews. He shoves her out of the way, then stands in front of her so I can pass. Rainer and Everett come up behind me, but Mart hangs back to insult the washed-up reporter. The marks take over at the bridge and the door opens as I approach. When I walk through, I'm hit with a rush of cold, conditioned air. That feels good. I suck in a breath and smile internally when I hear Everett do the same behind me. 
Then my father is walking towards us with Pavo's sponsor, a little girl, blonde, striking blue-green eyes, pigtails, striped sailor suit dress, grabs the sponsor's hand and giggles excitedly as they stop in front of me. My father grabs my upper arm and squeezes. Then he pulls me in and kisses me on both cheeks before letting me go to turn towards his guest. You remember Court, right, Lazar? Lazar is pushing the little girl away, telling her in Hungarian to go upstairs and find someone called Anya. I take a moment to pause and wonder if Anya was the blonde girl I saw in the window. The little girl pouts, but doesn't argue. Lazar has a Mediterranean look about him, like he spends a lot of time in Greece. Very tall, very tan, almost ludicrously tan, and his white linen shirt highlights this. His hair is blondish, dyed, or maybe it's truly sun-bleached, but somehow I doubt it. Lazar offers me his hand. I stare at it for a moment. Normally, Mart would run interference for me in this type of situation, but he's still back near the door with Rainer and Everd. I look back up, meet his gaze, and narrow my eyes. Lazar laughs. <laughs> Sick heart! He says the words in two separate sentences, the way they are supposed to be said when spoken out loud, but something about it rubs me the wrong way. So when he takes a step forward and claps me on the shoulder, well, that's it. The next thing I know, my knuckles are stinging, his nose is bloody, and several of the soulless mercenaries are pulling me off him and holding me by the arms. Lazar wipes his hand across his upper lip as the mercs push me away. But then his tongue darts out to taste the blood, and he chuckles. <laughs> boy, he says, meaning me. I am the boy. You turned out well. His accent isn't thick, but it's there. My father does not apologize, but he does shoot me a look. Go clean up, Court. Grab a drink, for fuck's sake. Calm down a little. The fight won't start for seven more hours. I have brought tribute. Lazar's teeth are stained with blood when he smiles at me. It's upstairs in the bar. You may have it, early boy, if you're man enough to take it. I shoot a dangerous, sideways glance at Lazar and find him smirking at me. I suddenly want to kill this man. Not sure why. Not sure I need a reason why. I just want to kill this man. My father spins me around, points his finger in my face. Do not drink it, Court. Do you hear me? Do not. His eyes shoot to Mart. Give him a whiskey. Why not? Lazar is laughing. I really hate that laugh. Pavo will be on Lectra when he fights. It's only fair for your boy here. You will not. My father is deadly fucking serious as he looks me in the eyes. Do you understand me, Court? I sneer at him and he smiles. Then he squeezes my shoulder again and leans in. Don't look at me that way. It's my job to keep you in line tonight. It's an important night for you as well as me. Tonight, we are a team, and we don't want anything to go wrong. Tonight, we are a team. Interesting way to put it. Yes, Lazar says. Fuck. Why can't that man just shut up? Every time I hear his voice, I get the urge to throttle him. The stakes are high tonight. Not now, Lazar, my father cautions him. Why not now? Surely your son would like to know what he's fighting for. I know what I'm fighting for. It was explained to me in the contract. Keeping our family's controlling interest in this ship. It doesn't sound like much. But this is no ordinary ship. A heavy lift construction vessel, it's a floating city, and presently the only one of its size. When it's in international waters, and it almost always is, it's practically a nation-state. Impervious to the laws of others. Not even the Americans can stop the business we do on this ship. And my father owns most of it. Not all of it. The network would never allow one man to hold that much power. But most of it is practically the same thing. 
It generates an obscene amount of legitimate money each year installing topsides onto oil rig substructures. Tens of billions of dollars. But the illegitimate money is just as precious. These fights, for instance. This night is just one of dozens each year, but they host more than fights on this ship. We will talk about this later. I nod at my father. I don't care about the prize. The winning lost its shine more than a decade ago now. I fight because they make me. I turn and walk towards the door. The mercenaries open it, and I slip through first, then Mart, then Rayner, and Everett in the rear. We're going this way, Mart says, heading down. But I go up. Guess we're not, Rayner laughs. Wait here, Mart orders them. Then he races up the steps ahead of me. Court, he pauses in front of the door. You do not want that bottle. Do you understand me? I push him out of the way, but he's not afraid of me and pushes me right back. I will hit him. Any fucking time I want. But I'm not going to kill him, and Mart is no pussy. He will retaliate, and he and I are well enough matched that I will probably come out ahead, but just barely. He knows I'm not going to hit him today. Not on a fight day. I will have enough bruises when I step off the platforms at night. I don't need any extras going in. You do not want that bottle. You hear me? I want that bottle, and he knows it. That's why he feels the need to repeat himself. <sighs> Fuck, he sighs, then opens the door with a bang. Oh, hey! I am not in the mood for one of his charismatic, long-winded speeches to explain my actions, so I just push him out of the way and enter the reception hall. My eyes take in the massive room and... Well, well, well. There she is. The girl from the window. Anya, Lazar called her. She is young. Much younger than me. Maybe eighteen. But probably not. I know how these people work. I know their sick hearts better than I know my own. But she is very pretty. Slender and willowly, like a ballerina. But on the small side. Fragile and strong in the same breath. Her hair is light blonde, very straight at the moment, and long. Her fair skin and soft features tell me she is not actually related to Lazar. There is no resemblance whatsoever. He calls her daughter in the most derogatory way possible. Same way my father calls me son. The other little girl is missing. They look enough alike that they might be real sisters, but again, I doubt it. Anya. I say her name in my head, memorizing the way it feels, enjoying the hate it conjures up. Not for her. I do not give a single fuck about her. Lazar. He's familiar in an unfamiliar way, and everything about that is ugly. My gaze wanders over to the bar and I stride towards it with purpose. Everyone is silent as I reach for an electric blue bottle on the top shelf. The fuck do you think you're doing? I look at Pavo, then down at the bottle of Lectra in my hand, taking a moment to appreciate the almost glowing light blue color of the drug inside. It doesn't look like water. You don't need to be smart to know this is not colored water. It's too thick. Viscous. Like an oil. But it's not oily going down. It's cold. Ice cold. It burns your throat, then your stomach, then... Just a few minutes later, you float. You float through worlds. You feel like Superman. You want to kill people and save the world in the same instant. It's indescribably seductive. And addictive. I look up and study Pavo for a moment, looking for the telltale signs of Lectra addiction, but he's too far away to see the blue ring around the iris. I'll be close enough tonight to solve that little mystery. You can't take that! Pavo is still moaning. It's Bukori! It's fucking tribute is what it is. 
We both know I will win this fight tonight. So even if Lazar didn't say I could have it early, I could take it anyway. Did you hear what I just fucking said? Pavel is crossing the room. You can't fucking take that! Listen, Mart says this word calmly, still standing by the door. You can argue with him all you want, but he's taking the fucking bottle. If you want to have your fight right here, right now, well, I'm pretty sure that's not going to go over well with 150 VIPs currently placing bets on the topside mess hall. So you should maybe shut the fuck up and back off before he and I kill you and put an end to this night before it starts. Anya's laugh almost startles me. It's so, I don't know, so out of place here. So musical and happy that I almost ask her to do it again. What? I have to shake my head at that last thought. Her veins might not have Lazar's blood running through them, but she is the enemy's daughter. I lock eyes with her as I cross the room. She lets out a breath like she's about to piss herself with fear. Good. You should fear me, little girl. Everyone should fear me. Because inside my chest beats the sickest heart on this whole ship. And if I win, none of the guests will rest tonight. I don't care how many fights they've been to. I don't care how many ways they've seen it end. I will give them a show they will never forget. I will haunt their sleep like a monster. I will fill their hearts with terror. I will ruin them with the memory of me. One floor down, Rainer and Everett are waiting for us. Everett's eyes go wide when he sees the bottle of bright blue liquid in my hand. I shove it into his chest and he wordlessly clutches it. I catch the Murrick standing guard at the command room door, eyeing the kid, probably imagining ten or twelve different ways they might steal that bottle from him. But then one of them, the leader, I think, locks eyes with me. He looks away real quick. Forget the fact that my father is Udolf Van Houten, the man who controls this ship. I might not have an arsenal strapped to my body the way this Merc does, but I'm not a guy you fuck with on a whim. It would be a very stupid move to steal that bottle of Lectra from my boy and that Merc gets it. I go down the stairs and my team follows. This ship is only four years old, but there are others. Older ones. Smaller ones that I spent far more time on. Hell, I practically grew up on the deep sea galaxy. But I know my way around the Bull of Light. My last four fights have been hosted here. My team and I have dedicated quarters on the deck below the command center. I push through a door, take us out onto a catwalk, and then enter the port side structure where my family compartments are. This is Everett's first time here. So when I step into the main room and wave everyone forward, it's his face I concentrate on. I really like to make the stupid kid happy for some reason. Maybe because I remember all too well what it was like for me when I was his age. He doesn't disappoint. His smile is broad and real as he crosses the room and stands in front of the window, looking out at the work happening down below us. We have a perfect view of the massive crane on the port side. It's not busy right now, but it's still something impressive. There are dozens of men down on the deck. It's actually quite a nice place to people watch, if you're into that sort of thing. Wow. Everett is properly impressed. Rainer walks over and takes the bottle from him, holds it up. What the fuck are you going to do with this? I grab it, walk into the head, pop the cork, and start pouring out a hundred thousand dollars worth of Lectra. Jesus Christ! Mart is behind me, crowding me, grabbing the bottle before I can waste any more. You don't pour it out, dickface. We're gonna drink this later after you win. I laugh a little. Now that reminds me of the girl. She laughed a little too, and I liked the sound of that laugh. Who is she? Lazar's daughter, for lack of a better word. Obviously. But her presence here is a little bit disturbing. I suddenly crave some alone time so I can think about her a little more. 
There are two sleeping compartments on either side of the main room with bunk beds. I share with Mart, and Everett and Rainer will take the other one. So that's where I head next. Mart doesn't follow. He knows my fight day routine. Actually, it's not just a fight day routine. It's more like an everyday routine. At least when I can get it. There are interviews scheduled in a few hours. I will have to attend so they can get photos of me before the fight, but Mart will do all the talking. So I don't need to worry about that, and I can empty out my head and let my thoughts drift. I like being alone. If I never had to be around another person, I'd be okay with it. I slide the pocket door closed, and my crew immediately begins chatting. This used to bother me. The idea that they would hold things in when I was around, but talk freely when I wasn't. I hate it. I really do. But I've learned to live with it. I can't change who I am. Maybe I could have. Twenty-two years ago, I might have been able to change, if things had gone differently. But that chance slipped out of my control a long way back. And anyway, even if I could change, no one would stop seeing me as the killer they know me to be. So, whatever. I strip out of my traveling clothes and lie down on the bottom bunk naked. Then I close my eyes and think about that girl as my hand drifts down the hard muscles of my stomach. I pause, then reach for my already stiffening cock and start to tug on it. I liked the way she looked in that window. She was a mystery. I liked the way her face was lit up with the late-day sunshine. I liked her pouty lips, and I picture what it would feel like to have them wrapped around my shaft. I breathe a little harder as the fantasy takes hold. My cock grows stiffer as the dream takes shape. I liked her silence, too. I could hear it immediately. It's just like mine. She is just like me. Damaged and broken. Hurt and sore, used and discarded. But that laugh, that was truly unexpected. I liked the way she laughed. I liked the small hint of joy in that outburst, and I wonder how attached she is to Pavo. I wonder if she will watch the fight tonight. I wonder if she will still be laughing when it's over. I wake up to the sound of Mart's voice. Hey, fuckface, it's time, okay? Interviewers have actually been waiting an hour already, but you looked so goddamn peaceful, I didn't want to wake you up. My hand is still clutched around my cock, and I realize I drifted off without finishing. My eyes wander over to Mart. He's naked with his back to me, all his scars on full display. I catch a glimpse of his cock dangling between his legs when he reaches to hang a newly pressed button-down shirt on a hook. I swing my legs out of bed, stand up, cross the distance between us, then slip my hand between his legs to grab his balls as I bite his shoulder. Mart hisses in pain because when I bite, I bite hard. Jesus fucking Christ, Court. I back off, allowing him room to turn. He looks down at my hand on my cock. His eyes lift back up to meet mine. I take his hand and place it around my shaft, and he immediately begins to tug on it. Then he reaches for my hand and places it around his cock. My hand covers his, and his hand covers mine. And we jerk each other off like that. I press my body into him, and he backs up until he's against the door. I bury my head into his neck and he does the same. We don't kiss, and we don't talk. We don't need to explain ourselves. We don't need to feel anything about what we're doing. We just do it. That's all there is to it. Chapter 3 Anya The muscles, the tattoos, the pure, raw power of him. But most of all, those silver-gray eyes. 
There is no way to get Court Van Breda out of my mind after that encounter in the reception hall. The way he looked at me, like he was drawn to me. But then, that sneer. If he had been closer and Pavo hadn't been talking, I think I might have heard a growl. Sick heart. That's what they called him in the Ring of Fire article. Two words with two periods. Like you have to pause between each one to get the full effect of how disturbing he is. I was raised a certain way. I have been around certain people who had expectations of me. And if I didn't meet those expectations, there were consequences. I became intuitive instinctual. It was a survival mechanism. And eventually, these instincts became habit. And those habits turned into something natural and innate, something I did without thinking. I read people. I put very little weight on words, even though I have more words inside me than maybe anyone else on this godforsaken planet. Words don't mean much. I've lived with more than my fair share of empty promises, so I know this firsthand. No, I look for something other than words. I look at the eyes first, the lips, the eyebrows, Are the shoulders tight and tense, or open and relaxed? Words never tell you as much about a person as body language. You don't need words when you can look a person in the eye. But even this is not enough. Not in the world I live in. You need to see into their hearts. That's where the truth lives. And this is how I process my world. This is how I get through it. Pavo is still raging about court, even though he disappeared nearly half an hour ago now. The fucking nerve, Pavo is saying over and over again. The fucking nerve! Pavo has described how he will win this fight tonight about 75 different ways. He wants to break Court's bones. He wants a head injury. He wants to snap Court's back and force him to watch, powerless, as he chops his throat and crushes his windpipe. And as brutal as it sounds, it's a lot tamer than the plans he was making last night. Pavo has just been sipping the Lectra today, but last night he was raging drunk on it, and today he has to pay the price for that. Lectra is a weird drink. It turns you inside out for a while, and then, when it's gone, you flip back. But if you get in the habit of this, eventually, you're never the same on the trip back. When you're an addict, you're never yourself again. Ever. You're always a little bit meaner, a little bit darker a little bit closer to hopeless. I've only sipped the blue liquid about half a dozen times. I was not high last night. As long as it is my choice, I will never drink Lectra with Pavo. It sexualizes you, makes you crave things you never normally would, erases inhibitions, degrades common sense, reduces what's left of your moral code. And let's face it, no one on this ship can afford any more erosion of their moral codes. Last night, Pavo couldn't stop talking about cutting off Court's dick. In fact, all he did was talk about what he wanted to do to Court's dick. I was forced to listen to him last night. It could have been worse. I could have been forced to do more than just listen to him, so whatever. He spent most of the night jerking off in a corner, talking the entire time. Talking about court and how they were boys together. He was my friend, 
Pavo said drunkenly. Did I ever tell you that, Nusi? I hate that nickname. Bunny. Gag. But when you're locked in a cabin with a psychopath on Lectra, you don't make a fuss about the small things. We were boys at the same training camp. I didn't want to hear it. I don't go around forcing people to listen to my childhood stories. Why can't he give me the same consideration? But I was there. And try as I might, I could not tune him out completely. Also, I actually was interested in the parts about court, since none of this was ever mentioned in that Ring of Fire article. He was two years older, prettier than me. Everyone said so. Oh, so that's what this is about. Jealousy. Figures. We learned everything together, and he always thought he was better. Always faster, always tougher. He took the slaps, the punches, the scarring without whimpering or sniveling. He was always better with the pain, but I was a good fighter. I still am a good fighter. I'm going to win tomorrow, Newsy. You watch me. I'm going to pin him to the platform, lie on top of him, make him feel how hard the fight makes me. Then I will take it all from him. Everything he has will be mine. That's how the spoils work for the fighters. They inherit the loser's training camp. This is a big deal for the men who own the fighters. They will lose all all their up-and-coming prospects, but only in that particular camp. This is why they don't have just one big camp. They typically have dozens of smaller ones instead. I don't know what Pavel will get from Court if he wins. No one even knows where Court's training camp is. No one knows where he stays. The Ring of Fire article said he owns no house, no fancy car, no $10 million yacht. These are all things Pavo has. He has been rewarded handsomely by my father over the years. He is the pinnacle of my father's stable. Pavo also has wives. Many, many wives by this point in his career. You get one each time you win in the Ring of Fire, and Pavo has won 13 or 14 times now. Court, twice that many, so Court should have a pretty large harem. The article didn't talk about that either. If Pavo wins, I will not go to Court's harem. I will stay here on this ship. My father has already explained it to me. He will take a controlling interest in the Bull of Light, and I will probably live on this ship for the rest of my life. It's not a bad place, I decide. It could be worse. A lot worse, actually. The Bull of Light is like a city. There are hundreds of people here. Women working in the laundry and the kitchens who I could make friends with. Men I could have sneaky affairs with. I could even get a job. I could work in the kitchen or the laundry, too. Because Pavo is beyond delusional if he thinks my father will let him stop fighting. We will not be playing house. He will fuck me constantly for a few days while he drowns himself in Lectra, hopefully get me pregnant, and then he will leave for Thailand to continue training, and I will stay here. Pavo will have at least four or five more fights before they let him even think about trying to buy himself out. The men in his class only fight once a year. And every time he fights, there is the possibility that he loses. That means that I will not be safe if Pavo wins me. I am property, and I suspect my ownership will change many times before they let me die. By next year, I might have a baby with me. If Pavo loses the next fight, the baby and I would both go to the winner. The obvious solution to this is to not get pregnant. The other, even more obvious, solution is that Pavo loses tonight's fight. Then I would go home with the sick heart. 
I try to imagine that for a moment. Fully imagine how bad it might get. I would be somewhere far away, not on a floating city with the possibility of some semblance of a life. My father would lose track of me, lose interest in me too. I would become part of courts, harem, wherever that is. I would eventually get pregnant. I would eventually have babies. But this is his last fight. It is known. I would not be given away. Ever. I would be his and his alone forever. Court von Breda is nice to look at. I'm not even going to pretend he's not. From a distance, though. I could look at him all day long if he wasn't such a looming threat. But to be with him all the time? Forever? To be left alone with him and his violence? Not even under the protection of my father? He could do anything he wanted with me. He could sell me, leave me somewhere, beat me, starve me, tie me up and never come back. He could lend me out to his friends. And he seems very committed to those friends, so I imagine that's a given. No. The sick heart is a risk. Going home with Court Van Breda would be orders of magnitude worse than staying here and being Pavo's. If Pavo wins, my father would not stay here, but he would come often. He is obsessed with this ship. He might even want Bexie to stay here, too. I could beg for that. I could make it happen. In my world, this scenario, being Pavo's property, having his babies, living here on the ship with Bexie nearby and only occasional visits from the men in control of me, this is a fairy tale ending as far as I'm concerned. Something right out of a fucking storybook. Pavo must win. Bexy returns a little while later. Her face is flushed and her eyes are calm, like she just woke up from a long nap. Look what I found. She plops down onto the couch next to me and offers up the program in her hand. It's for tonight's fight. There's a picture of Pavo and Court on the front, both of them shirtless, both of them looking like monsters. Inside, there's a short welcome paragraph from Court's father a small write-up about my father, and a full-page picture of me. You look so pretty in that pic, Anya. I love it. Looking at the dress I'm wearing, I recall posing for it now, but I didn't know they would use it as promotional material. And it seems like too much. I'm not really the prize. The prize is the ship. I'm just a trinket that comes with it. They want you downstairs for a wardrobe. Bexy leans into me. Her little hands grip my arm and she snuggles up against my breasts like I'm her mother. I lean my head on hers. They're not going to let me watch. She pouts out these words. Daddy says it's too violent and that's stupid. She sits up straight again. Why did I come all this way if I can't even watch? I'm glad she won't be watching. She's already seen way too much in her short nine years. You get to watch? Get to watch? Ha, huh. that's an understatement. I was already told I will be on the platform with them. I will be forced to watch. I will see every horrific thing the two fighters do to each other in perfect clarity. I will spend the entire time wondering which monster will take me home. Which one of the blood-covered animals in front of me will be my master? Bexie gets up and offers me her hand. Come on, I'll walk you down. 
I let her pull me up, and then I let her keep hold of my hand as we exit the reception hall and head down the stairs. Several of my father's guards fall in behind us. I can't quite decide if they're doing this for my protection or to make sure I don't run. I would like to think of myself as a person who might run, but it's a ludicrous idea. We're in the middle of the ocean. Where would I go? I roll my eyes internally, as if that was the reason. I have had hundreds of opportunities to run. Never happened. I am not the kind of girl who runs. Down on the main deck, lots of people are milling about. It's massively wide. You could fit several houses side by side. But the front part of the ship is actually two long arms that extend outward like a forklift. If said forklift was 150 meters wide. The top side is propped in the middle of the ship-sized forklift on massive robotic arms and ballasts. I am not an oil rig expert, but our father is very excited at the prospect of winning a controlling interest in this ship, so he explained all this to Bexie and me while we were traveling here. The top side is a prefabricated oil rig minus the legs that anchor it to the ocean floor. Those have already been built, and now this ship is carrying the working part, the power plant, the housing units, the office, the command center, the pumps, or whatever they use to get the oil and gas up out of the ocean floor, so it can be placed on the legs. A topside is a factory. And right now, the topside roof sits higher than the command center of the Bowl of Light, so that's where all the important people will be watching the fight. But the fight itself will take place on the Bull of Light's helicopter platform, which extends slightly outward over the side of the ship's hull. That's where I will be, too. Bexy leads me below deck. I don't even know where we're going, but she seems to, so I don't worry about it. We end up in a compartment that must be a salon, where a team of people are waiting to turn me into something else. I'm gonna stay with you. Bexy announces. We'll have many petties together, like the old days. Then she pouts. I hope you don't leave. I don't want you to leave, Anya. I don't have any say in that. And neither does she. So I don't encourage this line of thinking. I just sit down, close my eyes, and enjoy the moment. I'm good at that. And so is Bexy. I don't get to choose my polish. I don't get any say in how I look tonight. But Bexy is more than satisfied with her gold and silver nails and toes. After the many petties are finished, I am directed to a flat table where they will wax me. I'll see you when it's over, okay? Bexy's bright blue-green eyes look at me with fear, and I nod. Okay, she says. Then, without another word, she turns and walks out, just as the team of body painters walks in. The stylists undress me and point to the table. I lie down on it and open my legs. I've never been Pavo's prize before, but I've watched two of his fights. This thought makes me pause and wonder where his other girls are. He must have a harem of them by now as well. And children. How many children must he have? Dozens, maybe. He's been fighting for girls since he was 12. Even if only half of them had two babies in those dozen years, that number is in the upper 20s. But it's not likely they haven't been pregnant every other year. Some of the earlier prizes might not even be around anymore. Hell, even his oldest children are probably dead by now. Used up and thrown out. And if he had boys, those boys started training for the fight ring by the time they were two or three most of his sons are probably dead, or they will be soon. Court 
too, must have dozens of slave girls somewhere. He's been in more fights than any other man in the history of the sport. When he was younger, his father used to make him fight three or four times a year. I hiss when they rip the strips of wax off between my legs. But that is a small pain, and it's not enough to make me forget that I'm not really a prize, am I? God knows, neither of them needs another girl. They are here for their continued existence. They are fighting for their lives. They are not fighting for me. The continued waxing makes me wince and hiss over and over. But soon that part is finished, and when I get up off the table, the body painters immediately begin. I don't know how they will decorate me. I don't actually care. Not one decision about my life is mine to make. I don't know exactly what court and pavo will look like tonight, but I've seen pictures in Ring of Fire. If a fighter has tattoos, they like to paint those in something that glows. If they don't, they make the designs up. The rest of their body is painted black. So when they are fighting in the dark, you can only see the glowing tattoos or symbols. They reduce us to non-humans as often as possible. How else would they live with themselves? My body will be painted white with dozens of unsettling symbols in red. I don't know what the symbols mean. Slave girls don't need to know that kind of stuff. But I do know they have meaning. I will be the opposite of the men. My symbols will be invisible in the dark. The red will not glow. But the white will. It's intriguing, and I almost wish I could watch myself from a distance. See me the way everyone else will. Almost like an out-of-body experience. I keep still as they airbrush my skin until it has a pearl shimmer to it. I reposition when they ask me to, lifting a leg or an arm. And then, when that paint is dry, the artists begin creating the designs. Spirals and spinning circles. Black suns and pyramid eyes. Arrows pointing to chaos. Stars and pentagrams and upside-down crosses. To honor Pavo, they paint a snake eating its own tail around my right breast. To honor Court, they make one side of my face into a skull. My eye is outlined in deep black. My cheek becomes a jawbone showing teeth. My hair starts out in two long ponytails, but they twist them up and secure them on top of my head like horns. When I look in the mirror, I am evil personified. And it fits, I think. Everything about this night is going to be evil. A group of teenage boys dressed up in slave attire, shirtless with gold skirts, escort me through the halls when I'm done. Two flank me on either side. They are young because they are only my height. The two in front and the two behind are older, maybe 15. The younger one on my left whispers, I hope Bava wins. Yeah, the one on the right says, you do not want to know what happens to the girl Sickheart takes home. I glance at him with frightened eyes. I hear he kills them. Then the other one says, I heard the same thing. He kills them all. But don't worry, the one on my left says. We're all rooting for Pavo. He's the favorite tonight. He's got a cheat, the other one snickers, and everyone knows about it. Shut up, an older boy in front barks. Quit talking to her. It's true, a boy behind me echoes. We all know that Pavo's team hit a weapon on the platform. You don't know shit, the boy in front says. This whole time, we are walking upstairs. But we stop at a large, double steel door, and then the two slave boys in front pull it open 
and step aside. Immediately, I am bombarded with the flashing lights of cameras. Dozens of men take pictures while reporters yell questions at me. My two flanking escorts take my hands and lead me through the chaos. Disgusting, sweaty bodies reeking of the hot stench of oil and ocean push up against me. Just follow us, the one on my right says. We're not stopping here. They want you on the platform right now. The boys who were behind me are now in front, pushing the crowd out of the way. The camera flashes stop and darkness takes over. There is no moon tonight, and every light on the ship has been turned off. Everything around me feels both empty and full in the same moment. Then we are climbing another set of stairs. At the top, I realize we've already reached the Bull of Light's helicopter pad. Two spotlights come on, but not regular spotlights, black lights and my skin glows an unnatural bright white under the purple haze. Both of my slave boys squeeze my hands. Then they lean in and kiss me on the cheek that's not painted like a skull. Good luck, the first one says. Pavo for the win, the other one says, making a fist. And then they leave me there, under the spotlights. I breathe heavy and hard for a few moments, then almost fall into a panic when the spotlights go out. My heart shudders inside my chest, because it's all happening too fast, and I don't know what to do. But, of course, that's not really true. I only have one job here. I am to stand in the center of the round helicopter platform and not move until the fight is over. But then what? What happens to me after the fight? Men in the crowd begin to scream at me from the top side. They are much closer than I imagined they would be, and when I look up, I can pick out a few individual faces as the black spotlight passes back and forth across the crowd. I scan them, wondering what they are thinking. They begin to boo me when I don't move. They jeer and spew insults. And I realize I need to be in the center before anything else can happen. I take a few steps forward, and they cheer, clapping and whistling, calling at me. The helipad hangs out over the side of the ship by just a little bit, just enough so that when the helicopters land, there is no great threat of the spinning rotors hitting anything on the command center. But this asymmetry, combined with the rolling motion of the massive ship, sets me off balance, and I need to brace myself with feet spread apart to control the spinning in my head. After a moment, I close my eyes, still slowly walking forward, and force myself to snap out of it. Everyone is watching you, Anya. This is the fight of the year. If you ruin it, they will not forgive you. I swallow hard, open my eyes, and find myself in the center of the platform, standing on the giant H painted on the concrete. That's when all the lights go out and the drumming begins. A slow, thumping beat at first like the footsteps of some giant beast coming towards me. The drummers are close, but I can't see them. I know it's not a recording. The ritual has started, and this is part of it. The beat picks up and becomes tribal, turning this modern-day miracle of a ship into a jungle island in the middle of a sea of darkness. And when I look around, past the men eager for the blood that's coming, and truly take in the fact that there is nothing around us for thousands of miles and no moon overhead to light my way. I am lost. But does it matter? Haven't I always been lost? 
The pace of the drumming picks up. It gets louder and louder. And then, there they are. First court, then Pavo. They enter the helipad from opposite stairwells that lead up to the platform, and they do not look the way I expected. Oh, there is a skull and there is a snake. But Court is not the sum of his tattoos like I had guessed. He is a glowing yellow skeleton, each and every bone outlined in fluorescent paint. His rib cage, his pelvis, the tiny bones of his hands, and yeah, even his cock. A long, thick line of yellow dangling between his legs. Naked. Well, I didn't see that coming. But I'm not surprised. Everything about these fights is hyper-sexualized. That's probably why Pavo was so distracted by Court's dick last night. Pavo is painted as a snake. His face is the open mouth of a cobra, fangs protruding and ready to strike. His body is covered in intricate neon green scales that coil around his chest and hips and one leg. The rest of him is black, except, again, his cock, a thick line of green between his legs, swinging and slapping against his thigh as he walks toward me. Because he is hard. I roll my eyes. They walk up to me without hesitation, and each of them grips one of my hands. Pavo squeezes tight, like he's trying to crush the tiny bones. Court's grip is delicate, like he doesn't want to touch me, but is being forced to do so. Drones circle above us. The drumming is so loud now, I want to hold my hands over my ears. The men on the topside walkways cheer with enthusiasm. Are you ready, Anya? Pavo asks. He steps out of the line we make far enough for him to look past me at court. Pavo's eyes find mine, and he smiles. He likes you, Newsy. I can tell. I can see it in the way he looks at you. Court says nothing, and Pavo belts out laughter. He likes you because the two of you share a secret, don't you, Newsy? You and the sick heart. You are more alike than you ever realized. I narrow my eyes at Pavo and sneer my lip, confused, but also annoyed. Just shut up already. No one wants to hear you talk. Oh, you don't know? Pavo snarls. The spectators are growing tired of waiting, and their cheers become jeers once again. You really don't know? He shakes his head. Then he leans in closer to me, still focusing on court. He doesn't talk, Anya. Not a fucking word from him in public in over 20 years. My mouth drops open. Then I turn my head to see Court's face. It's unreadable, his mouth nothing but a flat line, his silver eyes narrowed down to slits, staring straight into mine. Pavo grabs my breast with his free hand, and the crowd goes wild. He is silent, just like you, Nutsi. I don't look at Pavo, because right now, I cannot take my eyes off Court Van Breda. Is it true? Is he silent like me? He doesn't talk, Pavo continues, and neither do you. Then he laughs. I can only imagine how that would work out should he win. But he won't win, don't worry. You will be mine in the end, Anya, and I will make you talk. I will make you do all kinds of things with that mouth of yours. Pavo is saying these words to me, but he's really talking to Court. 
Everything I know about Court Van Breda flashes through my mind. He does not do interviews. He stands there, looks pretty in his Muay Thai shorts and his skull tattoos climbing up and down his body. He didn't say anything when he entered the reception hall earlier. He walked right past us and grabbed the Lectra bottle. Mert talked for him. Just like Bexy talks for me. I look back at Pavo, hoping he will say more. But he doesn't say anything. He just punches me in the mouth. My lip splits and my whole body goes whirling backwards from the force. The crowd erupts in cheers as I hit the helicopter platform and slide almost a meter from the force of Pavo's blow, my entire left side scraping against the concrete. And when I finally gather my senses and look up, the fight has started. Pavo and Court are a flurry of arms and legs, kicks and elbows. Pavo lands a flat foot right in the center of Court's stomach, and Court goes reeling back just like I did. He doesn't lose his footing, but he pauses for a moment as the pain in his gut sinks in. Then his eyes narrow down and focus on Pavo. Some of the spotlights from above weave around the platform, making me dizzy from the strobe effect. But there is one black light trained on Pavo and one black light trained on Court. This presents a bizarre dichotomy, making the two painted fighters look like futuristic creatures straight out of the ancient world. Pavo doesn't wait. He's already on the next attack. He pushes forward towards Court, throwing a kick. But Court counters the kick with an elbow and simultaneously hooks Pavo in the jaw with the opposite hand. Pavo stumbles, but Court doesn't give him a chance to recover. He hits Pavo with a powerful uppercut that lands flush with his mouth, the same way Pavo hit me. Pavo goes down hard. The drumming around us is deafening, almost drowning out the cheering crowd. For a moment, I think it's over. Pavo is struggling to get back on his feet. Court turns his back to him, walking away. But it's not over, because one of them is still alive. And spoiler alert, that's not how this ends. I have only been to two fights, and neither of them were at this elite level. They both involved Pavo, but that was years and years ago. One was the fight that ushered him into top-level status. The other one was at Pavo's local stadium, filled with a crowd of regular Thai people. He did fight that night, but it was more of an exhibition. There was a referee, there seemed to be rules, and most of the fighters that night looked like kids. There are no rules here. They're not even wearing gloves. Not even wearing tape on their knuckles. And these two men haven't been kids for a very long long time. They will fight until they no longer can. I get up on my knees, refusing to be a compliant participant in the outcome of this night. Court is turning back towards Pavo when my movement distracts him. His head swings in my direction. Pavo disappears into the darkness, his spotlight now gone. The crowd begins to boo and shout, making sure their objections can be heard over the pounding drums. They probably have money on court, and my participation in the fight seems to be a clear attempt at aiding Pavo. Court doesn't seem to notice. His eyes are locked with mine. He puts a hand up. Stop, that gesture says. But I'm not going to stop. I turn crouched, looking for Pavo in the darkness. Because he hit me. That piece of shit coward hit me. That baby living inside a man's body hit me. That arrogant 
prick who thinks I will become his property hit me in front of all these people. There is blood in my mouth. My tongue has been split open. I spit the blood out, and suddenly, I am enraged. And that's when all the spotlights go out. The drumming continues in the dark, a wild, frantic beat that drowns out the shouts from the agitated crowd. There are flashes of yellow and green, the leftover glow from the fighter's fluorescent body paint. But after a few moments, even that blinks out. Someone runs past me. The wind flutters over my bare skin, and I can just barely make out the slapping of bare feet over the drumming. I squint in the dark, trying to make out shapes. And holy shit, is it ever dark. No moon, no stars. Every light on the ship is out. And if I wasn't rocking back and forth with the rhythm of an ocean, I would be utterly lost. The kind of lost that drives people to madness. Then, just as suddenly as they went out, the spotlights come back on. But all three of them are targeting court. And they're not black lights. They are bright and white, and he is alone in a shower of illuminated brilliance in the vast sea of darkness. Court shields his eyes from the intense glare, and that's when Pavo attacks. He rams Court like a bull, knocking him down with a hard thump that sends a sick chill down my spine. I get to my feet and take deep breaths as the white lights blink out and the black lights make them glow again, but leave me dark. Pavo's snake winds around Court's skeleton. The drums have slowed, taking up a pace that conjures up images of being stalked. A beat that reminds me of the hunt. I crouch again, thinking, watching the fight. Pavo is on top of Court, but Court hasn't surrendered. They are grappling, fast-moving arms and legs and elbows and knees. I look around, thinking about the boy's words just minutes ago. He's got a cheat. We all know Pavo's team hit a weapon on the platform. Pavo, the cheater. Pavo, the deceiver. He is vile, rotten, and wrong. He has no sense of pride or loyalty or fairness. He is nothing but scum, and even my nine-year-old sister in name only can see it. So I know there is a weapon on the platform. But where? The helipad is nothing but a flat plane. I stand up and begin walking in the hazy, leftover black light that leaks outward from the fight, squinting my eyes and searching for a shadow that might be a knife. That's Pavo's weapon of choice. He uses knives as part of his training ritual with his boys. He cuts them. Slices marks down their arms every time they don't follow one of his insane directives. So they can never forget who is in charge. So they have to carry their shame with them for the rest of their lives. I walk faster, ignoring the two men fighting. They are on their feet now, and the blows are vicious. They are grunting, and they hit the hard concrete more times than I can count, as I scan the helipad for the knife I know is here. Except it's not. There is nothing on this platform. It is bare. It is flat. It is empty. So that means it has to be somewhere else, somewhere close enough that Pavo can get to it. There are only two choices. The stairwells. I jog over to the closest one, searching, my fingertips gliding along the smooth steel frame. 
There it is, fastened to the underside of a thick railing. I pull, and it comes free with a rip of Velcro. And then I turn back to the men and walk into the fight. Chapter 4 Court The worst thing about fighting Pavo Vervanal is his incessant chatter. It's like this asshole has no respect for the value of silence. My very first goal in this fight has nothing to do with winning and everything to do with knocking out his fucking teeth so I can make him shut up. You like her, don't you? He says this as I wring my arm around his neck and take him down. But he's slippery, just like the snake painted on his body, and he maneuvers this way and that until he's out of my reach. On his feet, opposite me, crouched low with his eyes fixed on mine, we circle each other. You want to take her home, don't you? Sick heart. You're imagining the party that comes next, aren't you? The Lectra? You want to? I attack and cut him off. But his talking was nothing but a trick, a way to distract me as he planned his moves. I crack him in the jaw with my right elbow, but he dodges the follow-up move and my left fist crashes into his blocking forearm instead of his head. But I'm no stranger to tricks. I've been fighting for my life since I was five years old. I hold the current Ring of Fire world record for the number of times I've been on the platform opposite an insane asshole just like Pavo. And I have tricks of my own. I've got him on defense and his eyes are assessing my elbows and knees and fists and feet for their threat value. He does it in that order. Because my elbows are always what takes them down in the end. And my knees are always looking for that weak spot. And my fists are always going for the knockout punch. So when his threat assessment finally catches up to my offensive moves, he's expecting a kick. But I don't kick. I simply sweep him off his feet. He falls backwards, and even over the pounding of the drums, I can hear the crowd. They are not rooting for me. They never root for me. They will put their money on me, because I like to win. But in this fight, I'm not the favorite. At 27, the mere fact that I'm still alive is just luck to them. And just before luck runs out, it runs slow. They came here thinking my luck has been running slow for years now. This is it. Money on Pavo. But fuck that. I'm not even down, let alone out. Pavo responds to my sweep with a series of grappling moves that leave behind a rash of concrete burns on my skin when we finally get back on our feet, once again crouched and circling. One of my ears is ringing. Blood is seeping down my throat that I'm pretty sure at least one rib is cracked because every time I inhale, a sharp pain makes me wince in the back of my mind. Pavo attacks. He's rammed me twice now, and I know he won't do it again, even though he comes at me with all the intentions of a bull. He pulls out of it in the very last second, but I'm ready for him. I swing up, grab him in a flying armbar, and slap him down with the concrete so hard his breath leaves his body in a loud grunt. He lies there. Still, this is my chance. This is the moment that I finish him. And I'm just about to do that. Just about to chop him in the throat, break his trachea, and spend the next three minutes watching him slowly suffocate when I see a streak of white out of the corner of my eye. Anya comes towards me with a knife. I stand up and back away a little, unsure if her loyalty to Pavo has turned her insane or if this was part of the plan. I realize my mistake when Pavo grabs my ankle and pulls. He was down, but not out. There was no way out of this move. But I break the fall with the flat palm of my hand and land on my side, forgetting to favor the cracked rib. Pain leaks out of me as nothing more than a low grunt of acknowledgement. But on the inside, the sharpness of the injury takes me by surprise, and my head is filled with nothing but screaming. Screaming. Little voices in the dark. The smell of blood in the night. The cackling laughter of the man who took us. And then, the instincts. My instincts. 
once I realized there was nothing more to lose. And then Pavo was looming over me, sitting on me, crushing my already bruised and broken ribs, his bloody mouth grinning, his dark eyes flashing, his overdeveloped sense of self-importance rearing up like a wild stallion who just won a whole herd of mares. My legs kick up, knees connecting with his back the same time his fist connects with my face. Stars shimmer in the night, even though there are no stars tonight. I push up with my flat palms, connect with his chest, and roll him over my head. There is a sick thunk as his skull hits the ground, and I think, that's gotta hurt. But in a life-or-death fight, it's not over till it's over. I get up on my hands and feet, pausing for a moment to assess Pavo. He's lying face down, and blood is streaming along the side of his head. But he's not out. He rolls over, one, two, three full revolutions, and then he's on his feet. They never go down easy, not at this level. Another flash of white, fucking Anya and her knife. Pavo grabs her out of instinct, wraps one arm tightly around her neck, catching the vulnerable part of her trachea in the crook of his elbow. She drops the knife, both hands reaching for his arm to pry it away as he begins to strangle the life out of her. And then the sound of metal on concrete changes everything. A weapon. On the battlefield. The crowd had faded into the background, but now it all comes roaring back. Pavo's eyes dart to the knife, but I'm looking at him. He throws Anya and she goes stumbling to the side, still grabbing at her throat and wheezing as she desperately tries to suck in air. I lurch back, but I'm too late. I am cut and bleeding before the pain even sets in. Pavo is very good with the knives. His skill with them is impressive, even to me. He doesn't cut me again. Doesn't even try. He throws that fucker right at my neck. I dart to the side, and still that knife pierces my flesh as it passes by and hits the ground several meters behind me. My hand reaches up to find the damage and is instantly covered in hot, sticky blood. Again, the sound of the crowd and the drums fades back in. They are going wild for him, and my head is spinning a little. Did he cut me deep enough? Did he hit the artery? Nick it? Am I already dead? I don't have time to think about it because Pavo is attacking again. His kick is swift, and there are twenty years of practiced force behind it when the length of his lower leg hits me across the hips but I've got twenty-two years of practice checks behind my defense as well. I grab his leg. He immediately checks me, hooking his knee, pulling me forward. And then he jumps up, left arm circling my head, holding it tightly in place while his right elbow finds the side of my face. Stars. I stumble backwards and let go of his leg. His defense wasn't an original move, but it was effective. I have to retreat taking steps and steps and steps backwards as Pavo advances. Finish it! They are chanting now. Finish it! Finish it! Finish it! Pavo is their winner. They are here to see him. Not because they love him, but because they hate me. They want to see me fall. After all these years, all these fights, all those prizes, they are done with me. They want me dead. I, too, am a sacrifice. Just like this girl on the platform with us. His legs are battering me and I am blocking. One blow after another. And each time I block his legs, his elbows are there because he's high on the kind of adrenaline rush one only ever gets when they think they've already won. The drums stop. The final moment is nothing but the maddening crowd. They forget who they are in the outside world when they're at the fights. All those rules they live by fade into the background. They stop caring about their role. They stop thinking about the gifts they accept. And maybe, if they're very lucky and they win their bets, maybe they forget about the things they gave up to be here. Maybe they forgot the price they've already paid. And if they get lucky enough and drunk enough, and they find a lover tonight who knows what they're doing, then maybe they even forget how much they still owe. I told you, Pavo growls, breathing hard, his
his eyes large with mine as he spits blood on the concrete at my feet. You will be mine in the end. But he's not talking to me. He's talking to Anya. I can't spare the moment it will take to locate her, but I can hear her wheezing somewhere behind me. Pavo still has bounce in his step, and now I can see it. The blue ring around his irises goes fluorescent purple in the black light. The ring of Lectra addiction. He is fucking high, which is not against the rules. There are no rules. You win any way you can. But it's a risk. The Lectra can be a bonus. It can make you fearless. It can dull pain. And if this were chess, it could help you see a dozen moves ahead. But this isn't chess. This is life and death, and Lectra can also make you afraid. It can amplify the agony. It can pull you into a slow-motion dream world where nothing makes sense, and every action comes with hallucinogenic tracers. It affects Pavo the first way. That's why he drinks it before a fight. But it affects me the opposite. That's why I don't. You had a good run, Pavo says, attacking me again, his perfectly executed kick crashing against my hips. He doesn't check me this time, just backs off because he knows I'm not in a good place. I'm playing defense. I'm dizzy and blood is streaming down the right side of my body. His knife didn't hit the artery because I'd be bleeding out of the ground by now if it had. But he hit something. My rib is screaming and I can feel those kicks all the way to my kidneys. The drumming starts again. A new beat. The death beat. The final beat. Someone, probably my father since he's hosting this event, has decided that Pavo has won and has instructed the drummers to pound out the ending sequence. And that's when Anya steps between us, knife in hand, pointed at Pavo, not me, and she thrusts it into his side. I actually laugh at the gall of this stupid girl and the gasp of the crowd is loud enough to hear in between the slow beat of the death drums. Pavo grabs her, reaching for the knife in his side. I expect her to let it go, but she doesn't. She holds on to it. She's actually fighting him for the knife, her body glowing a surreal white in the blackness all around us. A ghost fighting the snake. That fucking girl just saved my ass. I'm up. Hurting, but up. Pavo sees me, lets go of the knife, and pushes Anya so hard she goes reeling backwards. Right into me. I catch her. Hold her. Nice! Pavo laughs the word out loud enough to be heard. Using a woman as a shield! No, that's not what I'm doing, dick face. My hand slides over her hip and finds the knife in her hand. She releases it, and I step out around her. Pavo doesn't even look at the weapon, but I know he sees it. You're not going to make it this time, sick heart. Not even that knife can help you now. I toss the knife and it goes careening across the helipad as I smile at Pavo Vervenal. Then I attack. I will not win my last fight with a weapon. Four long strides cover the distance between us. He comes at me with elbows and knees, but I'm done with Muay Thai tonight. There is an advantage to living on this side of the world, and that's why I stay here. And that advantage is Brazil and the art of capoeira. I duck and feign, hop out of reach, block as Pavo attacks again with kicks, and I wait for that look on his face. It's a look every fighter gets when they think they've won, when they haven't. This look is a tell of weakness, because in the ring of fire it's not over till it's over. When he pauses, I swing at him and he blocks as I twist my upper body. Left leg front, right leg back, and then I am turning. Right leg following the arc of the spin until my heel connects with the side of his head with a sickening thunk. He goes down. Then I'm on top of him because there are no referees on the platform to pull me away and let him recover. And this is just how it's done in my world. You can set your fucking watch to the sick ending that comes with each and every ring of fire fight. I straddle Pavo, running through all my options in my head. And then my hands are on his throat. I can hear the crowd because the drumming has stopped. Actually stopped. And they are calling my name but it's not the way they should be calling it. And I catch Mart's voice. 
Behind you! Behind you! I twist off Pavo, who is still unconscious, and drop into a low crouch as I find Anya standing just a meter away holding that fucking knife. We stare at each other, and I don't know how it happens for her, but everything in my world suddenly goes silent. All I hear are the words that she's not saying. Her face is a bloody mess. Her nose may be broken and her plump, fleshy bottom lip is split. Blood is dripping down her chin. She says nothing, and now that I know she's silent, that makes sense. But when you live in a world of sick hearts and dead voices, you only need eyes to say what needs to be said. And hers tell me, she is furious. There is nothing but hate in her gaze, and for a moment I'm caught off guard. Because when I saw her earlier up in the command center, I would have never guessed she was capable of that kind of hate. She walks towards me with a knife. The crowd is screaming. Pavo has lost. He's barely conscious. Low primal moans from him and nothing more. They all know I've won and that means this girl is mine. Or she will be once I put Pavo out of his misery. Or will she? Seems Anya is beginning to have an opinion about how this night ends. She stops less than one pace between us. Our eyes lock. Does she want to kill me? No. She looks at Pavo and then she holds up the knife. I shrug and make a little gesture. A little wave of my hand that says, By all means, be my guest. She pushes past me and then... Without hesitation, she straddles Pavo's body, crouches down, and then, again without hesitation, she buries that knife right in his gut. Oh, Anya, that's gonna be messy. Pavo gulps air. Blood spills out of his mouth as his back bucks up, arching and twisting. Anya stares down at him and then rises up, leaving the knife right where she put it. She turns to me wipes the blood away from her mouth and lets out a long breath. I look down at Pavo, then back up at Anya. Tears are streaming down her face. They leave a track of blurry white body paint on her cheeks. Then I shake my head and sigh as I pull the knife from Pavo's stomach and drag the blade across his neck, making sure to cut right through his trachea because I'm ready for what comes next. The blood pours out of him and suddenly he is lying in a pool of crimson scarlet. The drones hover just off my shoulder, barely ten feet off the ground, filming the entire death scene so that all my watchers tonight can replay it back in 4K Ultra. But this isn't enough. This ending had a twist, that's for sure. But it won't haunt them. And I need to haunt them. This is my real heat-of-the-moment payment. It's not the girls. It's not the money. It's certainly not the fucking accolades. It's the ending. It's the look in their eyes when I catch them by surprise. And so far tonight, Anya is the only one who has made the news. Yeah, I can't leave it like that. When I look down, the knife is still in my hand. I hold the hilt in my fist and drag the blade down Pavo's body from neck to belly, splitting him open. And then I thrust my hand inside him, dig under his ribs, grab hold of the thick, still trembling muscle, and use every bit of energy I have left to pull his heart out of his chest. The entire universe stops to watch me. The crowd says nothing. They don't even dare to gasp. Oh, shit. They're thinking, what will he do with it? I consider the optics of eating it. That would really give them nightmares. But I can't stomach the thought of biting off a piece of pavo and the drones are too close to fake it. So I just stand up and throw it as far as I can towards the closest group of people. And when it slaps into the blocking arm of Lazar, I look down so the drones can't see me smile. Sick heart, sick heart, sick heart, they chant it now. Not for me. They don't chant for me. Their chant is submission and nothing more. They know who's in charge on this platform. 
I point to Anya, and she sucks in air. Then I motion for her to grab Pavo's arm. She does this without hesitation, and we drag his body across the rough concrete, leaving a river of black in the white glow behind us. He is just meat. We position him until he's teetering sideways on the edge of the helipad. The silent night breaks and I hear him. Anya's father, that fucking prick, is screaming my name. My real fucking name. Kurt van Breda! Kurt van Breda! In his stupid Hungarian accent. I know he's running towards us because his calls become louder. And then he's screaming at Anya, telling her to stop me. But neither she nor I look back at her father. We simply roll the body over the edge. And that's the end of Pavo Vervonal. Because he disappears into the churning black water of an endless ocean of death. No! Her father screams. Lazar is right behind us. Very fucking close. Close enough to push either of us over the side. And while I'm not afraid of death and I might be able to get on board with jumping off this ship at some point in time... I just won my last fight and I have more things coming my way than just this girl who saved my life. So I turn on him and I growl at him. Marta and Rainer are already running across the platform with several of the mercenaries as backup. But I don't need backup. Not for this dumb fuck. Lazar stops just a few paces off and when I reach for Anya's arm and tug her behind me, he backs up. Then the lights come on and everything is bright and white. I can't see for a moment, but Lazar doesn't understand that. He's never had to fight for his life. He's never stood under the black lights and fought to the death. He's never had the white blindness after winning. He knows nothing. But his face is red with rage. You're sick! You know that! Someone should put you down! You're an animal! And you didn't win this fight! My daughter won this fight. This ship is mine. This prize is mine. The mercs grab him and pull him away, and now his threats are for them, not me. Jesus fucking Christ. Mart reaches me and immediately begins to assess my condition. Come on, you've lost blood. I reach up to my neck and realize that the entire right side of my body is nothing but sticky red, and it's only then that I recognize the dizziness for what it is. I sink to my knees, suddenly weak. Like all the adrenaline that was keeping me going has been used up. No, no, no. Rainer has one arm and Mart has the other. We're not passing out here, champ. That would never do. They drag me off the platform and I let out a long breath as I close my eyes, thinking, maybe this is the end. Because what's left after this? Who am I when the fights are over? I dream about Lazar as I drift in and out of consciousness in the clinic. I don't know why I dream about him. I've never met him before, but he looks so familiar. I can't place it, really. It's just some fuzzy, nonsensical association thing that comes with dreams. Especially half-dead dreams. Rainer is monitoring my blood transfusion as Mart stitches up my neck. Someone I don't know is trying to fasten a brace around my ribs... But when I swing at him, Mart yells for everyone to get out and leave me alone. Mart. I reach up, grab his hair with a weak fist, and pull him down to my face. I don't open my eyes. Can't really open my eyes. But I just want to kiss him. He laughs and pulls back. <laughs> You're dumb. and You just got blood all over me, asshole. Where's my kiss, Court? It's Rainer. I lift my hand and wave him over, but he flicks the tip of his finger against my forehead instead. You're good. Just relax. You're going to feel a lot better once this transfusion finishes. But, he lowers his voice and whispers right next to my ear. Anya's here in the room. I wasn't sure what to do with her, but I didn't want her going back with her father in case he got any ideas about keeping her. Fuck. I sit up out of instinct, and immediately the pain in my ribs feels like it might shear me in half. I hiss and wince. Fucking Alcourt, Mart objects. 
Lie back down. I'm still sewing you up. Ten more minutes, okay? That's all I need. But I tune him out as I find Anya's paint-streaked face across the room. She's sitting on a wheeled stool in the corner wearing a hospital gown, frowning at me, silent. That's right. I almost forgot. She's silent. I like that about her. But why? Why is she silent? I really need to know that, so I sign to Rainer because Mart is still trying to stitch up my neck and isn't watching my hands. Why is she silent? Rainer hesitates. Uh, well, I don't know. Then he turns to Anya. He wants to know why you don't talk. She doesn't look at Rainer. Her eyes are locked on mine. I sign to Rainer again. He grunts, walks over to her, grabs her face, forces her mouth open and looks inside. She slaps at him, but Rainer is a huge dude and she's got no chance of resisting. Nope, Rainer says. The tongue is still there. He looks over at Mart. She might need a stitch on it. It's still bleeding. I'm a little busy right now, Mart says. So, he looks up at Anya. Probably not. Anya grunts as Rainer releases her, pushing him away now that he's already retreating. So, she's not silent because her tongue is missing. They do that every now and then. If the girls object too much or they get caught trying to escape. Sometimes a slave will just see too much, and that's the most efficient way to silence them. If they're not interested in simply killing them, that is. But Anya isn't just any slave. She is Lazar's slave. And that means she's been with him since she was very young. She would have been taught to read and write to make her worth more at the auctions. So cutting out her tongue wouldn't silence her anyway. If Lazar had any concerns about Anya's loyalty, she would already be dead. So why doesn't she talk? I narrow my eyes at her and ask the question that way since she obviously doesn't know how to sign. Why, Anya, why don't you talk? She only frowns at me, but it's enough. I nod and lie back down, closing my eyes again as Mart complains about all the ways I'm fucking up his stitching. Yeah, something cold presses against my flaming ribcage and I wince. Evan brought you this. Figured you'd need it. Oh, hell yeah. I almost forgot about the Lectra. I feel around without opening my eyes until my fingers wrap around the neck of the bottle. Don't spill it, Rainer cautions me. There's no cork. Don't sit up to drink it either, Mart objects. I've got two more internal stitches, then I'll close, and you'll be done. Two fucking minutes, Court. Just be good for two more minutes. Okay, question, Rainer taps my shoulder. You want to drink the Lectra for the pain, or you want me to give you this? I open my eyes and find him holding a syringe. Mart scoffs. No, Raina, don't give him that. He's going to drink the fucking Lectra. Well, I know he's going to drink it, but he still has to walk all the way over to the fucking reception room. And those ribs are going to hurt. The Lectra won't kick in for at least 30 minutes. One shot of this. No, Mart is insistent. He's all practical like that when it comes to medical shit. It's a bad idea to mix opiates with Lectra. We can hang in here for 30 minutes. It's no big deal. But I point at Rainer and give him permission anyway. Mart sighs. <sighs> Why am I even here? You never listen to me. He knows that's not true. I always listen to him about the important shit. But this isn't about important shit. This is about getting fucked up. My last fight, and I won. I'm still here. This night is going to be epic. And tomorrow? Tomorrow is a whole new beginning. I don't know what that looks like exactly, but it's been a long, long time since I had a new beginning, so I don't even care. I relax a little as Rainer ties off my arm, past my vein with his fingertips, and then slides that needle in and pushes those drugs. I love that feeling. Not the drugs. I give no fucks about drugs. I take them because... Well, this happens at least once a year, and I need a way to get through it. 
And back when I was a kid, this happened six or seven times a year. Most of those fights were even deeper underground than this one. Now, I just like the way I can trace the drug in my body as it enters my bloodstream. It burns as it travels up my arm. I like that feeling when it enters my heart. Then it exits, and then suddenly that drug is everywhere all at once. It's a weird, almost spiritual experience. Or I'm just fucked up, and all this is just the delusions of a man on Demerol after killing someone. I float for a few minutes as Mart finishes up. Then they help me sit up and I take my first sip of Lectra in over a year. It even tastes blue. Something between too sweet and too cold. And I can feel that, too. Going down my throat. Entering my stomach. Heating me up from the inside out. I open my eyes and everything is blurry. But I can still make out Anya in the corner wearing her hospital gown. I sign a command to whoever is paying attention to find her some clothes. But then I tell them not to let her wash the paint off. Not yet. We're still playing our parts. Reality comes much, much later. Time passes. I don't know how much. But eventually Anya is wearing a loose white dress and I'm wearing a pair of olive green cargo shorts and no shirt or shoes. You ready? Mart's words are blurry like his face, and I just smile. Born ready, that smile says. And the next thing I know, we're in the reception room and people are clapping. Liars. They are all liars. They are not clapping for me. They clap to save themselves. Everything they do is done to save themselves. We all know that. And yet we still lie about it. It's all lies to save ourselves. But there is no saving us. We are the evil everyone warns you about. Chapter 5 Anya One Hour Earlier I'm stuck in the world of black night and glowing bodies long after the lights come back on. Nothing really makes sense, and I feel like I'm a little bit drunk on Lectra, even though I'm not. I think it's because something is bleeding in my mouth, my tongue, and maybe my cheek. The blood is making me nauseous, and the altercation between Court and my father only adds to the sick feeling in my gut. Did I win the fight for Court? Will I have to go with him? Or can my father keep me? Is there some rule that might save me from becoming another sick heart concubine? I don't love my father. I don't care about him. But I do love Bexy, and if I leave, if I leave... Hey, you! A mercenary dressed in black body armor pokes me. Let's go. I look around and realize Court is being helped off the platform. My father is on the far side, screaming at Court's father, Ludolf. I concentrate on this interaction for a moment, focusing on Udolf van Houten. This is the first time I've seen him since we arrived, and it's... disconcerting. I know him. I remember him. And then I shudder with revulsion. Anya doesn't belong to God! This is what Lazar is screaming. He didn't win! It was cheating! I look around at the crowd. No one else seems to share his concern. And that means it's over. The bets are already being paid out, and no one put money on me. So I am definitely not the winner. The mercenary grabs me by the arm with a commanding grip that leaves no room for objection. I don't resist. I just try to keep up as I'm led down the stairs, across the upper deck, and then through a door and down more stairs. I thought we'd be going up to the reception room for the party, but we're not. We're going deep into the belly of the massive ship. 
I'm still naked, and even though we pass dozens of men as we walk through the halls, not a single one of them lifts their eyes up from the floor. Are they afraid to look at me? Because of my father? Maybe they've just seen enough sacrificial girls to know I'm not worth leering at. Or maybe they find me and everything I represent disgusting. One, a dark middle-aged man wearing an apron, crosses himself and mutters a prayer as we pass each other, like I am the devil's daughter. The merc stops suddenly outside a door and knocks. The girl, he calls. The door opens and Rayner appears. He nods at my escort. I'll take her from here, thanks. The door swings wide open to reveal a small clinic, one bed hosting court, a small desk built into the side of the wall, and two of those rolling stools doctors use. Mart is sitting on a stool, frowning as he holds a thick wad of gauze against court's bleeding neck with his elbow while he uses his hands to insert an IV. Court's eyes are closed, and I'm not sure he's even conscious. Are you waiting for an invitation? I look up and find Rayner's scowling face. Get the fuck in here, we're busy. I walk forward and Rayner grabs a hospital gown off a counter, shoves it up to my chest, and then pushes me out of the way. The space is tiny and it's a tight fit with four people in it, even if one of them is on the bed. Put that gown on and sit over there, Mart commands me with a nod of his head. I slip my arms into the gown and put it tight across my front as I walk over to the corner and take a seat on the second rolling stool. Then there's another knock at the door. Rayner opens the door, and I try to peek around his muscular body, but he's massive, and I can't see anything until he bends down. It's the boy. He's holding a bottle of Lectra and trying to get a look at court. Is he okay? His voice is small and scared. I brought him this. He's gonna be fine, Everett, Rayner tells him. Just a nick, that's all. He's all bloody. Everett is not convinced, and when I look at Court, I'm not either. Maybe he'll die of blood loss? Maybe I'll get to stay here on this ship instead of being sent to the harem? Maybe I can go home with Bexie. Maybe it looks a lot worse than it is, Mart says. He's not paying attention to Rainer or the kid. He's pulling a bag of blood out of a cooler on the floor and hooking it to the IV. We got this, Everd. Go to bed now. Bed? Everd's single word comes out both surprised and cynical. I'm not going to bed. He's dying. Rainer is still crouched down, and now I realize he did that so he could look the boy in the eyes. He puts a hand on his shoulder. He's not dying, Everd. He needs some blood and some stitches, and his ribs will be fucked for a few weeks. But he'll be fine next time you see him, I promise. No, I don't want to go back without him. Why does he do this? Why can't he just come home? Hmm, I wonder what this is about. Evard. Mart has had enough of this. I can hear it in his tone. Go back to the room and stay there. If you say anything else, you're going to get three months on the rock. Everett scoffs, but Mart adds, alone. That's fucking stupid, Everett yells. He would never, wouldn't he? Mart interrupts. And then he looks up from his work on Court's body, and his gaze slowly migrates over to the kid. Everett has the good sense to slink back. Hell, even I slink back, and he's not even looking at me. Go, Rayner says, his voice still soft and calm. He won't be happy if he wakes up and Mart tells him about this. You've already crossed lines here. A long, tired sigh from the boy. Then he thrusts the bottle at Rayner. Tell him I brought him this. Rayner takes the bottle, and then Everett turns and walks away. Well, that interaction was very interesting. 
lots of little information nuggets to decode later. But not now. Because Mart begins to stitch up Court's neck, and this rouses Court just enough to moan. Rayner closes the door, sets the bottle on the small counter, and then turns to Court. You here with us, buddy? He slaps his cheek a few times. Court, can you hear me? Court moans again, and his head turns, but he doesn't open his eyes. Mart growls. Stay still, asshole. I'm fucking stitching here. Another bit of information gleaned. Mart is his, what, medic? He certainly seems to know what he's doing. Another knock at the door. Fucking hell, Mart says. But Rayner is already opening it up. He whispers something, then opens the door wider. This guy brought a brace for Court's ribs. Mart looks up from his stitching. No, we don't need a brace. I'm sorry, the nurse at the door says. Udolf commanded me to make him wear it. Mart glances up from his work and shoots the delivery guy a death look, making him shrink back. Then he looks over at Rayner and sighs. Put it on him then. Me? Rayner laughs. It's a nice laugh. In fact, he's got a nice face. It's friendly looking when he laughs. Not my area of expertise. Mart is really annoyed now. He looks at the nurse. Put it on him. Yes, sir, the man says. He squeezes past Rayner, but there's not just one nurse. There are two, and they both come in. And now this room is way too small. They shuffle around each other, one on each side of Court's body, reaching under him to try to slide the brace underneath his muscular back as Rayner messes with the line feeding Court a bag of blood. But suddenly, Court wakes, his fists swinging at the strangers. Out! Mart barks. No! Court reaches over to Mart with both hands, grabs his hair, and pulls his face downward. I hold my breath and wonder what he will do next. Hit him? Headbutt him? But no. Court kisses him. Right on the lips. Mart laughs it off with a joke about getting him all bloody, and then Rayner is bending down to whisper in Court's ear. Suddenly, Court bolts upright, looking straight at me as Mart hisses objections. But Court's steel gray eyes are locked on mine, and suddenly, I feel like I'm under a spell. I can't look away. His hands are moving, fast. And I realize that he is signing. Pavo lied. Sick heart does so talk. He just doesn't talk out loud. That fucking cheater. I don't know why this surprises me so much, because people who talk are normal and people who don't aren't. But I am shocked. And disappointed. I mean, it's only been like an hour since I realized he and I might be alike. But if he communicates, then he is not silent. And that means he's not like me at all. He wants to know why you don't talk, Rayner says. I don't say anything to Court Van Breda. Not with my hands, not with my eyes, never with my voice. Because he's not getting that answer from me. I do not communicate with anyone. Ever. He's a dirty, silent cheater. That's what he is. He will never get a single secret out of me. Never. I watch as Rayner shoots Cord up with a syringe of painkillers over Mart's objections and try to follow the silent conversation Court's hands are having. It's not hard since both Mart and Rayner give clues with their voices, but Rayner actually signs and talks out loud, so that's super helpful with my limited understanding of sign language. Court's signs are deliberate and defined. 
but Rainer's are slow and sloppy, like he's skipping words. Soon enough, Mart is done with the stitching, and they start in on the lectra. Even serious Mart gets in on the drinking goal. Court sits up, flashing his talkative hands, and someone delivers a white dress for me. Right. My dress. This isn't over, Anya. Your nightmare is just getting started. Court is helped into a pair of cargo shorts, one arm around each of his friends as he steps into them. Is that what they are? Friends? I'm not sure. They might be lovers, actually. And if that's the case, maybe Court does nothing with his concubines? Maybe he's not interested in them that way? Not them, Anya. Us. Because I'm one of them now. I belong to this man. I belong to this killer. He dragged that knife across Pavo's neck like it was nothing. He gutted him like a dead animal. No thought at all went into his decision to kill tonight. And why should he think twice about it? According to the rumors and the skulls on his body, he has killed Dozens of men on nights like this. You ready? Mart is holding Court's head with both hands, staring straight into his eyes. Court sucks in a breath and nods the affirmative. Then let's do it. All three of them are in a much better mood now. Court has been smiling nonstop since Rainer shot him up with those painkillers. And they have all taken at least half a dozen sips of the Lectra, I stare at the blue liquid in the bottle and notice that it's more than half empty. Hello? I look up and realize Mart is talking to me. Are you ready? I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be ready for, but since when did it matter if I was ready for anything that's happened to me in my life? I, of course, say nothing. But I don't change my expression, either. I'm actually thinking back to my laugh earlier in the day. I laughed at Mart's threat to Pavo. I don't talk, I don't use hand signals, and I don't laugh either. And now I'm mad at myself for doing that, for being so complacent, for not paying attention, for showing them something real. No one gets anything real out of me. Ever. So I just stare at Mart, like he's speaking a language I don't understand. I think that's a yes. Rainer laughs. Come on, let's get the formalities over with so we can get this night started. Rainer reaches for the door, but Court puts one hand on his shoulder and signs something with the other one. Oh. Rainer looks over his shoulder at me, then offers me the lectra. He says you need to drink. Court signs something, and Mart laughs as Rainer amends his statement. He says you need to catch up. Rainer grabs a marker off the small desk and draws a line on the bottle. Drink it down to there. I hold in my reaction. This is a test. Not the drinking part. Well, yes, the drinking part is a test of my obedience. Fine, whatever. I'll drink $10,000 worth of Lectra if they want me to. But the real test is my reaction. My new master wants a reaction from me. Court's eyes are locked on mine when I find his face. And he probably thinks this Lectra will loosen me up. It will make me drop my guard, make me compliant and easy. It might even make me talk. That is is a fantasy. I will not smile. I will not frown. I will not glare at him. And there is not enough Lectra in this world to change that. Do they think I just woke up one day and said, I think I'll stop talking? Fucking amateurs. I grab the neck of the bottle and it goes down cold. So cold. 
Electra is typically served at room temperature, but it's always like ice going down. I don't stop until I'm certain that I have met the mark. And actually, when Rainer grabs the bottle from me, I see that I drank a little bit more than was required. Easy there, killer, Rainer jokes. Save some for us. Then he winks at me. His eyes are neither dark like Mart's or blank slates of gray like Quartz. Rainer's eyes are bright, bright green. They look like grass on a summer afternoon. His face reminds me of sunshine. The scruff on his chin has a glint of gold to it. And if I were someone else in this world, I would maybe think about liking him. But I can't afford to like him. Even if he turns out to be as nice on the inside as he looks on the outside. I can't afford to like anyone except Bexy. She is the only one I ever trusted. She is the only one who has had my back since the day she came to live with us. She is wise far, far beyond her nine years. She is a survivor. And now I have to leave her behind. I sigh, heavy with sudden sadness, and look past Rainer, past all of them like they are unseen ghosts. Because this is over now. Nothing will ever be the same again, and not even Rainer's bright green eyes can change that. So why bother looking at them? Beauty is a trick. That's something I learned young. And all three of these men are far too beautiful to be anything but evil. Well, she's got to be a barrel of fun tonight, Mart says dryly. Then they are pushing each other the way boys do and not grown men. Court is grinning and Mart is laughing as Rainer forces us all through the door. The walk to the reception hall is long, but passes quickly. I know from watching Court for the last hour that he is hurting. And he's drunk and on drugs right now, so everything about this walk should make him slow. But it doesn't. I hear just one tiny hiss when we need to brush past people in the hallway, and a crew member's arm swipes the side of his bare ribcage. But aside from that, You'd never know he was in a fight to the death and had his neck cut open two hours ago. He walks super fast. He jogs up the steps. He never once wobbles or even breathes hard. Either he's the definition of fitness and control, or he's so used to the pain, he's figured out how to get past it. Or maybe he's all of that? I begin to wonder about his life, where he grew up. No, how he grew up. That's much more important than where. Who took care of him as a child? Where did Mart and Raynor come from? And that little boy, who is Everd? One of his trainees? Everd wasn't allowed to watch the fight, but there he is, waiting for us outside the reception hall entrance. Two of those mercenaries stand on either side of him like he's under their charge. The smile he beams at court is uncontainable, and his eyes are filled with love even though he says nothing when Rainer hands him the Lectra bottle, like he knows his place in this entourage. But then he spots me and smiles. Hi, Anya. Bexy wanted me to tell you not to leave without saying goodbye. Who the fuck is Bexy? Mart asks. All three of them are looking at me. Her little sister, the boy says. She found me and we watched the fight together. Well, that figures. That's totally something Bexy would do. Court signs something to Mart and Mart looks at me. Later. He says you can see your sister later. Then Court looks at me. Maybe expecting me to be grateful? 
I'm not sure, but this tiny sign of humanity isn't enough to make me react. Not even close. All right, you ready? Mart asks Court, pulling his attention back to the business at hand, which is the reception. Court nods. Then let's go. The mercenaries open the wide double doors like we're royalty. And I guess we are. For tonight, anyway. He did win the fight. My father does not get a controlling interest in the ship, and Court's father maintains his status. All because of sick heart. That is no small thing. There are at least a hundred people in the room when we enter, and they all begin to applaud. Not the barely polite applause they managed outside, but a roaring, thundering applause that even comes with a few whistles and shouts. And that makes me tired. I'm so tired of the show. So tired of the lies. So tired of this life. Why do I keep going? That's the Lectra talking, Anya. You drink too much already, and your night has barely started. And that's how I get through the Lectra intoxication every time they give it to me. I talk to myself and no one else. So this night should be so much fun. I drift away in my approaching Lectra stupor, unable to even pretend to care what's happening around me. The little boy takes my hand and keeps hold of it, but I don't look at him. I don't look at anyone. That's the Lectra taking over, too. It just makes me want to float away, just give in. And I will. Not yet, but soon. The boy tugs my arm and I look down at him. Don't worry, he says. We're not staying here long. Court hates parties. And we have better things to do than hang with these people. Here, take a sip. It will make it better. I look down at the bottle he's offering me and concentrate on breathing. Then I take it. Knowing better, but not caring. The life that I know is over now, and I don't want to know what comes next. The drink goes down cold and smooth, and then someone pulls the bottle from my lips, which are sticky now. Easy there, Rayner says. You're good, Anya. You've got a long night ahead, so it's best if you pace yourself. A long night. A whole life, actually. I look past Rayner and find Court with his father on the other side of the room. Mart is with him, doing the talking, I suppose. Why does Court pretend not to talk? He knows how to sign. All of them do. I bet even the little boy knows how. So what's the point? Did they cut out his tongue? I've heard they do that to people sometimes. I've never personally known anyone who had their tongue cut out, but I don't live in that world. I'm in it, but apart from it at the same time. We had servants, of course, and I would not say that my father was kind to them, but he didn't go around cutting out tongues. I watch Court's father as he smiles and laughs and pats his son on the back. He's proud of him. That's very apparent. So I don't think he cuts out tongues either. So why don't you talk, Court von Breda? It isn't rebellion. Because even though Court had a very dark look to him earlier in the day, he doesn't come off as sullen or moody now. In fact, he's smiling, even laughing. He shakes the hands of the men his father lets close. Mart talks as Court nods and even tilts his head a little in response. Is he really interested in what they're saying? Or is that just another layer to the lie? Someone grabs my arm in a grip so tight I wince and hiss from the sudden pain. You little fucking bitch! 
I whirl around and find my father's face dipping down into mine as he growls out his words. You little fucking bitch. This is all your fault. This whole night is your fault. And believe me, I will make you. And then, before I can even pull my arm from his grip or take a step back in surprise, he's on the ground, and Court is standing over him. No, that's not Court. That is Sick Heart. Whoa, 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 Court's father, Udolf, says. He steps in front of Court, blocking my view of my father. You can't touch his girl like that, Lazar. She belongs to my son now, and you're going to need his permission to speak to her. Lazar wipes the blood from his mouth with a fingertip. He stares at that fingertip with an air of astonishment. Then he gets to his feet, straightens the collar of his white button-down shirt, and glares at Mr. Van Houten. Fuck you, Udolf. You cheat. He cheated. She helped him. You owe me. He was supposed to. Come with me, Anya. I turn and find Rainer looking down at me. I'm taking you back to the room. He takes my arm as if to pull me away, but I hesitate. Because Lazar was saying something and I'm pretty sure it was a clue. I'm pretty sure it was about me. He was supposed to, what? But Rainer's interference has changed the subject and suddenly the czar is yelling, you can't take her. He is losing his shit. She's mine and we had an agreement. Mart steps up, places two hands flat on Lazar's chest, and pushes him back with such force, he stumbles into a crowd of men. She is his, Mart growls. And you better calm your shit down, because if you raise your voice again, no one will stop him next time. You have been warned. Damn, that Mart is scary too. He might not be the star of the show, but it is very clear to anyone with any sense of self-preservation that Mart is just as dangerous as Court. Fuck you, Lazar spits. There is no such thing as an unfair fight in the Ring of Fire, Udolf says. His voice is steady and calm and low, but everyone hears it even me. And Rainer is pulling me towards the door. And if your people hadn't planted that knife on the platform, then Court's new woman wouldn't have picked it up and handed it to him. That's not really what happened. I mean, there were extenuating circumstances, like Pavo punching me in the mouth and splitting it open. I reach up to touch the cut on my lip with a fingertip. It's swollen and tender. And my tongue, thank God I don't need to talk because it's swelling up quick. One whole side of my body is road rash from Pavo pushing me down on the concrete platform. But it's not like I can object. Rainer has tugged me into the stairwell and we are going down, so I don't catch Lazar's response. But I do think about Udolf's words. Court's new woman. That's what I am now. I sigh, internally, of course, and just float down the rest of the stairs into some other part of the ship, and then I'm led into a room. The AC is on so high it's frigid, and I don't realize until the moment I walk under the rushing cold air above the door that I am sticky hot with dried and cracking body paint and sweat, and blood. I just want a bath. And that's never going to happen. I highly doubt there are bathtubs where I'm going, and there certainly aren't any on this ship. Everett follows us in, leaving the door open. Then, a few moments later, Court and Mart enter as well. Mart kicks the door closed with the heel of his foot, and he's holding another bottle of Lectra. Full. Want more? 
I look up from the bottle and find Mart's gaze. Rayner, busy on the far side of the room with something, tisks his tongue. I don't think she needs any more. She drank a lot and she's probably not used to it. He turns around with a small machine in his now gloved hand. Besides, it'll make her bleed more when we tat her up. And even though I have been professionally uncommunicative for nearly 15 years now, I am unable to stop the expression on my face. Rayner points to me, and his grass-green eyes brighten. Gotcha, he says. But then Court is signing something, and Rayner laughs. Spoke too soon, I guess. He has plans for you tonight. Plans? What the hell does that mean? Rayner buzz, buzz, buzzes the little machine in his hand, and I realize it's a tattoo gun. Court is settling down on the couch, pulling the little boy into an embrace. His quick fingers sign something to him, and Everett signs back with a smile. My mind wanders to all kinds of dark corners at this display, but then I push it aside, look back at Mart, take the bottle, and drink. Plans. Fuck Court Van Breda. Fuck him and his friends and his boy, and fuck his plans, too. Mart pulls the bottle away from my lips with a sigh. Oh, right, you're gonna really need to sit down. Over there. He's pointing at a chair. But then his gaze finds Court, who is signing again. Never mind, Mart says. Sit next to Court. He really does have plans for you. Then the tattoo machine begins buzzing in Rayner's hand. Bzz, bzz, bzz. He points it at me. Ready for your mark, Anya? I hold still, my head spinning and my vision going a little blurry. God damn it. Mark grabs my arm, pulls me over to the couch, and then pushes me until I fall into the cushions next to Cord. Just stay there. I told you, Rayner says. She drank way too much. She's gonna be hallucinating all night now. Court signs something, and they all laugh. And that laugh lasts for an entire eternity. It floats into my ears and gets stuck in my head. Bounces around in there, and then... Then I lose track of time. I lose track of everything. I drift in and out of consciousness. There are skulls all around me, skulls everywhere. I reach for one and find the soft skin of a belly. And when my eyes look up, I find him. The sick heart. The man with skulls all over his body. I start tracing the lines of teeth and jaw bones. I trace the outline of an eye, then a heart. Not a heart you draw, not a cute thing at the end of a note or an emoji on a phone, but a real heart. An anatomical heart with pipes or vessels protruding and spurting blood everywhere. Then there's a keyhole in the middle of it. And I have that key. It's made out of a finger bone. Anya. I look up and see Rainer, tattoo machine in his hand. Bzzz, bzzz, bzzz. Black and red ink all over his gloves. And then I look down and see that I am practically on top of court. I blink. Then the little boy is pulling me off of the rock hard body of the fighter. He pushes me and points his finger in my face. You're not handling this well. That echoes in my mind, and I think I laugh. It might even be out loud, but I can't be sure. I'm not sure of anything right now. 
She doesn't drink it like we do, Rainer says. His hand is buzz, buzz, buzzing over the skin of Court's ribcage. Mart laughs. He's sitting on the other side of me, and I'm leaning into him. Court snaps his fingers, and it reverberates through my head. At the end of that snap, there is another tattoo machine. The little boy is kneeling at Court's feet, holding a little cup of black ink. I feel like time is skipping, like I'm losing hundreds of seconds at a time, jumping from minute to minute like a stuttering old movie. Then Court is dragging the needle across a finger on his left hand, and I'm mesmerized by this. I watch, line by black line, as the image takes shape. A skeleton key. But that's when I notice all his fingers have keys on them. I get lost in that, too, watching them dance as he draws and wondering, what the fuck do they open? Then his buzzing stops, but Rainer's buzzing continues, and Court is flashing his finger keys in my face. It's a sign. The little boy is suddenly in front of me. He wants to know where you want it. And his words come out slow and shimmery, like waves of words. I want to laugh again. I can't tell if I do it out loud or just in my head. Where I want what? That's my mind talking, not my lips. My lips don't talk. Not even the Lectra can make them talk. Plus, I'm so fucking high right now, I don't even remember how to talk. I couldn't form the words if I wanted to. Never mind her, the boy says. Do me. I gasp before I can stop myself and grab his arm. No, no, do not let him mark you, beautiful little boy. But Mart, who is behind me, or no, I'm like, in his lap? He pulls me back and I don't have it in me to resist. So I'm lying back on his chest and Court has my foot in his hand and I kick and wiggle because it tickles. I laugh again. This time, I'm very sure the laugh escapes. This makes Rainer stop and smile at me. Next thing I know, he's looking back down at his work on Court's ribcage, and Court is dragging his needle over my baby toe. Then everyone is laughing. Maybe even I'm laughing? but I don't know what's funny. Court bends my knee and holds my pinky toe between his fingers, presenting it to me like something special and precious. They laugh again. I have to squint to make out the shape, but it's moving all over the place like it doesn't want to be seen. So I give up and just shut my eyes with a long, audible, Sigh. And that's three times that I know of. Three times I have made noises tonight. I don't make noises. Then the boy, Everett, his name is Everett, I remind myself. He's hissing and moaning and wincing, so I open my eyes to find Court dragging a needle over the back of his neck but I can't keep my eyes open long enough to see the artwork. And then I just give in to the lectra completely, my mind spinning as I breathe to the beat of Mart's heart, which is pounding against my back. I am fucked up. Mart's fingers are caressing a long, lazy pattern up and down the side of my thigh. I open my eyes again and find Rainer is done now, 
than ever it is whining and complaining. Raynard drags him toward an open door on the other side of the room and pushes him through, closing the door, locking it with a loud click as he turns back to us. His grassy eyes find mine, and then he crosses the room with a smile and kneels in front of me, right between my legs. Then two hands that belong to two different people open my legs up, and Raynor lifts the skirt of my white dress up and out of the way. I catch one more look at those bright green eyes, and then he dips his head down and begins to lick me. Chapter 6 Court Anya's entire body bucks up when Rainer licks her. She gasps, and I already know that making that little noise bothers her. Her silence goes way beyond not talking. She does not want to make any sound at all. Not a sigh, not a groan, and certainly not a moan. Good luck with that, Anya. Good luck with that when Rainer's mouth is between your legs, when his tongue is working its magic against your pretty little nub. She hasn't got a chance. Rainer pauses and I grin at him. It has been a long time since we've done this and I suddenly feel great. Last fight. Last fucking fight and I made it. I'm done. We're done. And after we finish celebrating here tonight, I have just one more training camp and I will have earned out. I will have bought my freedom. And I will be able to take Everd, Rainer, and Mart with me. Do I feel a little guilty about leaving the others behind? Of course. But I gave up trying to save the world a long time ago. Saving everyone would mean a dozen more fights, at least. And if there's one thing I've learned about being on top, it's this. Someone is always coming up trying to take your place, and the best time to quit is when you're ahead. If forced, I could probably win two, maybe three more elite-level fights. But anything more than that is just a delusion. And three more fights won't be enough to make any kind of difference. Hell, one loss is all it takes to wipe everything I've ever done away. I will lose everything I've ever loved and sacrificed for if I don't win. Rainer and Mart can take care of themselves. They don't really need me. If I die, they will make it. Somehow. But I won't play with Everett's future like that. Rainer looks at Anya with those questioning green eyes of his. Then he pauses and drags the back of his hand across his glistening lips. You gotta tell me yes before I go any further. Huh. This is new, but this Anya girl is very, very different than the kind of girls who end up in our room after a winning fight. When I look over at Anya, I'm surprised she has her eyes open. She doesn't answer his question, just stares back at him. Come on, Anya, you know you want it. Just tell the man yes and he'll get back to business. Mart, ever my trusty fucking mind reader, pulls these words right out of my head. Yeah, Anya. You have to give permission. He caresses her breast, rolling her nipple between his fingertips. She's practically lying on his bare chest. He didn't get tattooed tonight, and neither did Rainer, but they lost their shirts hours ago. Hmm. What will our little Anya do? Nod her head? Whine for more? Grunt? No. I smile big, because our Anya reaches down, places the flat palm of her hand on the top of Rainer's head, and pushes him back into position. Mart and I exchange grins. Clever girl, and horny, though that might be the Lectra, but also so very, very committed to her fucking silence. And I don't know why, but I love that about her. Mart's turn. He wraps his arms around her, opens up her loose-fitting, low-cut dress, and plays with both breasts as he dips his mouth down to her ear. 
How about me? You want me to stop? I'm gonna need an answer if you want to keep going. He's toying with her, playing with her the way a cat plays with a captured mouse. She stares straight ahead, eyes fixed on something on the far wall. One hand is still in position on Raynor's head, guiding him as he licks her pussy. He must hit her sweet spot because she bites her lip and closes her eyes for an elongated blink before opening them back up, wider than ever. Mart pinches her nipple, hard, and the pain is sharp enough to make her gasp again. Oh, I'm waiting on ya. Oh, I don't like to wait. He growls out the last few words as his left hand squeezes her breast. She has very nice tits. They are large and firm, and even though I know the meaning of the red-on-white symbols encircling her nipples, I like the way it looks. I like the way she wears it. I like the way she plays her part. The sacrifice. That's what she was tonight. Lazar's sacrifice. There's something I bet our Anya didn't know. I was supposed to kill her tonight. I was told to throw her off the ship, not Pavo. Udolf took me aside just before I went out on the platform and told me that's what Lazar wanted. And what did I care? What's one more dead girl? It's not like I get to keep them. And Udolf? Well, he has no interest in a girl Anya's age. She's not his type. So I fucked up their plans by throwing Pavo over instead of Anya. Right now, somewhere on this ship, in some private space or compartment or storage hold, there should have been a ritual to commemorate her death. I smile just thinking about Lazar's panic as we were dragging Pavo's body towards the edge. Did he know I wasn't going to do it? Did he know? Yes, he had to know. And he was panicked. Why? Why this girl? If my father is mad that I let Anya live, he didn't show it. But he is the master of deception. Still, without Anya, he might have lost tonight. Without Anya, I might be dead. So do I think he cares that she wasn't sacrificed in the end? Probably not. Mart slaps her breast and growls, Fucking answer me, Anya. Rainer stops eating her pussy and wipes his hand across his wet lips again. You better say yes, or we'll just throw you in the bedroom and go find someone else to play with. Someone more willing, Mart adds. I hold my breath for a moment, wondering if she'll bow out. I'm not going to lie. I'd be disappointed if we had to go find someone else. I mean, she's already here. Rainer has already gotten a taste. Mart is practically in position. She answers him, but not with sounds. She answers him with a hand, again. This time she reaches behind her back and grabs Mart's dick. He grins at me and shrugs, and it's settled. She is in. So now it's my turn. Rainer hasn't resumed his licking yet, even though he's still in position and Anya is still trying to encourage him with her hand on his head. Now he says. Now you have to let Court know you want it. His tongue darts out and the tip swipes across her clit. She hisses air through her teeth. And if you don't want to talk, fine with us. We like your silence. Nothing worse than a mouthy woman. Mart and I both laugh. But you better find a way to say yes in the next ten seconds, Anya. Because if you don't, We'll just jerk each other off real quick to quell the need and then go find ourselves someone with more spirit. Anya looks at me and even though she says nothing, not with words, not with her eyes, not even with a crooked smile, I know the question inside her head. You like men? Don't we all like men, Anya? I sign that back to her and both Rainer and Mart chuckle. And then Anya surprises me. She removes her hand from Rainer's head, twists her body towards me, creating space between her and Mart, and then she leans in, blue eyes locked with mine, and slowly, ever so fucking slowly, closes the distance between us until her soft mouth, all pliant and willing, 
touches mine. She holds that position, neither kissing me nor not kissing me, and we breathe a lifetime of breaths in that pause. Up until now, I hadn't really felt the lectra, but it suddenly kicks in and my dick is instantly hard inside my shorts. The dream state is immediate and I kiss her. I kiss her and she kisses me back. And she tastes like blood. Her tongue touches mine and I lean into it, pushing her back on top of Mart. Rainer is standing up, tugging his shorts down his long, muscular legs. Mart is desperately trying to unbutton his pants and get his dick out. I end up helping him as Anya and I continue to kiss. I lift up her hips as Mart pumps his cock, and then Rainer is helping me place her on top of Mart. Rainer kneels down again and resumes licking her pussy while I play with her clit, getting her wet enough for what comes next. She bites her lip and closes her eyes when Rainer places Mart's cock at the tight entrance of her ass. And when Mart thrusts upward, she cries out. Her small protest tumbles over my tongue and gets lost inside my mouth as Rainer and I each slip a finger inside her pussy. Anya is gasping and moaning as we slide in and out, feeling the length of Mart's cock inside her ass. Rainer keeps licking, and every now and then his tongue caresses my finger. I shiver. Get on top of her. Mart whispers, his mouth right up next to my ear. Get inside her. I want to feel you, Court. I want to feel your dick inside her. I want it, too. I continue kissing Anya as Mart lifts her knees up to her breasts, and then I straddle their bodies. Rainer has my cock in his hand, squeezing it, sliding his huge palm up and down my thick shaft. Then he places me at the entrance of her wet pussy and I slide right in. She moans, and it's not even soft. But I moan too, and so does Mart. Rainer is standing on the couch now, his dick in his hand as he eases it towards my face. I pull back from kissing Anya, glance up at him and smile. Then take his giant cock in my hand and play with the tip until he closes his eyes and moans. Then I push Anya's face towards Rainer. She opens her mouth without objection and I'm fascinated as his cock disappears past her lips. But that passive fascination doesn't last because Mart is fucking her ass, thrusting his hips upward, desperately trying to feel me. I take my attention back to him. His face is right there, just below Anya's right shoulder, and all I have to do is lean down. His kiss is always rough. He always bites and I laugh when he tries it, pulling back just in time so he can't draw blood. And then I begin to move. Anya is full-on moaning now, not even bothering to stop the Oh! 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 as she ruins her vow of silence. She shreds this vow of silence with moans. But nobody cares. She certainly doesn't. And so we just fuck like that. Me in her pussy, Mart in her ass, and Rainer in her mouth. She comes quickly, too quickly. But we don't stop and she comes again, and again, and again. And I get lost in the lectra, and the sex, and the feeling of everything being just the way it should be. It's a trick. It's the electric blue liquid inside me. It takes over and it doesn't give up. Not easily. Not quickly. This is the beginning of the end. And I begin to drift. My body is still moving the way it should. Mart is caressing my ass as he fucks her. Rainer is back on his knees between our legs, licking us. Licking all of us. Anya is clawing my shoulders with her nails, orgasming. And every time I move the wrong way and the sharp pain of bruised and broken ribs forces me to come up for a breath of reality, the Lectra is there. The Lectra takes care of that, too. The Lectra takes care of everything. Our naked bodies are the only things that matter. But the Lectra takes you prisoner as well, if you're not careful. 
And I'm not being careful about anything right now because for the first time in my life I feel like a free man. So I let the lectra in. I let it grab a hold of my mind. And pretty soon it's asking me questions. Let's go for a walk, Court. Would you like to go for a walk with me? Like no is even an option. When the lectra invites you along, you go. So I go and find myself in a hazy room. Smoke, I think, because I can smell it. A mixture of tobacco, opium, and cannabis. When I look down, I am tiny, very small, smaller than ever, even. My body brown from the sun and sweaty and naked. The room is filled with men. It's not just smoke, it's steam, because I'm in a bathhouse. I don't think I want to go there. But the lecturer answers, Since when do you have choices, Court Van Breda? Are you listening to me? It's the lecturer talking. But no, it's not. It's a girl, older than me. I think I know her name. But the lecturer is controlling me now, so I don't have time to remember it. I glance past the girl and see a man with blonde hair. He's naked and laughing at some other boys, bigger than me, but only by a few years. Are you listening to me? I look back at the girl, but don't say anything. She's pointing her finger in my face. Go! That's what she's telling me to do. Run! She's shaking me by the shoulders, trying to pull me to my feet, but my head is swimming with confusion. I think it's the opium. Or the lectra. Run! And then the lectra's grip on me eases and I'm on my feet. I'm on my feet and really am running. Hard. Fast. I'm naked and running through the bathhouse, turning corners, bare feet slapping on the slick tiles. Slipping. Everything is slipping. And then, bam, I slam into a man. When I look up, I see Udolf, my father. But he's not my father. He wasn't my father then, and he isn't my father now. He's just, breathe, one of them. I can't breathe. No air is getting in, and I'm gasping for it, desperate for it. But then I hear Rayner. Court, let go, let go. And then my eyes focus, and I'm back. Both of my hands are wrapped around Anya's neck. Her eyes are wide with surprise, and she's gripping my shoulders, digging her fingernails into my skin. I stop strangling her, and she sucks in air like she hasn't taken a breath in years. Mard is still underneath her, and we are still fucking. Her tits bounce and wiggle with the force of two men near climax. Mart reaches that place first. He slips his dick out of her ass, pushes us off him, and then kneels on the couch so he can spray her breasts with his cum. I keep going, trying to get deeper and deeper inside her, trying to own her. She's still gripping my shoulders, her knees bent and legs lifted and wide open. But then Rayner takes her hand and places it on his cock. He helps her finish him off, his hand on top of hers, fully covering it, pumping back and forth as white cum spurts onto her breasts and mixes with Mart's. I lean down and kiss her, not even caring that both our upper bodies are now slick with the sexual release of other men. I bury my face in her neck, biting her earlobe until she pants and wiggles in protest. And I like her struggle. I like the way she resists. I like the way her soft body presses against mine. I like the way she grips my hair, fisting it, pulling it so hard my scalp burns. I like the way her mouth finds mine, the way her tongue slides in and out of it, like she's fucking me instead of me fucking her. I like the way her pussy tightens against my shaft when she finds one more release inside her. I like the way she gushes. And I like the way she gasps when I come inside her. I don't ask permission to do this. I don't need permission. I am not a little boy in a bathhouse. I am Court Van Breda, 
Ring of Fire world champion for ten years running. I own this girl. Anya Bokori is mine. I don't know what happens next. All I know is that I'm wearing shorts again, still barefoot, and I'm cruising through the tight, nearly claustrophobic hallways of the ship. I don't know where Rainer is, or Mart, or Everd. And even though I should care about that, about Everd at the very least, I don't care. The Lectra is 100% in control. It's telling me where to go, and when I get there, it will tell me what to do as well. People stop when I approach. They press themselves into the walls, eyes downcast, looking at the floor, looking at anything but me. I know I'm fucked up. That's the thing about the Lectra. It gives you glimpses. It gives you moments. But you gotta obey it, too. You can't tell it no. It will spit in your face if you try. So I go with it. I flow with it. And pretty soon I'm not on the ship anymore. I'm walking the platforms of the rock, alone in the middle of an angry ocean, small and hungry, beaten and bruised, humiliated and sad. And sick. I am sick. My heart is sick. I am heart sick. The girl who was telling me to run is gone now. I don't know what happened to her. All I know is that I woke up on the rock. There was nothing there back then. He left me there for three months. Three fucking months. The rock is where I learned to be silent. The rock is where I learned to live with myself. The rock is where I learned to accept my lot in life. The rock is where he broke me. The rock is where I put myself back together. The rock is where the nightmare begins. The lecturer lets go and I find myself climbing the stairs to the event room. There are mercs lining the stairwell, all dressed in black, carrying those giant guns, knives strapped to their legs and ammo on their belts. They would not have a chance against me in this tight stairwell, not even with those weapons. Not even all of them at once. And they all know this. Because they don't look at me. They don't dare fucking look at me. I picture that fight in my head. Imagine myself jumping up, grabbing the platform of the stairs above my head, kicking five or six of them in the face, and then swinging around to take out their buddies rushing up to help. It would be a bloodbath. I would snap so many necks. Caught! I focus and find Mart standing at the top of the stairwell, just outside the open door to the observation room. Fuck, dude. Where the hell did you go? He looks over my shoulder. Where's Anya? Anya. Where is Anya? She left with you. Where'd she go? Lazar wants to talk to her. Oh, does he? Too fucking bad for him. Court, where is she? Some time passes as I climb the remaining dozen steps up to Mart, and then he's talking again. Jesus Christ, look at your eyes. They are bright blue, brother. You are fucked up. I laugh and then sign. I am so fucked up. Where's Anya? But I'm not sure. I don't actually remember taking her with me when I left the room. Never mind, Mart says. We'll find her later, I guess. Everyone's waiting for you. Raina's been covering. You ready? He's got me by the shoulders and gives me a little shake. Oh, I'm fucking ready, all right. Let's do this shit. We enter the room and pause, taking it all in. I spy my father, but he's so far away it feels like a journey and a trek to talk to him. So I let people surround me. People I don't know. People I don't care about. Mart, of course, does all the talking for me. I'm not even paying attention. This is pretty much the best part about the silence. I can just tune them out. But then that reporter is in my face trying to ask me questions. Court. She's past middle age. Too much makeup and some of it is smeared. There are dark smudges under her eyes and her cheeks are pale now and not rouged. What did it feel like to disobey your father tonight? 
Come on, Mart says, positioning himself between her and me, kind of pushing her back a little. Leave him alone. He's not going to answer you. Why not, Court? Her eyes are locked on mine. Why can't you answer me? Is this some kind of vow? Did you take a vow? Did you know that Anya was silent too? Is that why? That's enough. Mart is all out of patience. Get the fuck back. Mart grabs my arm and tugs me along through the crowd. There are a lot of women here now. Whores. They are all whores. No respectable man brings his wife to a ring of firefight. A little head of blonde hair slips through the legs of the man like a sneaky little dog. Anya's sister. She's definitely not supposed to be here. But no one has ever accused Lazar of being a respectable man. I want to grab her for some reason, tell her to get the fuck out of my party. But she's too quick, too good at the game she's playing, and I lose her in the crowd. I look around for Everett. I kind of remember Rainer kicking him out of the room after the tattooing was done and the fucking was about to begin. After a few minutes of blindly following Mart through the crowd, I find him in the corner. The little girl is, too. He's smiling, laughing out loud, actually. They've both got a glass of electric blue Lectra in their hands. I'm just about to head that way when Mark grabs my arm again. This way, big shot. Your father is waving us over. My father. Isn't it time for that charade to be over? One more training camp on the rock. Then I will never have to see these people again. I will never be beckoned with a wave from across a room. I will never go to one of these parties again. Mart and I push our way through the crowd and I spy Lazar. He's sitting on the same long silver couch that Anya was lounging on earlier in the day, glass in one hand, but he's not drinking Lectra. That shit is bring your own bottle and he gave that bottle to me. But that can't be the reason why he's not drinking it. Surely he can afford hundreds of Lectra bottles. And even if losing this fight did set him back enough where he would second-guess a decision to gulp down a hundred thousand dollars of liquid sex, one of the other men in the room would accommodate him. Surely he has one friend in this room who wants to ease the sting of his loss. So why, Lazar, why aren't you drinking Lectra tonight? Are you sad? Did you love Pavo? Will you miss him? Are you mad that I kicked his lifeless body over the side of the platform? Or are you thinking about how I didn't kill your daughter? Why did you let her live this long if you just want her dead now? What has changed for you, Lazar? He spits at me when we pass him, and that spittle lands on top of my right foot. I scoff. Mart tightens his grip on my arm, tugging me along, leaning into my ear to whisper, We'll get him another time. We have a couple of hours of this, and we're out of here. The helicopter is... But I tune him out. I'm really not interested in the details of how and when we leave the ship. It takes a few more minutes to push our way through the thick crowd of men and their whores before my father finally comes into view again. He throws his head back and laughs at something. He won big tonight. Big. So he's very happy. And even though it's been over a decade since he laid a hand on me, I still feel that old, familiar anger when he smiles. I get tunnel vision, and all I see are his teeth. Like he's a predator. And he is. Play nice, Mark reminds me. Two hours, tops. Just stand there, okay? Can you do that? He's having doubts that I can do that. Obviously. Mart has good instincts. There he is, Udolf beams. His eyes are glassy, his irises ringed blue from the drink. And of course, at the most inappropriate time, the Lectra claws at my mind and brings up a memory. Not just any memory. The bathhouse. That's the Lectra's favorite. I am small. Very small. And there are a lot of little boys around me. We are all terrified. None of them have faces. Not even the little girl who wants me to run has a face. She just has hands. Every time I drink the Lectra, this is what it shows me. And the men. Two men. No faces. And blood. Blood on the bathhouse floor. The rest is... 
war sie. Kurt, my son, Rudolf grabs me, hooks his arm around my shoulder. We are the same height, but he feels small and weak next to my muscular body. At 27, I might be on the other side of my prime fighting days, but I am still the most dangerous man in the room, at least for tonight. I like it that way. That's why I tore out Pavo's heart on the platform. I want them to fear me, yes, but more than that, I want them to hate me. I want them to hate me the way I hate them. So that's how I do it. I will fight. I don't have a choice. But I will give them nightmares, too. They will relive the last moments of Pavo's life over and over again when they sleep. They will wake up in a cold sweat, dripping with adrenaline under their expensive silk sheets. And they will be terrified. They will be Pavo. Because when their long, privileged lives are over, the devil will stand before them ready to claim their souls, and they will tremble. Because they are the losers in the end, not me. And then, just as I think those words, something weird happens. The Lectra takes hold again. I am back in the bathhouse. The little girl has already told me to run. I am running, feet slapping on the wet tiles, slipping around corners, breathing heavy. Screaming when they catch me. They are all screaming. We are all screaming. And then I see a face. But it's not a face. Hey, you still with us, buddy? I blink and I'm back. Me. Strong. Tall. Muscular. Deadly. Me. I'm not that little boy. I haven't been him for a very long time. I am the Ring of Fire world champion. I am the winner. I am free. I blink again and then Lazar is suddenly in front of me. And all I see is his stupid blonde hair. The Lectra takes over my fists and they are pounding him as the room erupts into chaos. The next thing I know I'm running down the hallways of the ship. Mart, Rayner, and Everett are all following me, yelling for me to stop. But I don't stop. Time skips and then keeps skipping, and a helicopter is landing outside. It makes the air thump. I pass by a glass wall and glance at my reflection. I am covered in blood. Not just Lazar's blood, but the blood from Pavo. And probably Anya's blood, too. Because the next thing I know, I'm in a room. A closet, actually and Anya is on the floor at my feet. Bloody. Not fresh blood, all dried up and crackling on her skin. She is asleep. No, she is not asleep. She is unconscious. I remember now. I took her out of the room with me after we had sex. Mart and Rainer were in the shower. I think I passed out. Anya did, for sure. But then I woke up and she and I were alone. So I picked her up then and I pick her up now. I walked her out of my room then and I walk her out of this closet now. I hid her then, but now I reveal my plan. What are you doing, Court? That's Rayner. And he's asking that question in a reasonable way. But when I don't answer and just keep walking, his tone changes. What the fuck are you doing, Court? Is she... dead? That's Everett. He's panicked. He doesn't understand what I'm doing. And neither do I. Not really. But I'm gonna do it anyway. Court! That's Mart. Court, you have one more camp on the rock and then we're done, brother. Do not fuck it up now. Do you hear me, Court? I ignore him. I carry Anya's unconscious body in my arms, trying to find my way back up to the deck. And I do find my way. I always find my way. Then the helicopter is there, and I'm carrying my new, limp, unconscious prize towards it. My father is standing in front of the door, shaking his head. I don't have any idea how much time has passed since I beat the living fuck out of Lazar, but it's been a while, 
because the sun is rising. What are you doing? I don't hear Udolf's words. The spinning rotors are far too loud, but I can read lips like a fucking champ. Still, I don't answer him. Court! What the hell? Lazar is already pissed off enough about how things ended last night. You can't have her. I need her. He reaches for me. For Anya, actually. One arm extended to bar my entrance to the helicopter. Court! I'm talking to you. Put her down. I check him with my shoulder, climb in, drop Anya onto the seat, point at the pilot and shoot him a look that says, You had better take off now, motherfucker, or I will kill you and make a scene you will remember well into your next ten lives. We lift off the ground. Udolf is still reaching for me when I kick him back with one flat foot to the chest and he slams into the concrete. The same concrete where I killed Pavo to the song of pounding tribal drums just a few hours ago. And I salute that fucker. Good game, that salute says. Good game, asshole. But it's over now. And I have declared myself the winner. Chapter 7 Anya My dreams are blue. They are always blue on the Lectra, but the blue is nothing more than a day on repeat. That's how I dream on the drink. Everything repeats. I am profoundly thirsty when I'm startled awake by a deep, keening noise, followed by a series of sounds that could be whistles or some kind of alarm. What the fresh fucking hell is this? I push my ratty hair out of my face and open one eye to find a water-stained concrete ceiling. Then I close it again and just lie there, not even wondering where the hell I'm at or what the fuck that noise is, because the whole thing is blue lectra, and that's just the way of dreams when I'm in the blue. Mm. No. Wait. I open both eyes and squint at the ceiling again. Then I'm awake, fully awake and sitting upright, staring at... What the hell am I looking at here? It's a bird. For sure. It has wings. Large, long wings that... Holy fucking shit. I scramble backward when it attacks, a massive curved beak snapping at me. It calls out. That low keening is the call of this... thing. And this thing sounds eerily human in my hazy post-blue lectra state. I get to my feet and start kicking at it, wanting to yell, forcing myself not to. I pick up a wrinkled and weathered magazine and throw it at the giant albatross. It flaps and flutters. This room is far too small for it to stretch out its wings, which must span at least a dozen feet. And a good south wind sprung up behind. The albatross did follow, and every day, for food or play, came to the mariner's ballo. Huh. I study it for a moment, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's verse lingering in my head as it cranes its neck upwards, opens its beak, and calls out. Something answers back. Oh, shit. I whirl around. There are more. I pick up another discarded magazine, roll it up, and this time I thrust it like a fencing sword. The massive seabird wants to put up a fight. And then there's another noise, and I see why. There's a chick resting on a pile of old clothes in the corner. I use the term chick loosely because when I think chick, I see a tiny newly hatched chicken in my mind's eyes. And that baby chicken and this baby albatross have absolutely no shared characteristics aside from the wings and the beak. 
This baby is as big as Bexie's blonde cocker spaniel back home. It is fluffy and white and takes up a good portion of the available space in... Okay, I push the hair out of my eyes one more time and take stock. Where the hell am I? A small, dirty room made entirely out of concrete blocks. I look around, one hand still thrusting forward to ward off the angry albatross's parental instincts, and get a glimpse of a door that says Generator Room in Portuguese on one side, and another door mostly blocked by the bird. But there is a view of the ocean behind it, and I'm swaying. Am I still on the ship? No, I don't feel like I'm on a ship at all, but the view outside is confusing me. I stab at the bird with my magazine, the massive wings open, spanning the entire width of the room. The tips actually push up against the walls on either side because there's not enough space. It doesn't give up its position in front of my escape route, so I do that another dozen times until finally... It sidesteps its way over to the chick, and I can slip past. Outside, I stop short. Because I was right. I am not on a ship. Not even close to being on a ship. There's nothing around me but ocean for as far as the eye can see. And I am on the top floor of a platform. A platform I vaguely recognize as an oil rig topside. Minus all the things typically on a topside that makes them habitable. There is a large, faded H painted in the center of the platform's open space. A helipad. There are more birds out here as well. Several albatrosses, as well as large, formidable gulls are flying overhead their wings gliding in and through the wind without flapping. There are a few more nests along the edge of the tiny building I woke up in, and each nest hosts another sizable chick. One of my flying enemies dives at me as I run towards the center of the expansive, empty platform to put some space between me and the chicks. When I get there, I stop, turn in a circle, and see nothing in any direction but water. My heart skips, literally skips inside my chest, and then it begins to beat fast, fast, faster. Calm down, Anya. Remain rational and do not overreact. He did not drop you off on an abandoned oil rig, that simply doesn't happen. Your life is not a movie or a book or some other fiction worthy of such drama. I tell myself this kind of shit because there is still a slim chance that I'm not on an abandoned topside. It's still possible that this situation works. It is still possible that my life isn't one long string of fiction-worthy drama. Right. I snort. And it's a real snort, not an implied one. Because a flock of albatrosses, who by the way don't even live in the part of the Atlantic where I was located yesterday, always make their nests on the top floor of a fully working, commissioned topside oil rig. I take a deep breath and let it out force the fear and confusion to go with it. And then, I think rationally. Because that's all there is left to do. So where the fuck am I? Albatrosses don't live over the Atlantic Ocean. It's a stupid, pointless fact to know, I get that. But it's true. They live far, far down in the southern hemisphere, or far, far up in the northern one. They do not live in the tropics. And I cannot be that far away. I just can't. 
it doesn't fit. It's hot and windy and everything feels tropical. Yesterday, I was somewhere off the coast of French Guiana. The ship was heading towards the Gulf of Mexico. And I don't know how I got here, but it was either a helicopter or a boat, which logically means that I cannot be that far from yesterday's position. These birds are out of place. Not me. I press my lips together and nod. I'm going with this last part. Because if I find out I'm stuck on an abandoned topside somewhere down near Antarctica, I might not recover from that revelation. I snort again. Because either way, I'm probably going to die here. I'm clearly alone with no food or water or shelter unless I want to share that tiny building with the overgrown fluffy killer in that nest. Get it together, Anya. You are already losing your mind, and you've only been awake for three minutes. I rally, scan the area, find a stairwell, and head that direction. The birds, both the giants and the gulls, follow in the air, occasionally swooping down at me so I don't forget that I'm an unwanted interloper. The stairwell is partially protected by a framework of metal that encloses the ten steps down to the landing, where I get my first look at the level below. I pick out a sound of clicking at the far end of the platform, which is out of sight. Click, click, click. It's a constant rhythm. But really, it's not a click, it's snick. Snick, snick, snick. And for some reason, it's a familiar sound. Something I recognize. And this gives me hope. My feet skip down the stairs in a hurry, and I slip because they are slick with algae. I slide downward, my back hitting the sharp edge of the metal steps, and I grab at the handrail before I fall too far. I let out a breath as I come to a halt. That's gonna bruise. But then my mind is back on the snicking noise. I don't stand back up. I simply scoot down the steps until the far end of the platform comes into view. And there it is. The noise. It's exactly what it sounded like. A man jumping rope. And if I were a person who laughed out loud, I would do that now. It is sick heart. Jumping rope. But Court is not just jumping rope. He's doing little fighter tricks with that thing. I know, Pavo does this shit too. Did. I remind myself, because he's dead now. I stabbed him in the gut, and Court Van Breda slit his throat and sliced his belly open to steal his heart last night in the fight. This memory makes my stomach royal. Then I gag. And if there was anything in there, I would hurl but luckily, it's empty. I take a deep breath and forget Pavo's death. Instead, I think about all the ways I've seen him jump rope over the years. It was a major part of his training. He was very good at it, and so is the sick heart. He's turning in a circle. One foot, skip. Two foot, skip. One foot, two foot, skip, skip. He stops. Because he sees me. And then he starts again. Skip, skip, skip. Snick, snick, snick as the plastic jump rope clips the concrete with each revolution. No hello. Of course there is no hello, because we don't talk. And that right there. That's some advanced level irony. He's wearing the same shorts as he was last night. Was it last night? I have no idea. 
I drank way too much Lectra. I kinda sorta remember having sex with Court and his two friends, but that's seriously only kinda sorta. He's also still covered in blood. Pavo's blood. His blood. Probably even my blood. And because his body is sweaty, the dried, flaky bits are actually becoming liquid again. The whole thing is horrifying. But then I look down at myself and realize I'm also playing a major role in this horror show. My white dress and my body are both also covered in blood. When I reach up to my lip, there is a thick, crusty scab over the place where Pavo split it open. And my tongue feels so thick inside my mouth, I have trouble working my jaw. Pavo. I sneer his name inside my mind. He punched me in the face. That asshole was going to kill me. And Lazar was going to let him. The snicking stops, and I realize I'm still looking down at my disgusting, blood-covered body. So I look up and find Court is signing something at me. Oh, sick heart. No, no, no. You can just go fuck right off with that shit, okay? I don't speak sign. I don't speak anything. And I am certainly not going to suddenly give up on a silence I have been perfecting for over a decade to communicate with the likes of you. Except I am communicating with him. Because I say all those things with my eyes. And Court Van Breda speaks eyes. Because he laughs. And then he points to something out of my line of sight and his skipping resumes. He turns in his little circle, snick, 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 keeping his back to me. I stay on the stairs, just sit there as the ocean below me crashes against the steel pillars below, sending up a salty mist that irritates the wounds on my body, making them sting. But he doesn't ever look at me again, just jumps his rope. Eventually, I get up and walk, carefully, very, very carefully, so as not to slip again, down the remaining steps and enter the level. This is a gym. That is very clear. There are containers lining the perimeter, multicolored, but mostly an ugly red or green or simply rust. The beams above have lots of hooks where things might hang at some point, but only one heavy bag hangs now, and there are no mats. But it is a gym. I look towards the ocean, wondering if there are people on the lower level, but I don't need to go explore it to know that there aren't. I can feel the emptiness. Emptiness and I are old friends. Even suffocating in a crowd of thousands, emptiness and I would recognize each other immediately. The skipping stops, and when I look over at court, he is pointing again. I am now in a position to see what he is pointing at. It's a line of chalkboards affixed to a wall to my left. Not a wall of containers, but a real cinder block wall. There is a door in the middle, and when I study the space, I realize it's a building. And inside, there might just be promising things. Living quarters, toilets and showers. A kitchen. There must be food here. There must be water. My stomach growls at the mere thought of eating, and I suddenly wonder 
in a very serious fashion, how long I was out. Because I am starving and parched, and my muscles are weak and achy. Very, very achy. Court walks past me and over to the line of chalkboards. He stops in front of the one with the name Anya, printed in neat white chalk capital letters at the top. He points at my name, then he points at what's written underneath. Jump rope. It's a command. I say the words over and over in my head for at least a thousand years before I realize he actually expects me to jump some fucking rope. I shake my head before I can stop it. And then I am fuming. I am pissed. I am nothing but anger. Because for 15 years, I have perfected the art of non-communication. I have withstood beatings over this choice to not speak. They have spit on me. They have slapped me. They have burned me. They have raped me. I have bled buckets of blood and endured volumes of hate and insults for my choice. And after less than 30 minutes of being stuck with my new owner, and yes, that's what he is, a fucking slave owner, let's not mince words here, I have just shaken my head. No. He laughs. Out loud. The way I do not. And he reminds me with that laugh that I am his slave, and he is my owner. And if he tells me to jump rope in the middle of the ocean while my body is still caked in yesterday's blood, and my stomach is rumbling with the pangs of hunger, and my throat is dry with the lack of water, then I will goddamned jump that fucking rope. And not only that, I will like it. He picks the extra jump rope up off the ground and holds it out. I walk over to him, snatch it from his hand, and proceed to jump rope. I don't even remember the last time I jumped rope. I might, in fact, have never jumped rope. It's probable that at some point once, when I was very small, I did this. But it's equally probable that I did not. I just think I did, because that's the kind of thing a normal little girl would do. And I have always wanted to be just a normal little girl. And I never was. So my display, especially next to his, is pathetic and sad. He one foot, two foots his way around his circle again. I am doing some weird double bounce thing with my feet that I can't quite explain. Every time his circle comes back around to me, he's laughing with his eyes. And he lets this go on for a good long while. And even though jumping rope is something children do, it's no joke in the cardio department. I am huffing and wheezing and barely able to breathe by the time he stops his stupid rhythmic snicking, walks over to me, takes the rope from my hands, drops it on the ground, and points to my eyes. Watch, that point says. Then he does a slower version of his snicking. He snick, snick, snicks which makes absolutely no difference to me at all. He stops again, doubles his rope up, holds it in one hand like a whip, and then begins twirling it. Not jumping, just twirling it. Then he hops. He points to his feet. And I notice he's hopping every time the rope says snick. 
He stops, picks up my rope, doubles it up, and hands it to me. He signs something that I assume says, your turn. I hesitate. Because, what the actual fuck, you know? What is the point of this life? It's a real question. What is the fucking point if I'm to be stuck on an abandoned oil rig with a killer who wants to teach me how to jump rope? He begins twirling his whip again, hopping at just the right moment, pointing at me to follow along. I swing the rope, listening for the snick, and then hop. Not at the right moment. But I don't care. This is me doing what he says as far as I'm concerned. His rope is back in both hands now, and he skips while I hop alongside my whip. We do this for a little while, and I'm huffing pretty good. I'm so out of breath, a sharp pain shoots up my side. This makes me remember something, and I stop to just stare at him. His ribs. Jesus Christ. Pavo broke his ribs. That whole scene with the nurses in the clinic trying to get a brace on court. His resistance. He's jumping rope with broken ribs. He stops and signs something at me, which I ignore. But then... Even though I don't want to, I need to. I point at his ribs. At the new tattoo there. A skull, of course. A wraith-like skull that represents the death of Pavo Vervanal. Court looks down at his body, confused, then back up at me, smiling. And he keeps jumping. So, I hop. Out of breath and wheezing, not even jumping rope. It's so fucking sad, my hop. But I do it anyway. Because that's the point, isn't it? The point is pushing through the pain. The point is to keep going because they want you to quit. And the secret... The secret is to keep one thing for yourself and let them steal the rest. Court van Breda must have decided a long time ago that he will keep his pain. They can't have his pain. And they can't have my words, either. That's why he skips. And that's why I don't talk. It's impossible to tell time on the platform. There are no clocks, of course. But also, we're on a middle level and there is no real way to see the sun. I do my pathetic hop for what seems like several more eternities. But it's more likely 20 minutes. And Court shows off with the fanciest jump roping I could never imagine. He skips, he jumps, he hops, he kicks, he double skips, he double jumps, he double hops, but not the way I did. He double kicks. He crosses his arms in a figure eight. He double crosses his arms in a figure eight. He somehow travels the length of the fucking platform doing all these things, like he's dancing with that rope. And he is. Court Van Breda, sick heart himself, is having a love affair with his jump rope right in front of my face, and he has absolutely no shame. He is also not even out of breath. He is dancing back my way when he suddenly stops and points at me, I'm still twirling my rope like a whip off to the side and half-heartedly hopping the way he showed me, but mostly I've been watching him. 
he walks over to me. His body is glistening with a mixture of sweat and dried blood, and he smells like filth. Like dead filth. I would take offense to that smell, but I'm pretty sure some of it is actually me. He takes both handles of the jump rope out of my hand, then holds each one in a single hand, offering the rope back to me. Right. I guess I knew I would have to jump rope for real at some point. I take the rope and skip. And to my surprise, I don't double hop. I don't even trip. I go six or seven whole revolutions before I mess up and have to start over. Court beams a smile at me, like he's proud. Like I am a small, slow child who just needed a little extra practice and encouragement. He signs something at me. I'm internally annoyed and start jumping again. But he puts his hand out, catching my rope, and stops me. His steel-gray eyes look straight into mine. Then he takes my hand, pulls the jump rope handle out of it, and positions my fingers into a series of signs. And it's not like he's trying to teach me anything, because he goes way too fast. He's just making a point, I think. I don't answer or acknowledge him in any way, but again... I don't think he's waiting for it. He hands me back the rope and then turns his back and walks away. I watch for a moment. Well, no, I'm practically studying his back because he doesn't walk far, just over to the wall where he drops his rope on the ground and then reaches his arms up over his head like he's stretching. Hundreds of muscles pop out of his back. He is so well-defined, he looks like an ancient stained marble statue of Adonis, but with a much finer physique. His back piece tattoo is large and intricate, a design that must have taken several years of fights to complete, because even from here, I can count a dozen skulls. My eyes drift down to his ribs, and I study his newest addition. It's a cross between a skeleton and a wraith. It's Pavo, I realize. In death. He won't be going to some better place, if such a place exists. No. Pavo Vervonal is going to hell. And if you are given some kind of incorporeal body to live in for eternity, Pavo will be a skeleton wraith. So it's perfect. Then I remember that I got a tattoo last night as well. I look down at my baby toe and the experience washes over me. Like someone has suddenly pulled back the lectra amnesia and in an instant, everything is clear again. I bend down to touch it to trace the fine, tiny lines of the star. It's a messy star, the kind of star little kids draw, the kind of symbol that says, good job. And weirdly, it matches one he has on his lower stomach. In fact, he's got several stars like this on his body. They are filler, taking up space between his skulls and skeletons. Like the way most tattoo enthusiasts use smoke or flames or tribal designs. And then, because I know Court can't see my face, I smile. It is the first real smile since... Well, I have to pause at that. Because I smiled yesterday, too. That moment when Court took the Bokori bottle of Lectra from the bar. Hmm. Two smiles in two days. And both of them are because of Court Van Breda's actions. His feet are suddenly in my field of vision, and when I look up, I realize I'm in a very submissive position. 
I immediately stand back up, but I don't look him in the eyes. He bends down and studies my toe. Then he taps my ankle. I realize too late that it's a signal to lift up my foot, but he's already got it off the ground and I'm stumbling backwards. One strong hand grabs my wrist and I am suddenly balanced again. His fingers trace the star on my toe as well. And then he is still. It's a weird stillness because he's just staring down at my foot and all I can see is the top of his head and the points of his knees. His thumb caresses my toe and the whole thing is suddenly weird. What is he doing? Why is he just staring at my toe? His shoulders curve in and he sighs. Then he looks up at me. It's a startling look. A vulnerable look. He signs something at me, but in the same moment, he is frowning. My expression is flat, because I've been doing this a long time, and that's just instinct. But if he didn't look away, if he didn't let go of my foot, stand up, turn his back, and walk off, then, then I would have responded. Because the way he looked at me, that look was something worthy of a response. But just as quickly as it came, the moment disappears. It is utterly erased. He makes me jump rope. I have no concept of time. But while I'm jumping, he is working the heavy bag hanging from a steel beam. It's the only bag on the whole platform, even though there are hooks for dozens and dozens of bags on the ceiling. I get better at skipping as I watch him. My feet seem to grasp the new movements, and even though I can't go more than one or two dozen revolutions without messing up, that's actually a good thing, because I need recovery time. I haven't exerted myself so much since, well, never. Court does punches. Punch after punch after punch. Fast ones, slow ones, combinations, what have you. I'm no punch expert, but it feels like he works through a sequence, some predetermined course of practice that he's been doing his whole life. And the entire time, he is distracted. At least, that's how he comes off to me, thinking about other things. Like, this is just mindless busy work to him. Eventually, he stops and walks over to me. We are both disgusting. Nothing but sweat and blood, some of it his, some of it mine, some of it Pavo's. And it strikes me, then, that we're both pretty sick people. There is an ocean of water beneath our feet. One dip and we could wash this blood away. But we don't. We didn't. And it's weird. He points at me, rolls his hand. I get the meaning. He wants to check my skipping. So I skip. Because I can, now, and I don't mind it. There are a lot worse things in this world than skipping rope. He nods. No smile, no thumbs up, no pat on the back or star on the toe. Just a nod, and then a point. Keep going. That's what that nod and point mean. I learned a long time ago that people would put up with my silence as long as I don't play dumb. If they can get their point across, and I do as I'm told, eventually they'll get tired of punishing me for my silence. So I keep going. And he starts kicking that bag. I have no clue what these kicks are called, but he does lots of different types of them. Front kicks and back kicks and side kicks and jump kicks. He does spinning kicks, and then he's flipping, and I actually stop skipping to watch that part of his show. 
because that's what this is. He's putting on a show for me. And that's when I realize that he's working out in front of me for a reason. And I am jumping rope as busy work. I am jumping rope so he can make me do two things at once. This is pretty clever on his part. I get a little lost as I imagine that this is how he runs his training camp. I picture men like him, younger though, maybe teens, all jumping rope like me, all watching him dance with it, then fight the bag with punches and kicks. They soak him up like a sponge. And so do I. This is how we spend our day. At one point, he shows me where the water is, hands me one of two plastic cups, and we drink. I pause many times. I lean my back against the steel beam closest to me and slide down it, resting as he continues his routine. He never seems to get annoyed with my breaks, though I am careful not to take advantage. I rest, catch my breath, then get back up and continue. He does the same, only for much longer stretches. He works that bag hard. And then he slides his back down the far wall and watches me. I let him. I mean, it's not like I could stop him, but I could turn my back and send a message. But I don't. And I find that I don't hate him. I find that these long, easy periods of skipping and drinking and resting and then doing it all over again are a comforting routine. Something I can count on. This is a gift, I think. Day one with a new master should be filled with anxiety about my future. And it's not. Perhaps he is instilling a false sense of security in me. Perhaps this is some elaborate evil plan, and tonight when it's dark and I'm too tired to fight back, perhaps he will rape me. But I don't think so. And a girl like me doesn't get this far in life by being afraid of a little coerced sex. That's fucking ridiculous. I'm not afraid that he will fuck me tonight. So his plan, if it is a plan, is working. I am, if not at ease, then resigned to my fate. But all things must end eventually, and this easy, predictable day is no exception. The sun is finally visible on the left side of the platform because it's low on the horizon. It is May right now, so I approximate the time to be perhaps 5.30 or 6 o'clock, when he takes the rope from my hands and sets it down in a little pile next to his. Then he points to the stairs, and we meet up over there and begin to climb. The birds attack. I had forgotten about the fucking birds. They are huge. The wingspan on these albatrosses is easily four meters from tip to tip. They are like pterodactyls. Something out of place and out of time. But Court waves them off like this is just part of the fun of living on an abandoned oil rig in the middle of the ocean. And they are not persistent. We make our way to the other end of the upper platform behind the small building that I woke up in this morning. And he points to the back wall. That's when I notice the hose. It is draped over a large hook. The nozzle looks like something you'd clean the bottom of a boat with. And I see what's coming. I hesitate. He takes my arm, not harshly, and drags me over to the wall. Then he points at me. I've deciphered about two dozen of his points today. And this one means don't move. It's gonna stop. Ding. I already know that. But I'm sweaty, wearing yesterday's paint and blood, and I don't really care how I get clean at this point. Just get me clean. So I strip off my dress, toss it aside, 
and stand with my back against the wall and my eyes closed. Yes, it fucking hurts. And even though I don't want to wince and hug myself and cower from the cold water, I do all of that. He makes me turn around and face the wall, and then he sprays my back, too. The whole thing takes maybe five minutes. My body is red and stings all over when he's done. But I am clean. Court walks over to me, his body still smelling of death and filth, still covered in sweat and blood and pain, and he hands me the hose. I look at it, and then at him, and realize he wants me to hose him down next. This is the moment when I realize everything I thought I knew about Court Van Breda was wrong. Maybe I understand the sick heart. I get the fighter inside him. But Court? The man inside him? No. I was wrong. I could hurt him with this hose. And he either doesn't care or he doesn't think I will. I won't. Chapter 8. Court When I first introduced Anya to the jump rope, her face was a mixture of sadness, confusion, and many years of lowered expectations. I'm pretty sure she thinks that no one can read her, but I can read everyone. We might be silent for very different reasons, but the outcome is the same. Silence lets you hear things that aren't said. Silence lets you see things unseen. Silence gives you space. And space is a gift if ever there was one. My first trip out to this rock was when I was around five. Udolf had just acquired me and I was not in the mood to comply with anything he had in mind for my first night at his estate. I ran. I hid. And when they found me, I kicked, I screamed, and I bit. It didn't stop him. He did with me what he had planned to do with me. He beat me senseless that first night. He beat me so hard, and for so long, I just passed out. And really, that was a gift as well, because I have no solid memory of that night, or anything that came before my first trip out here to the rock. The only thing I have left of the life that came before Udolf is the Lectra dream. And that's not reality. When Udolf dropped me off on the lowest platform of the rock that first time, I stayed for three months, alone. There was no food, but there was water, and that was so cruel. You can die in three days with no water. It takes months to waste away from starvation. Even a small boy can last many weeks without food. It was good water, though. Bottled. Sealed. Clean. A hundred cases, at least. I had so much fresh water I bathed in it. The rig had only been decommissioned for a few months when I arrived. It was still clean, and you could walk all the way down the steps to the water without slipping on slick algae and breaking your neck if you weren't careful. All the housing containers had been removed, but there were still leftover things inside the permanent building on the middle level. Clothes and blankets, and even a deck of cards. And there was the kitchen, of course. Bathrooms, too. Those were built into the frame of the topside for electrical reasons and couldn't be disconnected. Food, on the other hand, that was hard to come by. There was no leftover food on the rig, and it would take me weeks before I successfully caught my first fish down on the lowest platform, using a steel beam as a spear and a discarded net that was stuck on the rig's frame, just above sea level. But that wasn't what kept me alive. The bird kept me alive. Just one bird back then. One wayward albatross who should have been on the other side of the world. His wing was bent in a weird way, and he didn't fly very well. I don't know how he got here, since the natural habitat of the royal albatross is 
subantarctic, and this rig is equatorial. But he was here, and he could still fly. Just not well enough to go home. I think he knew I was in the same position, so we were in it together. I gave him water, and he brought me food like I was his chick. Little fishes. Little disgusting fishes that he spit out and I swallowed whole so I didn't have to chew. And even though I could have talked to the bird, I didn't. Not at first. He didn't say anything either. It was like we both knew there was no fucking point. We were stuck here, and that was that. I liked it. I won't admit that to anyone, but I liked it out here on the rock. It was my first real taste of freedom. For the very first time, I was in charge of my life. Rudolf came back months later, expecting me to be dead, and only there to drop off another disobedient houseboy who was actually thrown off the rig and disappeared into the dark, choppy water without ceremony before we left. By that time, I didn't want to leave. That bird? He was the only family I had left. That was the last time I cried. And that is how I learned to be silent. When I finally got off the rock, I was taken to Udolf's training camp. Apparently, in Udolf's world, you were either a houseboy or a gym boy, and he had decided that I was a gym boy. His camp back then was nothing like my camp right now, and it would take me ten long years before I had won enough fights and killed enough boys to earn my own camp. But on that flight from the rock to the shore, Udolf had come up with a new way to separate the wheat from the chaff thanks to me. Every boy from then on would do three months on the rock, alone. He lost a lot of boys that way, but they were disposable, weren't they? And anyway, that was in my favor, because if any of them had come back, they would be formidable opponents. Pavo Vervanal was the first to make it off the rock, but by that time I was nearly eight and he was just five. He followed me around like a sad, lost puppy when they brought him back, but he was sold just a few months later, so I never thought about him much. I don't know if Lazar was the one who bought him originally. It doesn't matter. The point was, Pavo had earned his place as wheat, and that fight last night was nineteen years in the making. It's hard to believe that it's over. Almost too good to be true. Anya is staring at me. Then her eyes drift down to the hose in my hands. She looks disoriented and confused. I would not call her clean, but the blood and the paint has been stripped off her flesh. She is red now, not pale. And for the first time I take a good long look at her body. Her breasts are firm and her nipples are bunched up into tight peaks. Her hips are wide and her waist is narrow. Her hair is blonde, but it looks brown now that it's wet. She is pretty, even like this, and without recalling her from yesterday when I had just arrived on the ship, I can see her beauty. I can see why Lazar kept her around long after her usefulness wore off. He could have sold her, and she would have fetched a lot of money if her buyer wasn't put off by her silence. But Lazar kept her long past her, for lack of a better word, usefulness. And then he chose to put her up as a sacrifice. Why? Was he really so sure that Pavo would beat me and she would not be killed? Or was it something else? Anya steps forward, reaching for the hose, and I have to shake myself out of my introspection. It happens to me out here. I lose myself in the open sea and the wind and the birds. There are a lot of birds now. Not all of them albatrosses. Lots of gulls, too. And is it irony or fate that this old rig has turned into an unsanctioned breeding colony of vulnerable, wayward seabirds? I don't know, but I smile about it anyway. I slip my shorts down my legs and stand still. Most of the paint and blood has melted away with the sweat from the day's workout, but it has left filthy, disgusting streaks down my legs. Anya turns the hose on and it hits my body at full force, making me take several steps backward and grab at my ribs. She turns it off and shakes her head, like she didn't mean to do that. I sign to her. Go ahead. 
I'm okay. She doesn't understand the first part, but everyone knows the sign for okay. The hose hits me again. This time she has figured out the mechanism for pressure, and while it's still strong and it still hurts, it's nothing I can't handle. I place both my hands on top of my head and stand there, naked and with my eyes closed, as she washes me off. When she's done, I coil the hose back up, hang it on the hook, and then nod for her to follow me. It's not the best way to get clean here on the rock, but it's the only way to fully enjoy what comes next. We go down to the training level, but this time I take her into the building. It's dark, so I prop the door open with a large rock, sign for her to stay put, and then I turn and walk forward down the hallway. There isn't a whole lot to this building. It's got the switch for the generator, which lives in the small building on the top level. A lavatory with about a dozen urinals and a few stalls, minus the showers, since the living quarter containers that used to populate this rig all had private bathrooms. A clinic that is mostly stocked, and a small kitchen that was only used for the construction crew, because when a rig is running it has a proper mess container. I find the switch, kick it on, and the whole place comes to life with a rumble. Back in the hallway, I flick on the lights and find Anya standing in the open doorway where I left her. She looks me up and down, and I do the same, like we're both just now noticing the other is naked. We are also both still wet, and she is shivering a little. I should probably give her a towel, but it's not really necessary. I beckon her with a crooked finger and then disappear into the kitchen. She follows me, standing in a new doorway now, just watching as I take things out of the cupboards and hold them out for her to see. I'm not your fucking cook, these gestures say. I will cook for you tonight because you're new, but I'm not your fucking cook. So take notice of where I find these things and what I do with them. I think she gets it because she unconsciously sneers her lip as she watches my hands. I show her how to wait for the water to run clear when I turn on the tap. I show her how to make rice in the small cooker. I show her the prepackaged, dehydrated meat. And then, when everything is cooking, I nod my head and make her follow me down the hallway again. There is one more room to show her today. The best room. The whole reason why we hose off first. And when she sees the tub, and when I turn on the water and it begins to steam, she sighs. No, she fucking moans. I chuckle out loud. It's not a bathtub, it's a therapy tub. Meant for athletes, not spa days. But the end result is the same. Warm, pampered muscles after a long day of work. Anya leans against the door frame as the tub fills and I go searching through cupboards for soap and shampoo. We don't keep anything fancy here and for a moment I wish we did. It was a long day for her and she didn't complain. So I want to make her feel better. Or at least understand that what I do here has a purpose and has got nothing to do with torture. Luxury soaps and lotions are just an easy way to do that. But Anya doesn't seem to care that the toiletries are industrial grade. I hold out my hand. She pushes off the door frame and walks towards me, accepts my help as she walks up the four wooden steps, and then squeezes my hand as she swings her leg over and lowers herself into the hot water. I climb in after her and we settle on benches placed opposite. The water hits her mid-waist, so I have a very nice view of her breasts. If this bothers her, she doesn't show it. And why should it bother her? She is a Bokori house slave. That old one, for sure. So she probably hasn't been touched in a while. But she was raised naked, like me. They do that to strip us of any lingering sense of self. To make us into things to be used. To take away our humanity. And once it's gone, it doesn't matter what happens next. It doesn't matter if the nicest man alive buys you, takes you into his home, treats you like a person gives you plenty to eat, and never even looks at your body like it is just a thing to be used. It does not matter how good it gets after that first shattering. You don't come back from that. You are dead inside, and you are a killer on the outside. Anya Bokori is a killer, and so am I. 
She straddled Pavo Vervonal last night and thrust a knife into his gut. I practically cut off his head five seconds later and then ripped his body open and tore out his heart. There is no happy ending for us. A tub of hot water on a rock in the middle of a dark ocean, with birds that look like they came right out of Jurassic Park flying overhead, ready to pick apart your half-dead body and feed it to their chicks. This is about as good as it gets. Anya washes herself quickly. She soaps up her hair and dunks under to rinse it off. And in less than three minutes, she is done. Her blue eyes find mine, filled to the brim with questions. She looks at me like she doesn't know what to do next. I'm more careful. My ribs are actually screaming at this point. I overwork them today, and every time I draw in a breath, a sharp pain shoots through my upper body. I point to my eyes, then her. Then close my eyes. Then open them and point to her again. She gets it. And she sighs, maybe letting down her guard a little. Because she slouches down, her foot bumping against mine, and closes her eyes. I watch her, fascinated as I wash up. And then I do the same. I slouch down and stretch out my long legs then decide to prop my feet up on her bench, brushing them against her hips. I peek, just to see if she will object to that with a sharp look. But she doesn't open her eyes. Instead, she props her feet up on my bench, brushing them against my hips. And then it's my turn to sigh. The buzzing of the rice cooker down the hall wakes me, and I sit up, a little bit disoriented. Anya is as well. She rubs her eyes and breathes heavy as she tries to make sense of her surroundings. Like she was in a deep sleep and it came with a dream that had nothing to do with me. Then she looks at me and her gaze is one of understanding. I get out of the tub, grab a towel from a shelf, wrap it around me, then go looking for clothes. I find us t-shirts and shorts and take them back up to the tub room. Once we're dressed, I take her into the kitchen scoop the rice and meat mixture into two bowls, give her a fork and signal for her to follow me out onto the training platform. We sit on the hard concrete and lean up against the wall. Normally I like to eat up top. I sign this to her one-handed as we both shove the food into our mouths. But the birds will steal the meat right out of your bowl since you're new here. I don't think she understands, but I don't care. If it really were just me out here tonight... I'd be signing things to the general. That's the name I gave my old bird buddy. I'd be filling him in on the last eight months of my life. So having Anya here instead, this is like a bonus, even if she doesn't talk back. The general never really did either. I mean, I always gave him points for trying, but while his vocabulary is interesting, it's not very big. I've done a lot of research on the albatross over the years. They are monogamous birds. They find one soulmate and that's it. Just one. And even though they live solitary lives when they're not breeding, soaring over the ocean for months and months at a time without ever touching solid ground, they meet up every other year to raise a new chick. The general is somewhere around 30 years old right now, and he'll live another 30 if he's careful. So I guess I did win in the end, didn't I? I do have a family. A rather big one, actually. The general has raised ten chicks on this rig with his mate, who I call Seeker. I don't know where he found her, and it's entirely probable that they were mated before he got lost and she actually found him after he disappeared. But either way, they live here now. Ten chicks over twenty-two years. It's not a bad record for an albatross. And every single one of those chicks has left the nest has found their own wayward mate, and has come back here every other year to meet back up. This rock of death is an unsanctioned breeding colony for the largest flying bird on Earth. This prison, this punishment of a place, is also home to something a little bit... magical. Now that's only one of the many reasons I love it. Dinner is over too soon. I catch Anya staring into her empty bowl, wishing for more. 
I explain that things are scarce here at the moment. And even though she doesn't know any signs and I get the feeling that this vow of silence is something she takes very seriously, she nods her understanding. Frowning, though. It comes with a frown. I take our bowls back into the kitchen and dump them, wash everything up and put it all away. Then I go back out to the platform and find her standing near the edge, looking out over the dark ocean. Night out here can be one of two things. Deeply terrifying or indescribably peaceful. I know what my first night of the rock was like, and even though Anya's position is much more advantageous, it's got to be unsettling. I walk over, tap her on the shoulder, and motion for her to follow me. Then I open up one of the huge shipping containers to reveal stacks and stacks of sleeping mats. I hand her one then grab one for myself and direct her to follow me up the stairs. It's night now, and there are at least a dozen albatross chicks sleeping on makeshift nests, and another dozen adults with their heads under their wings, also sleeping. There are twice that number up in the air somewhere. Most are far, far away, out hunting so they can bring food back for their mates and their chicks. They're quiet at night, and they don't even look up as we walk past them, out towards the southern edge of the platform. I lay down my mat, and Anya does the same. Then I ease my aching body down, trying to be mindful of the ribs, and let out a long breath. I overdid it today. I think it's because I was still high on the Lectra and the drugs. But all that has worn off now, and every time I breathe, that sharp pain is there to remind me of what happened yesterday. It's easy to forget, at least for me. I'm so far away from that ship right now, so far away from everything that reminds me of who I am and what I do, that it's just too easy to forget. But Anya isn't me, and she has not forgotten. Anya sits down on her mat, but she doesn't lie back. She hugs her knees and stares off into the distance. There is a shipping lane about fifty miles south of here that I sometimes like to watch. And on the north side of the platform I can see the city lights of São Luís, the capital city of Maranhão. If I were in a pensive mood I would imagine I can see my base camp, which also lies in that direction. But I'm not pensive tonight. I'm content. I point to the barely visible sliver of moon out of habit, glancing over at Anya to make sure she sees this. She does, but she's not interested. So I put my hands behind my head and look up and study the stars. I don't know a single constellation name. When I'm out here, I often wonder what they're really called and how to figure out which one is which. But of course, wondering things out here does me no good. There is no internet to look things up. And when I'm back at home, I don't have time to watch the stars. No one gives a fuck what stage the moon is in. The sky is just the space above us, so I have never bothered to learn the names of the things up there. Anya sighs and lies back, just as one of the birds wanders over to me and sits down next to my head, snuggles into me and then tucks her head back under her wing and falls quickly back to sleep. I catch Anya smiling out of the corner of my eye when another one wanders up and does the same, pushing her large body against my broken ribs until I wince. Then all the adults are wandering over. They have missed me. Anya sighs, and this makes me turn my head so I can see her face over the large back of an albatross. What does she think of all this? Does it scare her? To be out here so alone? Among these giant birds that could, if they wanted to, rip her to pieces with their massive beaks? Or does she like it the way I do? Does she feel free and safe? I would ask. I want to ask, actually. But she won't answer, so I don't bother. I just look at the sliver of moon and settle back into life on the rock. And then, before I even realize it, I'm out. There is no hope of sleeping past sunrise on the rock. The gulls scream the moment the sun first peeks out over the horizon. They circle and squawk, soaring above us and diving down to poke at us, and Anya is on her feet, 
waving her hands in the air to ward them off. The albatross who huddled with us all night are gone now, either tending to chicks or out looking for food. But the damn gulls, they prefer to steal their breakfast. And now that I'm back, they remember how to do that. We pick up our mats, go back down to the training platform, and there they are. Dozens of gulls waiting patiently near the door to the kitchen. I chase them off, but this is a losing battle. The albatross don't come down here. They prefer the open air of the top platform. But gulls are a different kind of bird altogether. They don't breed here, thank God. They would quickly take over the platform and there would be no way to get rid of them once that happened. But they are curious and smart and will steal anything they can carry unless you're diligent. I don't need to be diligent in the morning because there will be no breakfast. Anya follows me over to the container and we drop our mats inside. Then I close it back up. I can hear her stomach growling and I know she is expecting food. Maybe even coffee which makes me internally chuckle. But bringing her to the rock with me wasn't in the plan, and even though we have food, when we left here last year, we only rationed enough for me when I came back. So there isn't enough food to feed two people for the length of time that we will be here. So, one meal a day, and that's still pushing it. I go over to the jump ropes, pick them up, and then hold one out for her. She doesn't take it. I drop it at her feet and shrug. She will skip rope today. She will do a lot more than that, too, if she wants to eat tonight. But she can pretend she won't for a little while, if that makes her happy. I start skipping. My ribs are still screaming, and they will continue to do that for at least a month. But it is what it is. A few broken ribs aren't enough to interrupt my training schedule. I casually make my way down the length of the platform, then back again. Anya has gotten herself a drink of water and she's dragging her fingers over her teeth. I stop skipping and stare at her, shaking my head a little. She doesn't get it. And I suddenly understand that she might have the willpower to withstand my rules and decide I need to make a point here in the interest of saving time. So I walk over, take the cup of water out of her hand, dump it out so it splashes up her legs drop the cup on the ground and point to her jump rope. Her expression never changes. And we're back. Petulant Anya has decided she is too tired to jump rope, or she is too sore to jump rope, or she is too hungry to jump rope, or maybe she is just too fucking good to jump rope. She picks up the cup, fills it with water, walks back over to me, brings it to her lips. I take the cup, dump it out, throw it on the ground and point to her jump rope. She picks up the cup, fills it with water, walks back over to me and throws it in my face. Cold water hits me in the eyes and runs down my chest. I look at it, then back up at her. She is still defiant. No expression. Just a flat line of a mouth. I grab her arm. Hard. Hard enough to make it blanch. She tries to pull away, but there is no hope of that. Her arm is a spindly thing and my hand is so large in comparison I almost completely encircle it. If she wants me to leave fingerprints on her skin, I will. And there's no one here to stop me. I pick up her rope with my other hand and shove it at her. She refuses to take it. You get one chance with me. If I were talking, I'm sure this little rebellion of hers could be squashed with one or two harsh threats. But I'm not talking and she never talks, so the easy way isn't an option. I drag her over to the stairs. She resists, of course, but now I'm fucking pissed. I drag her down one level, throw her on the ground, and then shut the squeaky chain-link gate and clamp the combination lock closed on the latch. She just looks at me from the floor, unmoving, disbelieving. I sign at her, my hands and fingers moving quickly. Believe it, princess. This is happening, and I'm only going to do this once. Do it again, and you will go in the ocean. She doesn't understand the signs, but she gets it. Because she stands up, rushes over to the gate, wraps her fingers around the chain link, and rattles it. I turn my back. One chance. That's all you get with me. I'm not fucking around. 
I leave her there, climb back up the stairs, and start my workout. And you know what the nice thing about her is? She's silent. There is no screaming. There is no kicking. There are no hysterical threats. She is easy to forget. So that's what I do. I forget her. Chapter 9. Anya. All night those birds bothered me. They nipped me with their long, thick beaks. They flapped their wings at me. They stretched their necks and threatened me eye to eye until I rolled over, covered my head with my hands, and just didn't move until morning. I know how this sounds. Birds are out to get me. I am insane. But these aren't just any birds. They are one meter tall and four meters wide when they open their wings. And when they decided that they didn't appreciate the fact that I was sleeping in the middle of their nesting grounds, they held it against me. Stupid sick heart couldn't even wake up once to control his flying beasts. And they wouldn't let me get close enough to shake him awake. I didn't sleep. Not a wink all night. And when I figured out that he wasn't going to feed me breakfast, well, it was a breaking point for me. Call me naive. Fine. I guess my expectations for being one of Sick Heart's concubines were unrealistic. Because I thought that position would come with an actual place to live. A place with a bed and a roof and food. That dinner last night was pathetic. Barely a cup of rice. Probably more like half a cup, if I'm being honest. And a few meager scraps of rehydrated meat? Are you fucking kidding me? After I burned, what, 2,000, 3,000 calories jumping rope yesterday? And then no breakfast? Just, here's your rope, Anya, get busy. Well, fuck you. I rattle the chain link gate. But he's gone. Court Van Breda is already skipping his stupid rope. I can hear it on the concrete above my head. Snick, snick, snick. It has been a long time since I had the urge to scream, but I have that urge right now. I want to open up my throat and wail, but I can't, because I'm silent. And I will stay silent, goddammit. My voice is the only thing on this body that is mine and mine alone. Even my baby toe has been claimed with this monster's mark. He will not get my voice. Ever. I look around the platform and realize it's a lot like the one above, except there are a lot more containers. In fact, there are so many containers they form a steel box perimeter around the entire level. Front facing and locked up tight with no space between them at all. So I have no view of the ocean. But I don't need a view to understand that it is very close. The stairs go down another level at least, but from the sound of the ocean, I decide it's probably not a level. More than likely, it's the base of the top side. The wind is strong today. Even with the containers forming a makeshift seawall, it finds a way into the space, whistling and whipping my hair around my face. And every once in a while, the waves are big enough to splash against the containers and a puddle of seawater seeps underneath them and stains the space around them with dark wetness. I try to open the containers, but they are all padlocked. Then I go back over to see if there's a way to climb over the gate. I'm not at that stage yet, but it's good information to have. The gate is not scalable. It fits snugly to the top of the frame. Not even room for a finger to squeeze through. So I slide down a steel beam in the center of the space and wait. I sit, quietly straining to hear the workout going on above my head. I am good. 
I am calm. I am silent. I am compliant. But Court Van Breda doesn't come back. It's times like this that I wish I did speak. Because I could call up, Hello? I'm sorry for overreacting, but I'm hungry and your birds didn't let me sleep last night. I can't breathe through my nose, my lip is split, my entire body aches, and I don't understand what's happening. And a reasonable person would at least listen to me. But I can't say any of that, and court isn't acting very reasonable today. So I sit, and I wait. There is water down here. A steel spigot that sticks up from the floor, connected to dubious-looking rusty pipes which lead up top. Is this water potable? I have no idea. But by late afternoon, I no longer care. I turn it on, stick my mouth underneath the spigot, and gulp it down. It's not salty, so that's something. Then I wait some more. Surely, once his workout is over, he will feed me. I get it now. One meal a day. I can deal. It's fine. But he doesn't feed me. The sun sets, and I sit. And he never comes. The sound of his workout faded a long time ago and the curious gulls who kept me company for most of the afternoon disappear. I know where they are, up top, begging for food or trying to steal it out of his bowl. My stomach cries. It twists and gurgles and whines for something to take the edge off. But Court never comes. He doesn't come at sundown. He doesn't come at dinner time. He doesn't come in the morning. He leaves me here to rot. At least, I don't see him come. At some point in the night, I drift off, defeated by utter exhaustion. And when I wake up, no, Court isn't here. But he was here. Because in a little pile on the first step outside of the gate is a jump rope. My hands are small, but not so small that fitting them through the hole of this chain-link fence doesn't come with pain. Nonetheless, I'm able to press my arm forward just enough that the tips of my fingers are able to reach the rope and pull it through to the other side. Message received, sick heart. I start skipping rope. It takes him several more hours to appear at my gate. And then he spends at least five more minutes signing things at me, furious fingers flitting through the air, his eyebrows knit into anger and frustration, his mouth tight, his breathing heavy. I have no hope of keeping up with all his signs, but he doesn't seem to care if I understand his words. He wants me to know one thing and one thing only. I've pushed his button and he's pissed. I roll the events back in my mind as he continues his silent rant, trying to figure out where exactly I crossed that line. Of course, throwing water in his face was definitely over the top, but that wasn't his breaking point. It was before that, and that's why he poured the water out. Finally, his fingers shut up, then he opens the gate, points at me, frowns at me, hisses his silent words at me with his fingers, and then he points upward. Finally. I push past him, go up, and if I think that he might feed me or give me a drink of water or do anything other than instruct me to jump rope, I'm mistaken. I jump rope and watch Court Van Breda dance with his. One foot, two foot, skip, 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 figure eight, straddle, cross, scissor, scissor, spin. He does things with that rope that I can't even begin to describe. He does have a rhythm, 
I will give him that. And watching him really isn't that boring. In fact, there's no way to not watch him. And it's not because he's the only thing on the platform. There are at least a dozen gulls getting up to things. And one huge albatross is wandering around, poking his beak at the door leading to the kitchen, like he's thinking about grabbing some breakfast. Nice try, buddy. If anyone's getting breakfast around here, it's me. I'll fight you for it. But even with all that distracting me, Court has my full attention. We don't jump for long, not like the other day. He stops, walks over and takes my rope, then drops them both into a pile near the kitchen door. He chases the albatross until it unceremoniously steps off the platform and glides away in the wind. Then he turns back to me, his steel gray eyes burning into mine. I feel very small when I become the center of his attention. He snaps his fingers and points, and then I follow him down the line of containers until we stop in front of a green one. He opens it up to reveal, well, I don't fucking know what that thing is. It's a metal frame contraption, and it's holding a huge punching bag on a chain. The whole thing is on wheels, and under his direction, I maneuver inside the container and get behind it so we can push it out. There are dozens of punching bags stacked in the back of the container, but I don't have time to think about that, because Court and I are taking this one over to where the other bag is hanging from the ceiling beam. He pretty much does everything else, and I realize this thing is a crane used to hang heavy bags. It lifts the bags up, then Court climbs up the contraption, slides the bag's chain onto a hook, and then hops off and lowers the crane. For a moment, my stomach sinks, because I'm thinking he's going to make me do this. This is my punishment. He's going to make me hang punching bags all day. But when we push the crane back to the container, he slides it inside and closes the door. Then he opens another container, drags out a mat, and positions it underneath the new bag. And then he looks at me and smiles. And that's when I realize my punishment is going to be way worse than hanging bags. He walks over to the new bag and then demonstrates a few punches and kicks and points to it. I huff. Right. But I'm too hungry to argue. If I piss him off today and he decides not to feed me, I don't know what I'll do. It's been a long time since someone starved me. I'm not used to it anymore. In fact, I might have let myself go over the years. I might have forgotten what it was like to be a girl in this world I live in. I might have gotten soft. I can't afford to be soft. Not then, not now, not ever, if I want to survive. So I suck it up and start kicking and punching. Court watches me for a little bit, his arms crossed over his skull-covered chest, his gray eyes mostly looking at my hands and feet, and not so much at my face. I'm expecting him to correct me because I have no idea what I'm doing, and this is painfully obvious, but he doesn't. He watches... Then he walks over to his bag and begins his own workout, which looks nothing like the one I'm doing. I slowly position myself so that I can watch him as he goes through his moves and still keep punching and kicking my bag. This is when I realize I'm doing it all wrong. I squint and try to decipher his punches. He's got a combination of them hooks or whatever. I'm not sure what they're called, but I copy him. Not hitting the bag hard, because that actually hurts. I'm pretty sure you're supposed to have gloves on, or tape or something. My knuckles are bright red after only a few minutes, so I don't put a lot of effort into the force. Instead, I just concentrate on the form. When he moves on to kicks, I do the same thing. 
I watch him and notice something important. Most of the time, he's not connecting with his foot, but with his knee. I try to copy him again. And maybe it's far from perfect, but by the time he steps away from the bag, I have better form than I had when I started a few hours ago. He pays no attention to me at all. His gaze is directed towards the sky, distracted by something. I use this moment to study him. His body is slick with sweat, his breath still coming out quick and with effort from his workout. He runs his fingers over his head and turns to me. I have an urge to smile until I see the look on his face. And then I hear the helicopter. I whirl around, looking for it, but Court has me by the arm and he's tugging me across the platform towards the stairs. He's not careful as he leads me back down to the prison level, and when I realize he's going to lock me in again, I decide this is my limit. No! I scream it inside my head. I don't want to be left down here. I spent a lot of calories this morning. I need food. He shoves me hard enough to make me stumble and fall. Then he locks the gate and disappears back up the stairs. Now the helicopter is loud, directly above us. It lands, but the rotors don't wind down. I wait, wondering what this could mean. Did someone come for me? Is it Lazar? Did Ring of Fire decide I won the fight and I don't have to be here with Court? Oh, I hope so. Please, please, please. And when I see Court's father, Udolf, appear at the top of the stairs, I become even more hopeful. It's true. I won that fight. I am not the sick heart's prize. I'm going to get on that helicopter and fly away from here, and I'm never going to see Court van Breda again. But then I read the expression on Udolf's face. It's an expression I recognize. It's an expression I know well, because I grew up with a man who looked at me that same way once upon a time. And this is when I realize my rescue fantasy is just that. A fantasy. Because Udolf is looking at me like I'm his prize. Like I'm his slave. Like he is going to take me off this rig. But I definitely won't like what happens. Next. Chapter 10. Court. Fuck him. I sign that right in Udolf's face. Fuck you. I've made it 22 years in this hellhole. I'm at the end now. I've earned this. And he's going to come here and tell me he's taking on you for himself? Fuck you. I flash my fingers in his face. Stop it! He bats my hands away, snarling. Use your voice, Court. I'm tired of these games. He's tired of the games. This motherfucker invented the game. He's pissed because I found a new way to play and my success forced him to play along. He would never admit to knowing sign language in public because it is the language of slaves. And then everyone would know he learned it to talk to me. But he does know it. He understands every fucking word I sign. Where is she? I point to the lower levels, then flash. You're not taking her. She's mine. He scoffs. <laughs> you don't even like girls. That's not even true. I like girls just fine. And I'm keeping this one because she's my last fucking prize and I want her secrets. I want to know what's going on inside that head of hers. I want to open her up and see what's inside. He's not getting her. And anyway, I sign. She's too old for you. His chuckle comes out with his words. <laughs> That's not what I want her for. Then what does he want her for? Not to have sex with. He and his ilk. 
There are some seriously sick fucks. Anya's sex slave days have been over for quite a long time now. This is intriguing, now that I think about it. Because Lazar kept her around, too. Why? And now my father wants her for himself. Why? What is so interesting about Anya Bokori that these two powerful men care where she is and who she's with? Why did Lazar keep her for so long, only to offer her up as a sacrifice at the fights? Why is Udolf here? He hasn't come out to the rock in more than a decade. Why now? Why this girl? He's walking down the steps towards the lower levels. He pauses at the training room. Not one bag. Two. But then he keeps going, clutching the dubious metal railing as he descends. Those expensive shoes of his are worse than being barefoot on the slick, algae-covered metal steps. So he holds on tight. If the copter wasn't above us on the roof, I'd push him over the edge, jump in after him, cut his throat, and wait for the sharks. Then I'd watch. I'd watch until they ate every last bit of him. Take a deep breath, Court. You're almost there. You are two days into your final sentence on the rock, then you have one more round of training and you're out. Obligations fulfilled. Free. I barely understand the meaning of the word. But Rainer, Mart, and Everett are part of the deal, and we'll figure it out. That's all I know. Once we're fucking free, we'll figure out how to deal with it. Udolf stops at the landing and looks down the steps. Anya is waiting at the gate, clutching the chain link tightly, and for a moment her face has the look of hope on it. But she must recognize my father's expression and come to a sobering realization, because that look of hope turns into despair. Udolf just stares at her. I can't see his face because I'm behind him, but this is abnormal behavior. What is it about this girl? Udolf turns abruptly. Open the gate. I'm taking her with me. I glance down at Anya and watch her panic in real time. My head shakes out a no, and then my fingers tell him to fuck himself. He's so lucky. So lucky he and I have never been somewhere alone together. His mercs didn't follow him down here, but they're on that helicopter. My father goes nowhere without his bodyguards, and he certainly doesn't take meetings with me without them. Court, he sounds tired as he turns to face me. Just open the gate. It's not going to happen. I point to my chest with one hand and sign the word for mine with the other. Then I jog back up the stairs to finish this conversation in private. None of them are yours, he calls after me. They are all mine. That's mostly true. He's taken every single woman I've won in these fights. Oh, he wants me to fuck them. I always have to fuck them. Because he wants them pregnant with my seed inside their bellies so he can breed more little fighters just like me. But this wasn't just any win. This wasn't just another fight. It was my last fight. My last prize. I exit the stairwell on the training level and walk to the middle of the room. By the time I turn, Udolf is just reaching the landing. I sign to him. She's mine. He doesn't follow me onto the mat. You really want to fight this battle? I nod. Why? Why do you? I sign. Because what's yours is mine. You paid for three extra people. Court, not four. She's not going with you. You know this. And you're not getting off this rig for months. You still owe me that. He's stalling. I can tell. But why? She's mine. This is the hill you will die on. I scoff. <laughs> Try it. He huffs a laugh. His eyes dart upwards, towards the top level where the helicopter waits. You would lose. I might. I might not. But one thing's for sure. I would take him out with me. He runs his fingers through his hair and I know I've won. He only does that when he's internally negotiating. Tell me why. If you tell me why, then I'll leave her here. But I will collect her at base camp when you return. I narrow my eyes at him. 
Did he give in too quickly? Did he not bring enough backup to fight this war with me today? Or do I just scare him? I would like for it to be the last one, but I don't know. I try hard to scare people. That's why I do the things I do during the fights. Fear is everything in our world. But I am not so full of myself to believe that Udolf is really afraid of me. He's never been afraid of me, even when he should have been. If he were afraid of me, those mercs would be down here with him. They would have automatic weapons trained on my chest. Udolf laughs. <laughs> this is a problem for you. Is it a secret, Sigharth? Fuck you. I think it, but I don't sign it. He's gotten more silent words out of me today than he deserves. And I just want him gone. So I tell him what he expects to hear. I want to fuck her. Udolf laughs. Since when? Twenty-eight more days, I sign. Oh, until Mart comes. He draws in a deep breath as he considers my answer. Does he believe me? Maybe. He thinks Mart and I are lovers. We're not. We fuck. But I fuck a lot of people. He's no one special. Not in that regard, anyway. We're friends. Best friends. I love him. But more importantly, I like him. And he's had my back since I was nine. He's the only reason why I'm still fighting. I have been in 35 Ring of Fire fights. But the prizes were small at first. Extra protein for a year. New training equipment. Hot baths. Girls. Not the girls I won in the fights. Girls for camp. And boys, too. Also for camp. In fact, I already won Mart, Rainer, and Everett in fights before this. But that wasn't their freedom. It was just the right to bring them to camp. But I fought for Mart again three years ago. His freedom is guaranteed as long as I win mine. Rainer came next, then Everett, and now me. Once I serve this last sentence and do the final training, we're free. It's so fucking close I can taste it. And Udolf knows this. So now he's asking himself, why? Why would Court risk all that over this girl? I don't know yet. I just know she's worth something. Something more than I've paid for her, that's for sure. But if this man, this pseudo-father... This master of mine wants to believe that I want Anya to ease my craving for Mart as I serve my last sentence. Then fuck it. What do I care? Yes, I sign. I earned this. His mouth lifts up on one side at amusements. Then he takes one last look down the stairwell where Anya is surely waiting at the gate. She knows things. Lots of things. Or maybe just one thing. Something very important. That's why Lazar wanted her dead, but not just any kind of dead. He wanted to get something for her before he let her go. But what? The ship? That can't be it. That ship is worth billions. No human on this earth is worth billions. Not even Udolf is as valuable as that ship. Even if that's true, why did Lazar let her live this long? Why didn't he kill her after he kicked her out of his bed? Slave girls in our world rarely make it past age eleven. Twelve-year-old girls are practically unheard of. They use them up and throw them away. And by throw them away, I mean they kill them. They do the same with the boys. Even at the gym, even at camp, we are disposable. We fight, and we either win and live or lose and die. That's how our world works. I walk back over to him and pause, waiting for him to make a decision. You didn't earn her, Court. Udolf and I have the same steel-gray eyes. I've always hated that about him. Because people really think he's my father. I don't know if he is. I don't know who my real father was. I don't think I ever knew that. All I have left of the time before Udolf is the Lectra dream. But I find myself praying at night sometimes, praying that Udolf is not my father. Because if he is, 
He's so much worse than even I understand. But those eyes... Fine. Keep her until you get back to base camp. Then... He lets out a breath. Then I will pay you one last visit and I will collect her. But... He points a finger in my face. I need her alive. Do you understand me? I'll wait you out and give you this gift. You have been a good boy. He places his hand alongside my cheek and a shudder of revulsion shoots through my body. Udolf mistakes it for something else. He pats my cheek and continues. But she had better come back to me alive, Court. Do you understand me? I brush his hand away and lift my chin up in response. It's a yes, but not a nod. He didn't earn a nod. He didn't earn any of this today. He's taking from me right now. He doesn't belong here. Calm down, he says, tugging on his shirt collar as he looks off to his right, where half a dozen albatrosses are gliding in circles barely ten feet away. I'm going. I hate those fucking birds. And then he starts climbing the steps. All of this bothers me. He can read my mind these days. Like it or not, Udolf van Houten knows me intimately. I follow him up and stand on the platform with my arms crossed, flanked by my giant white guardians as Udolf's helicopter lifts off. I stay that way until it's long out of sight. Then I walk back down the steps to get Anya. She's waiting for me at the gate, her blue eyes locked with mine, filled with questions she will never ask. Why? Why don't you talk? If it were something as simple as she saw too much, she'd be dead. That's not it. That can't be it. It's something else, and I need to know what that something else is. I need her secret. I open the gate and wave her forward. Then I follow her up to the training level. She pauses there, waiting for instructions. And I'm not being mean when I think this. But Anya Bokori is weak. So fucking weak. She cannot be something special. She simply doesn't have it in her. I have locked eight-year-old boys on the lowest level of this rig, barely ten feet above an angry ocean, for days at a time, just for being little dicks. They got one cup of water a day, if they were lucky. And they didn't cave. They didn't cry. They didn't beg. They didn't give up. Anya had to skip a little rope and miss a meal and she throws a tantrum. I should just let him take her. She's going to be trouble. And I don't want to fuck her. I don't need her here to ease my loneliness, because I don't even understand the meaning of that word. I like it here. I fucking love it here. I hate it when I have to share this place with others. I point to the bag. She doesn't balk at all, just walks over to it and starts punching it like a stupid girl. No, that's not even true. I have eight girls at my camp who punch like girls, and half of them can knock out a full-grown man. Anya's punches are weak. And yet she's here, Court. Why? None of this was in the plan. You were allowed to fuck her, you were allowed to tattoo her, and that's all you were allowed to do but you brought her with you, over everyone's objections. Why? I don't know. I really don't. Anya whines, and when I look over at her, she's cradling her hand. Her knuckles have split open, and they are stained with blood. Fucking great. I walk over, grab her arm, and tug her into the little building, then lead her into the clinic. I point to a stool in the kitchen, and she sits. Then I hunt down a roll of wrap, a mostly used tube of antibacterial ointment, a bowl of hot water, and a clean rag. I place it all on the counter, grab another stool from the other room, slide it over to her, and then start washing the blood off. I'm about halfway done wrapping her second hand when I feel a soft tap on my shoulder. I look up, surprised. She motions with her hand. It's not a sign. She's making shit up but I've gotten good at interpreting made-up hand signals. She's asking me why. 
By what? I sign back, and even my signs are irritated, because she draws back at their quick sharpness. She points up. I point to her. You tell me. She sighs, then lowers her eyes and doesn't look at me again until I'm done with her hands. But when I get up and put the wrap stuff away, I find myself smiling. She talked to me. She didn't use her voice, and those weren't really words. But she talked to me. Me. Chapter 11 Anya His care in tending to my wounded knuckles doesn't continue back out on the training floor. I don't know this man very well, but here's something I've picked up on. Sickheart is a control freak. Also, he likes a tight schedule. In other words, he's not very flexible. His world revolves around things he can predict. I continue fighting with the heavy bag as I ponder this. It's not surprising. The world he lives in can't be much different than mine. I mean, he's got a lot more than I ever did. And he could do a lot worse than this abandoned oil rick as far as time out spaces goes. When Lazar was unhappy with me, back when he cared about such things, he would leave me in a dark, windowless room until I was so weak from hunger and thirst, he had to either let me die or bring me back. But this place... I pause my punching and stare out across the ocean. It's peaceful today. No wind, either, which makes the endless, flat, blue surface of the water appear deceptively innocent. Of course, under the smooth water, there is a whole world of natural law of violence. But this rig, it's not fancy, but it has food and water, and it's safe, as long as Udolf stays away. And I don't know what court promised him to make him leave, but he didn't stay long. I got the feeling that there is no love lost between the two of them. I could get used to life on this rig. A hand slaps the bag in front of me, pulling me out of my introspection. And when I jerk my gaze to Court's face, I realize he's telling me, without words, that we are not done here, and I need to keep going. I sigh, but continue punching and kicking the bag. I expect Court to go back to his training, but he lingers, watching me. Then his hand reaches out, just as I'm about to hit the bag again, and he grabs my fist. Blood is seeping through the wrapping over my knuckles. Court frowns at it, like I've just disappointed him. Then he sucks in a deep breath and slowly exhales as he points to the center of the platform. I follow him across the mats, and then he turns to face me. He does a couple of punches, moving his feet, and then he pauses and points to me. I scoff and shake my head, not because I'm trying to be difficult, but there is just no way I can imitate what he just did. His movements are fluid, like a dancer. Even if I had known that there was a pop quiz coming, I would not be able to do what he's asking. It's all blurry. I need a slow motion step by step. He sighs again, maybe frustrated, maybe tired, or maybe he's thinking, why didn't I just let my father take her away earlier? That gets me moving. I don't want to be here, but I don't want to be sent to his father. That man is scarier than Lazar. So I make an attempt, punching the air with my fist and hopping a little with my feet. His laugh is loud and immediate, and when I look over my shoulder at him, he's scowling and shaking his head at me. I drop my fists and frown back. It's not my fault he's asking me to do things I can't. He demonstrates again, but it's still too fast, and while I can see that he's punching with his left hand and taking a step forward, and this seems like a very simple thing, when I try it, none of it works. My punch is late, my feet are in the wrong place, and I actually lose my balance, and his grip on my upper arm is the only reason I don't fall over. 
He shows me again, this time breaking the movement into six unique parts. He holds up a single finger. One. Got it. He does it and points at me, but when I try it, it's not good. He stops and shows me again, and this time I break this move down into three parts. A baby step forward, a punch, and a bounce back. I say that over in my mind as I try, and when I look up at court, he's smiling. I suck in a deep breath of air and turn my head away so he can't see me smile back. I do that again and again. Baby step forward, punch, step back. And he corrects me each time, adjusting my hips or my chin or my fist. Then he moves on to the second move. This time it's a step back with a punch using the opposite hand, like I'm retreating from an approaching opponent. This one takes me longer because the opposite arm and leg are doing different things. I don't get it down all the way, but Court must get bored because we move on to number three. This one is mostly just pivoting my hips while throwing a cross punch. I don't have to take any steps forward or backward while I punch, so it's easier. Or so I think. Because suddenly Court is behind me, once again pressing his chest into my back. And when his hands grip my hips, a chill runs through my body at his touch. He directs me to punch and moves my hips, keeping them within some predetermined parameter. One hand remains on my left hip as his fingertips trace down the length of my right arm. He wraps his hand around my fist, and then he does the move for me, his body becoming my body, his hips moving my hips his hand throwing my punch. I get lost in this, my mind unable to process the intimacy of it. And it's dumb. I get it. He's not coming on to me. We're not dancing. This isn't emotion. He's teaching me how to fight. When he backs away, I suck in a deep breath and force myself to continue the move without him, even though he's wiped my mind of everything but his missing touch. I do this move over and over as he watches. Then he points at me, one finger, and he does the baby step move. I follow along and do it as well. Then he flashes three fingers at me, which is the hip pivot cross punch, so I do that. And when he flashes two, I'm ready to take that step back. He claps. It's a slow clap when you see in movies when people are being mocked. But I don't care because he's smiling at me. His eyes are bright and I really think I've made him happy. He has taught me something. It's a pretty useless thing if you ask me. It's not like I can use any of this to protect myself. It's not like I can say, hold on, hold on, let me get my hips in the right position before I hit you with my weak, girly cross punch. He flashes his fingers. One, two, three. And I do them. Baby step, punch, retreat, punch, hip, pivot, cross. He claps again, then holds up four fingers. Moving on, I guess. This time, it's a baby step advance with a one-two punch, and number five is a baby step back with a one-two. I suck at those, but he doesn't stop to make me practice, just ends the sequence with number six, a mid-air foot switch. Yeah, I can't get that one. But again, he doesn't care just goes all the way back to number one and makes me practice those moves, holding up fingers so I can't get a pattern going. And if someone had asked me last week if I would enjoy learning how to box, I would have laughed out loud at the absurdity of their question. But today I find it... fun. Maybe it's because after about an hour, I can do these three simple moves on command and I start envisioning myself actually using them in a situation. But more than likely, 
its court. Even though I've been acting like a spoiled brat for two days, he's actually pretty patient when he's in teacher mode. And he smiles a lot. So far, the court I've come to know is a broody, scowling jerk. So this is a new side to him. Perhaps even a real side to him. He rolls his hand at me to keep going, then turns his back and walks over to the door that leads inside, disappearing without any more explanation. I do keep going, even though the Anya of last week would have taken this opportunity to slack off because there is no one around to make me work, I suddenly decide I don't want to be that Anya anymore. Before the fight with Court, that was the only girl I knew. There was no other life for me. There was no future for me. Not a good one, anyway. Not one that involved being alone with a brand new version of Sick Heart on an abandoned oil rig where I have his complete and captive attention. He doesn't seem interested in having sex with me. And even though he did lock me down on the lower level after my tantrum and left me there for almost two days, he didn't beat me to drive his dominance home once I surrendered. And this leads me to believe that sick heart here has, well, a heart. Or at least a very well-developed sense of fairness. I wonder what his life has been like. Did he start out in one of the camps? I don't remember the Ring of Fire article saying anything about his early years. But he's been fighting since he was a very small boy, so I bet he did live at the camps. That's better, I think, because if he had been a house boy... I let that thought trail off because I don't want to imagine strong, commanding Court Van Breda as someone's beaten, helpless houseboy. Especially Udolf's. Court grips my arm and pulls me out of my introspection. He's shaking his head at me, signing things. You know, the most important thing I've learned about being silent is this. Most of the time, you don't need words to understand people. Like right now, for instance. Because he's telling me that I wasn't concentrating and my moves are sloppy. He looks a little frustrated again. Like maybe he's thinking I'm a waste of time. I might not have understood every word that transpired between Court and his father, but I heard enough. The rest I can deduce. Court's ownership of me is dubious at best. Udolf didn't retreat. His absence is only temporary. I don't belong to the sick heart. I belong to Udolf. This makes me shudder as my skin prickles up with the thought of what will happen to me when my time out here on this rig is over. I can think of a few possibilities. None of them are good. I think I was supposed to die at the end of the fight between Court and Pavo. And I lived instead. That's not good either. When the men in my world make a plan for someone... They make it with a goal in mind. So if I was supposed to die and didn't, then I messed up someone's plan. And I will pay for that sooner or later. Court points to the stairs, and for a moment I think he's going to take me back down to the prison level. But he points up, and when he moves toward the stairwell, still holding my arm, I follow willingly. I want to eat, but the kitchen is on the training level. But the hose is on the top level, and I can barely stand the stench wafting off me. So a shower, even a harsh one that stings my skin, is worth the wait for dinner. When we reach the top, he leads me around the birds and past the old mechanical building to the fire hose. But he stops and frowns at me, then points to the cistern mounted on the roof. He's tall enough so that when he reaches up, he can tap the water line clearly visible through the semi-opaque white tank. 
Well, shit. I frown. There's not enough water for a hose down, I guess. I don't know how long we'll have to be here, but it must be a while because the cistern is huge, and I would guess that there are a couple hundred gallons left. There are six of them, actually, but the rest are already empty. Still, a couple hundred is a lot if you're just drinking it. But that bath the first night, that must have used up fifty or sixty. Plus, the hose down. There will be no more baths. And no more hoses, either, from the looks of it. I huff, irritated. Why did he bring me up here if we can't even wash? He shoots me a crooked grin, but I don't find it charming. I smell. Bad. And now that I know I can't get clean, I'm noticing the pain in my stomach from not eating. I frown deeper. Court tugs me over to the wall and then points up to a shower head. My mouth makes a little, oh, and then I smile. When I look at him, he's, what? What is that look? Smugness? He's definitely feeling smug. But his hands are flashing at me, so I watch carefully, trying to understand what he's telling me. I think he's saying it needs to be quick. That makes sense. He keeps pointing to the shower head, then him, then me. He holds up one finger, then two. Meaning, I'm not supposed to be here. I am eating his food and drinking his water, and if we're not careful, we're going to run out of both. I nod, understanding. Then I wave him towards the shower in a be my guest gesture. It's his water, not mine. But to my surprise, he leads me over to the shower with him. Then he pretends to take off an invisible shirt and points to mine. Oh, I see. I don't even bother fighting this. I take the shirt off. Because this is not my shirt. These are not my shorts. This is not my water. That is not my food. And let's face it. This is not even my body. For every moment of my life, someone has owned me. At some point, these men, these monsters who run my world, were given dominion over me, over all of us. We have no rights. Not even girls like me, girls who lived under a king's roof who ate a king's food, who drank a king's water and wore a king's clothes. We are nothing and no one. We are disposable. I came to terms with that reality a long time ago. I am not a girl. I am not a woman. I am not even human to them. I am nothing to them. But that's not all there is of me. There is one piece left. One sacred piece of me that they can't have. No matter how hard they try, they cannot take my silence. She is all I have left. The spirit of me inside my head. The one who can't talk or walk or do anything but go along for the ride. So when I take the shirt off, I immediately go for the shorts, and then, moments later, I am naked. When I look up to meet Court's gaze, I find him once again frowning. I sigh and look down at my feet. He takes my hand again, but instead of leading me over to the shower, he just holds it for a moment. A long enough moment to make me look up and see what the hell he's doing. His eyes are locked with mine. He does not look down at my body. And then he flashes his fingers at me with deliberate intent, his pointer and middle fingers snapping down onto the pad of his thumb. No. That's what his fingers say. No. He signs it again. 
and his eyes are angry now. I don't know what he wants from me, so I just shrug and resume looking at my feet. He stands there for another long moment. Then he sighs. We seem to do a lot of sighing. Are we frustrated or tired or giving up? I don't know. Maybe for me, it's all three. Chapter 12 Court I have seen monsters in my day. Hell, I've become one. I fight the king's fights. I kill the king's enemies. I accept the king's prize, and I live under the king's rules. I do the king's bidding. It's a bad lot in life, no doubt, but it's nothing compared to what some do for the king, and I'm starting to get the feeling that Anya was one of the some. She has done things, and she will never forget them. It would be easy to assume Anya is one of the strong ones. She has made it longer than any other slave in her king's house. What is she? Seventeen? Eighteen? She might even be as old as twenty. That's an amazing accomplishment for a sex slave. She is not a whore. There is a very definite difference in these two things in the world of kings. Sex slaves are children and whores are women. She might be turned into one, if Udolf has his way. Pimped out to other kings. A prize, perhaps. For some favor. She might even make it to a breeder. She has a nice face. A perfect, athletic body. And she's smart enough to keep her mouth shut. But that's not really Udolf's style. He doesn't like to put his trophies on the shelf. He does not admire them. He uses them. He will use her. Any way he feels fit. I slip my shorts down my legs, turn towards the shower, and put Anya out of my mind. She is not your problem, Court. You have your circle. You fought hard for them. They have fought hard for you. You drew a line. You made your choice. And now you are weeks away from freedom. Mere weeks. After twenty-seven years, you will finally, finally have your own life and I refuse to feel guilty about the ones I'm leaving behind. I am no one's savior. I am no one's hope. And maybe Anya did help me that night on the ship, but I fought for her too. She is alive because of me. She is here, out of Udolf's hands, because of me. But she saved you too, Court, and she might have a secret you can use. No, I'm not getting caught up in her. I'm done with this shit. I turn the water on, then I push her underneath it and step in next to her, wetting myself down, but just enough to coat our bodies with the water. Then I turn it off again, take her hand, squirt some shampoo into her palm, and then do the same for me. We wash ourselves in silence, me gazing one way, her the other, pretending the other doesn't exist. I grab the dried-out bar of soap I brought up here last night and rub it over my skin. The scent reminds me of a hospital, which makes no sense, because I've never been to a real hospital. Every medical procedure I've ever had was done by Mart. This makes me smile. I flip the water back on to rinse, but also to hide the smile. Mart. He's not a doctor, but he has saved my ass more times than I can count. Saving him back is the least I can do. And Rayner has had my back in more underground training centers than I can count. You don't start out fighting in the Ring of Fire. There are no cheering fans in the early days. You are dropped off at the event, and if you win, you're picked up when it's over. And trust me when I say this, when you're in a third world country, fighting a local rising star, the natives aren't very happy when their ticket out dies. I owe Rayner. Everett never did anything for me but bring me a bottle of Lectra and then judge my bad behavior the next day. I actually chuckle at that, then remember that Anya is behind me. I step out of the water and point for her to take my place. She is not looking at me, so I push her underneath the water. 
I'm done, so I walk over to the pack I brought up and take out two towels. It's still hot out tonight, but the sun is low on the horizon and the unbearable stuffiness has subsided until morning. By the time I'm dry and dressed in a clean pair of shorts, Anya is done. I shut the water off, throw her a towel, then point to the pack and walk away. I don't want to think about her. She is not my problem. Hell, she's damn lucky I talked Udolf out of taking her today. That will have consequences at some point. So the way I see it, she owes me. And I fully plan on getting her secrets before Udolf comes back. All of them. In the kitchen, I start the rice in the cooker and then lean against the counter, wishing I had started cooking before washing up so I didn't have to wait for it. To waste time, I go out onto the training floor, kind of looking for Anya, but not finding her. So she didn't follow me down here. She probably senses my uneasiness and wants to stay as far away from me as she can. That's how I'd be feeling if I were her. And wasn't I her once upon a time? Didn't I walk around like that, afraid of everything? Every too loud noise, every strange face in a crowd where all others were known, every hushed whisper of my name in the night, my call to duty. I shudder with the thought of it. No, not the thought of it, the memory of it. I don't like thinking back on it, and I think this is why I don't like this girl. She's pretty enough to look at, but I learned early, very early, that beauty is deception. If there is one thing you do not want to be in this world we live in, it's beautiful. If you're beautiful, they notice you. It's never good to be noticed in this world we live in. I turn to the empty wall of the small building housing the kitchen, the clinic, and the toilets, and in that moment I wish they were all here with me. Because if Mart and Rainer and Everd and the others were here, this last punishment would be over. And even though I like it out here, I really do. I don't want to be here with this girl. She bothers me. There is something about her that is very, very wrong. And I can't put my finger on it. I don't want to put my finger on it. But at the same time, I want those secrets she hides behind her silence. I know I earned my freedom, and Udolf admitted that I paid for myself and three people, Mart, Rainer, and Everd, just not four. Not Anya. So he's not backing out. But still, I have no guarantees and nothing to hold over him if he changes his mind. If he should find some unpaid bill some debt on my balance sheet. Knowing Anya's secret would go a long way in guaranteeing that in four months this whole life I've lived will be nothing but the remnant of a nightmare. When the rice is done, I drop in the freeze-dried protein, stir it up, and then split the ration in half with a sigh. I'm losing weight. It shouldn't matter. There are no more fights in my future and plenty of feasts coming up, but just the idea of losing muscle mass triggers a panic inside me that isn't easily tamed. The rock gets stocked with food once a year, when the training camp begins. We bring as much as we can, and then we ration it to make it last. But I always come out here by myself at least once at Udolf's command. So when we leave camp, there needs to be just enough to get me through until the supply ship comes again. Anya wasn't supposed to be here. There is just not enough food for both of us. But whatever. It can't be helped. I'm not going to let her starve. I take the two bowls, climb the stairs up to the top platform, and find her sitting on the edge, feet dangling over. There's a low, steel beam railing that lines that side of the helipad with just enough room to slip your legs underneath and dangle them off the edge. And it's funny that she chose that spot, because that's where I like to eat, too. The steel beam is wide enough to be a table. And when the kids are out here, they will all fight for a spot at the beam when it's chow time. I smile at that, then push the thought aside. They're not my problem either. They're all just like Anya. Lucky as fuck that they ended up with me and not someone like Pavel. 
I slide my legs under the beam about two feet away from Anya, then push the second bowl of chicken and rice in front of her. She doesn't look at me, but she starts scooping the meal up to her mouth with her fingers. We have forks, but I didn't bring them on purpose. Life on the rock is that of a heathen, and Anya Bokori is just going to have to get used to it. We eat in silence, but the meal is so meager it's over in a matter of minutes. I think I am hungrier when I'm done than I was when I started. I think Anya is too because she looks down at her bowl with longing. I sigh, loudly, because it would be nice if she could see this for what it is. Kindness. There is enough food here to last one person exactly twenty-five more days. She's lucky I give her anything. She gets to her feet, not saying anything, of course, and then picks up my empty bowl and walks off. After a few minutes I get up and follow her because she probably won't think about bringing the sleeping mats up. But when I get to the stairwell she is already on her way up, mats in hand. I smile at that. She doesn't smile back, just hands me a mat and then follows me back up to the helipad. The birds are back. The gulls are loud on the platform below us, but the albatrosses are here on top, dropping off the last meal of the day for the chicks, who are several months old and as big as medium-sized dogs. Some of them, the ones without chicks this year, follow me across the platform. They don't beg much if it's just me out here. It's like they know. I don't have any food to spare. In fact, they will often drop slimy little fish at my feet like I'm their chick and they're in charge of my well-being. Anya lays her mat down in a spot near the center of the platform, but I walk over and pick it up before she sits down, pointing to a spot as far away from the nests as we can get. Again, if the kids are here, the albatross know their limits. They are outnumbered and a couple dozen brats under the age of twelve is nothing but annoying. But if it's just me, or just me and Anya, that's a temptation they can rarely resist. They aren't mean, not to me anyway, but they are pests, and once they get a little attention, they want more, so it's best to stay out of their way. She doesn't motion or make any move to contradict my change of location decision, just plops down on top of her mat and pulls her knees up to her chest with a sigh. I sit down too, then lie back, tired, not exhausted. You can barely call what I did today training, but tired in another way. Weary, I guess. And Udolf's visit has left behind a bad taste, a lingering sense of doubt that I would prefer not to think about. Usually when I'm out here alone, I will cheat. I talk to the birds and the moon and the sea. I talk a lot, actually. It's only when others are here with me that I keep the vow of silence I came up with that first time. And maybe, if Anya had been chatty, we'd have spent these weeks together getting to know each other. I probably would have cheated with her here, telling myself she doesn't count since she's not one of us. But she's not chatty. And now, after a few days of thinking about it, talking to her feels like submission. And isn't it? I imagine she had everyone in her king's house under her spell of silence. That little sister of hers probably talked for Anya the way Mart talks for me when I'm in silent mode. And don't I do it for dominance? So yeah, fuck Anya. I'm not talking to her. I point up at the sliver of moon out of habit, my arm straight out, my finger in extension. It is three days past noon. I shut one eye, still pointing like the moon is a target at the end of a rifle. This is a nightly ritual, even when the kids aren't here. And then Anya lies back on her mat and points her finger at the moon, too. This pisses me off, because she doesn't know why she's pointing at it. This is not her ritual. It's ours. I drop my arm, sigh, and turn my back to her. Why did I bring her here again? I'm having trouble remembering. Probably because I was high on the Lectra. Oh. Oh. I chuckle a little under my breath, 
because I get a flash of Rainer between Anya's legs that night, and her lying on top of Mart. And, yeah, that's why I brought her. Fucking her again, though? That feels like a really bad idea. She taps my shoulder and I turn over to find her sitting up, pointing at the moon. What? I sign. She points again and I realize she's asking for a sign. I make a little C with my thumb and forefinger, put it up to my eye, then gesture towards the moon. My sign devolves into a point, because that's how we do it here. But that's just a personal embellishment. Anya mimics my motions, then lets out a long breath. Life would be so much easier if she would just talk. Then I could cheat and ask her all the questions. I could maybe even seduce her into giving up all the answers. But no, this one has to be special. Silent. Frustrating. But then I realized she did it again. She communicated with me. Asked me a question. So maybe I can ask her one back. I take her hand and she pulls back instinctively, a look of shocked panic on her face. I put up a hand. Sorry, that gesture says. Didn't mean to startle you. Then I take her hand again and form her fingers into the sign for A. A fist, but not a punching fist like I showed her earlier today. Then I make the sign for N. Y. And another A. I point to her. That's you, I sign. She nods, getting it. And then she does it back for me. Only, and I laugh, she does it with my hand, the way I did it with hers. Then she points to me. I shake my head, still smiling as I point to her. That's you. She smiles too, lies back down, stares up at the moon and makes the sign. Then she puts her fist up to her heart and signs her name. When she looks at me, I find her very serious. She reaches for my hand again and puts it over my heart and points to it. Sick heart. I don't know how I know that's the name she wants to learn. I just do. She's not asking about court. She's asking about sick heart. I sign it. Not spelled out like names usually are but two words. Sick. Heart. That's how they say my name out loud, too. Two words. Sick. Heart. She frowns and makes a heart with her fingers in the air. I shake my head and show her again, because that's not it. That's the other kind of heart. A romantic heart. Follow your heart. Hearts and flowers. The heart in my name is the organ, the thing that beats, the thing that breaks, the sick thing inside me that has kept me alive all these years. But how to explain that to someone who can't sign? I point to my head, my brain. I make the sign for it. Then I point to my foot, make the sign for foot, then do the heart sign again. Her mouth makes a little O shape, like she understands. But she doesn't. I mean, sure, she gets it, I guess. But she doesn't understand why I use that clinical sign for my name and not the romantic version. She can't understand that because I don't even get it. It wasn't something I decided. That name was given to me along with the knowledge of how to sign in the first place. I just don't remember any of it. I don't remember learning ASL. It's just something I've always known. And that only makes sense in one way. Those early memories are so terrible, I've blocked them out. And that's bad, because I can remember plenty of horrible things in my early years. Yet I don't know how I got my name. I do know my name is not really Court. That was the name Udolf gave me. Just a throwaway name when he finally gave in and sent me to the training camp for good. Up until then, he called me Sicko. Just thinking that name sends a chill up my spine. How did he know? I mean, how did he figure out the sick part? 
Did he... What? Look that sign up online and then turn it into... an endearment? Sicko. I shake my head, then notice that Anya is moving her hands around, her fingers gesturing and making signs that aren't signs. At first I want to correct her, tell her, no, that's not right, that's not how it's done, you don't know what you're talking about. But I stop myself and just watch her. I watch her talk without words. She can talk though, right? I lean over and she stops, suddenly, when I enter her personal space. She holds absolutely still as I touch her lips with two of my fingers. Then I kiss her, opening my mouth to give her some tongue. And yeah, her tongue is there, responding and pressing against mine. I knew this. I vaguely remember checking her that night of the fight. But I needed to be sure. Because if she can talk, and she wants to tell me something, why not just do it? No one is here. No one is going to know. She won't be punished if that's what she's afraid of. So why keep this charade up? I pull back from the kiss and look into her eyes. They are dark in the moonlight, but still vaguely blue. Why? I ask. And she is smart because she throws that sign right back at me. Why? Why me? Why don't you talk? It's an easy explanation, and I'm sure I could get her to understand if I put a little effort into it. Talking to her, here, in this place, would be cheating. This is just a rule I live by on the rock. It gives me direction. It gives this place meaning, and gives this training definition. And all my kids need that. Just like I needed it. Just like Anya, apparently, needs it too. And sure, maybe I would have cheated if she talked. But she doesn't. And I didn't. And I won't. Not now. I've made up my mind, and once I make a decision about something, it's done. I don't have the luxury of second chances and regrets. My life is all about instincts. All about moving without thinking. All about predicting what my enemy will do before they do it. And then meeting them there, halfway, before they know what's happening. But this feels like an explanation Anya hasn't earned. So I just turn over and say nothing. A few seconds later, I feel her fingertips on my back. I look over my shoulder, scowling now, then sign. Leave me alone. I'm tired of her. I'm tired of this day, and Udolf's visit this morning is finally sinking in. He's up to something. He won, right? He got to keep controlling interest in his precious ship. He got my prize money. Why does he give a fuck about Anya Bokori? What made him get on that helicopter and fly out here after three days? He's never done that before. It's been more years than I can count since he set foot on this rig. At least a dozen, but maybe even more. And damn, I don't normally allow myself to wish for things I don't have while I'm on the rock. It's just pointless. But I'd give anything for a sat phone right now. Not that Mard or Rainer would know anything about what Udolf is doing, but I could set them on a mission to find out. Anya pokes me again. I sign. What? and make a scowling face so she knows I'm pissed. Her hands make a gesture that is actually a word, but I'm pretty sure she's not saying pie. Still, her middle finger is slipping across her palm, and I can't help myself. I sit up to try to figure it out. Then she does the sign for moon again, pointing to it. Calendar? I ask. She throws her arms wide, frustrated, and I'm thinking... Yeah, me too, babe, me too. Then I get it. How long? She sighs and nods. How long will we be here? I lie back and point to the moon, then hold up three fingers. It's not what she's looking for. This is the number of days we've been here, not how many we have left. But that's one of the rules, too. Never think about how much time you have left in hell. 
Only congratulate yourself for time served. Chapter 13 Anya I think about four things after he turns his back to me for the final time. One, that kiss. Jesus, that kiss. I'm pretty sure he didn't enjoy it the way I did, because I have a sneaking suspicion he was checking for my tongue again. And that means he's probably irritated with me for the silence. But it was so unexpected and so, well, nice, that the feeling of his mouth on mine lingers long into the night. Two, his name. There is something about the heart part, but I don't know what it is. I drew in the air, and that made some kind of sense to him because he went into that anatomy explanation. But I'm not sure if he just thinks I'm too stupid to understand that was the sign for heart, or if there was a much bigger, more involved explanation to it. Three, he's not very patient. I mean, he has signs of patience at times, but that comes and goes in bursts. He was patient for a while down on the mat, but once he felt I had the moves down, he went back to his own business. And even though he showed me some signs tonight, the role of teacher tired him out pretty quickly. Four, he's frustrated that I'm not talking. Like, I'm a lot of effort and he's short on effort right now. Plus, I think that visit from Udolf means something bad. I'm not staying with Court after we leave here. That was pretty clear. And I'm not saying this bothers him, the part about me, anyway. But something about that is bothering him. So his frustration concerns me. Am I a liability? I don't want to be a liability. And he's clearly not interested in anything sexual. I suspect that sick heart here isn't into strangers. Maybe if his friends were here, he might think about another sexual encounter, but only because of them, not me. My stomach grumbles, and this is no ordinary grumble. I'm in a serious calorie deficit right now. I know all about this. It might have been years since they used starvation as a punishment, but when I first came to Lazar's estate, there was another girl there, several years older than me, but she knew the ropes and taught me much the same way I taught Bexy when she first came to live with us. Her name was Diana, and she was the one who showed me how to track the hunger pangs so I knew how much food I could go without. Not how much I needed to survive, but how much I could afford to give up. She was a rebellious girl who thrived in high-drama situations, so she was always looking for a way to beat Lazar and the older woman who controlled us on the day-to-day. -day. Diana disappeared shortly before I turned eight, and after that, I told myself, do not be like Diona. Just exist, Anya. Do what they tell you and live. Buck the system, and you'll end up like all the other girls who got too old to meet Lazar's sick, twisted desires. My stomach rumbles again, and it feels like I'm eating myself from the inside out. Technically, you can go a very long time without food, but you become too weak to do much after only a week. And I'm on the tail end of day three. Did I even eat that night of the fight? No, not that day either. I was too nervous. I need more food. But it's pretty clear that I wasn't supposed to come here with Court. And whatever food he has, it's only enough for him. He has to be as hungry as I am. He's much bigger. He's been training hard since we arrived and his food ration was as meager as my own. He's been splitting it equally. But he had that extra ration that I went without when I was locked on the lower level. He could, hell, if he was smart, he would, lock me down there again and keep my food ration for himself. He could also start feeding me every other day, 
or every third day. Feed me just enough to stay alive, but not much else. I do not like the pain of hunger. It's a gnawing, biting, burning feeling that hollows you out. I need to be nice to him. And I was trying tonight. I tried to get him more interested in me. He would prefer me to talk, even if he himself doesn't say a word. I'm in his world. I should bend to his rules. I should talk. I know this is the easiest way to stay safe, but I don't know what I would say. Or rather, I'm afraid I don't know what to say. I'm afraid that if I open my mouth and utter any words at all, they will be all the wrong ones. And I know what happens to girls who say the wrong things. And anyway, how do I know that court won't just tell everyone? I don't. And if Udolf figures out I talked to court, then he will expect me to talk to him as well. And once I talk to him, I'm positively sure everything will begin to unravel. I've been holding things together with my silence for a long time now. More than ten years. But everything seems to be changing at once, and this is a very dangerous thing. Deciding to talk now would be a fatal mistake. So no, I will not be talking to court. What I will do is be nice. I'll be pleasant, submissive, demure. Get him to see me as a sexual thing again. Take his mind off my limitations and play up my assets. This pacifies both my anxiety and my growing hunger pangs. And I settle into sleep with thoughts of that kiss because that's how I will take control of my future. The kiss was just the start. When I wake up in the morning, Court's mat has been picked up, and I am surrounded by curious birds. Mostly gulls pecking at my hair, like they might pull it out of my head and use it for their nests. But a few albatrosses linger in my vicinity. They are huge birds. So massive they look fake. When I stand up, their heads are well above my waist. And when I take a step forward to go down to the training level and find court, hopeful that we will have breakfast this morning, one of them extends its wings and flaps at me. That wingspan is so wide, I have to take seven steps to get safely around it. I take my mat down to the training level and find Court already jumping rope, his back to me as he does that fancy footwork, traveling down the length of the bare concrete. But when he turns to find me watching him, he stops abruptly and points to the building behind me. Is he pointing to the kitchen? Hope surges inside me. Did he make breakfast? My stomach growls so loud just thinking these thoughts. If he wasn't all the way across the platform, he would have heard it. That rumble comes with a dull, gnawing pain. But when I turn, I realize he was pointing to that small chalkboard mounted on the wall of the kitchen building. My name is still written in white chalk across the top, and underneath that, it says, Jump Rope. Underneath that, it says, Practice drills one, two, and three. Not one word about breakfast. Or lunch, as if. Or dinner. I sigh, then glance over my shoulder to see if Court is watching me. He's not. He's got his back to me, just jumping his way back down the platform. I don't know if I can do jump rope today. I don't know if I can do any of this today. I know it's only been four days since I last had a nice meal, but my stomach hurts. Bad. Rally, Anya, the survivor's voice inside my head says. 
Rally and do what you're told. That's how you get out of here intact. But then what? What happens to me when we leave this rig? Nothing good. That's the only thing I know. There is nothing good in my future. Stick to the plan, Anya. Make him see you as an asset, not a liability. I'm not sure it will work, but I don't have any other options. I haven't seen a boat around here, so it's not like I can escape. And even though I can see lights off in the distance at night, they are tens of miles away. There is no hope of swimming anywhere. I don't even know what country I'm in. Or if this rig is considered part of a country. Perhaps Udolf van Houten's oil rigs and giant ships are all their own country? I suddenly notice that the snick, snick, snick of Court's jump rope has stopped. And when I look up, he's watching me. I turn my back to him, pick up my jump rope, and start my day. Stomach burning and rumbling. Mind a little bit foggy. And my prospects? Well, they seem non-existent at the moment. I don't do anything fancy. I don't even try to do the single hop. I just can't seem to manage it this morning. I feel like my mind is swimming in the ocean down below. And then, without warning, I find myself on the ground, a sharp pain shooting through the back of my head. My vision goes blurry for a moment, and when I force my eyes open, Court is hovering over my face. He snaps his fingers in front of my eyes, and when I try to shut them, then he picks me up and carries me inside the little building, setting me down on a small bed in a dark room. I turn over, ready to fully appreciate this bed, but Court snaps his fingers again, and when I open my eyes, I see that there is blood on them. Shit. I reach up, touch the back of my head, realizing I actually hurt myself. I fainted from lack of food. Asshole. I scowl at him, point at him, accuse him. He sighs. His default answer with me, it seems. Then he gets up and walks across the hall, leaving this room dark. He flips on the kitchen light, and I catch a glimpse of him pulling out the rice maker. Oh, my smile is sweet. He's going to feed me. And all it took was a head injury. That's cynical, I know. And he deserves a little more credit than that, because I've fainted from lack of food before, and trust me when I say this, no one carried me to a bed and started making me food afterward. So I am grateful. He prepares more than rice, too. It only takes a few minutes for me to realize he's making fish. I'm sure it's some disgusting dried fish that has been on this rig for months or even years. But I don't care. I'll eat anything right now. He comes back, flipping on the light in my room, and then busying himself at a counter on the far wall. That's when I realize I'm in the clinic where he wrapped my hands yesterday. Court comes at me quickly, supplies in hand. He slips my feet off the bed and pulls me up to a sitting position, making me turn so he can see the gash on the back of my head. He sighs again. He's mad, I think. He's mad that he has to feed me. And even though I'm happy about this now, I know everything comes with a price. I will pay for this later. Some way, somehow, this extra meal will come back to haunt me. Court presses his hand on the top of my back, right between my shoulder blades, urging me to lean forward. Then he pours something over the wound. Peroxide from the smell of it. This bubbles against my scalp, and he's not very careful about any of it, so the foaming liquid spills down the side of my head and drips over my arm and onto the floor. He's certainly no Mart when it comes to bedside manner. I saw how Mart cared for Court after the fight. He was very concerned and careful. Court stops pouring, and then his fingers are probing the wound. 
and then he actually mutters, fucking hell, under his breath, and I turn my face up to him with a smile. He points at me, signs something at me with angry fingers. It's probably fuck you, and then pushes me down so I can't look at him. He takes my hand, places my fingers against a thick wad of gauze over the wound, and applies pressure. I hold it there as he walks over to the counter and starts banging drawers open and closed, looking for something. What does he need? When he turns around, he's holding a little white package and a hemostat. I side-eye him, asking him questions with my gaze, even though that is totally against all my rules. He signs something at me. Probably shut the fuck up, Anya, you're a giant pain in my ass today. And then tears open the little package and pulls out a needle attached to a suture. Oh, hell no. I stand up, forgetting about the gauze I'm holding and the pressure I'm supposed to be applying, and feel the blood drip down through my hair. He grabs my arm, shakes me, pushes me down to the floor on my knees, and then tells me to bend over the bed. He's going to sew that needle through the skin of my head. He pushes me, further making his point, and so I comply. He sits down on the bed next to me, then pushes my head into his lap. Hmm, I don't know what to think about that. It's not sexual, like, at all. But it could be. I snicker a little, and he pinches the inside of my arm, making me hiss, because that fucking hurt. When I look up at him, he's not messing around. There is no sly smile on his face. That was not a flirt. He's not amused or charmed by me in any way. He's all business. So when he points to his lap again, I bend my head down and rest my cheek against his thigh. He dabs the gauze, then, without any warning at all, he stabs me with that needle and begins sewing up my head. Everything about this is gross. The feeling of the needle, the smell of my own blood mixed with the cooking fish across the hall, and for a moment, I think I'm going to puke. Court stops, like he knows this is coming but he doesn't pull me up or hand me a bowl to hurl into. He leans down and growls at me, daring me to throw up on him. I stop breathing through my nose and swallow it down, keeping my eyes tightly closed as he continues to sew up my scalp. Finally, he ties it off, gets up, finds a pair of scissors, and cuts me loose. Literally. There is no, how are you, Anya? Hanging in there? Feel better now? No, none of that. He simply drops his equipment onto the counter and leaves, walking across the hall to mess with the food. I start wondering just how out of the ordinary this type of thing is for court. Cooking for someone. Taking care of someone. He doesn't seem like the type. I mean, isn't that why he has that entourage around him? This morning definitely feels like a mart job. I watch him get out a bowl, fill it with rice and the steamed fish, and then he pauses and looks down at it, staring at it for a little bit longer than should be normal. I furrow my brow, trying to read his mind. What is he thinking about? He doesn't want to give you this food, Anya. Isn't it obvious? There's not enough to go around. And if he gives you this extra, small, meager meal, it means one of us goes without food later. I want to be that tough girl. That one who says, you know what? I don't need that food. I can take care of myself. I have always wanted to be that girl. But I'm not that girl. And I am desperate for that bowl of rice and fish, so I'm not even going to pretend. Court turns and looks at me, then one final look at the bowl, and he sets it down on the counter. 
I sigh. He's not going to feed me after all. He's decided I'm not worth it. But then he grabs another bowl, scoops more rice into it, more fish, too. And then he gets two forks, grabs both bowls, and nods his head to me as he walks down the hallway. Not to the door that leads to the training room, but towards the back of the building where the tub room is. I get up, still slightly dizzy, my hair sticky with blood and a little bit foamy from the peroxide, and follow him. We end up in a large open room with couches and maybe a dozen small tables with chairs. Hmm, a dining room? Or a living room? Or something in between? There's a long shelf on one end filled with board games and puzzles. Monopoly, life, trouble, even a beaten up box of hungry, hungry hippos. There are books, too. Maybe a hundred of them. No War and Peace, no Moby Dick or Wuthering Heights. There are classic editions of Winnie the Pooh and Beatrix Potter, tattered paperbacks of Goosebumps and Babysitter's Club. I am so stunned at the change in scenery, so surprised at the comfy feeling that floods through me at the sight of this room, that I just stand there in the doorway looking around like a dumbass, forgetting all about the pain in my stomach and the newly stitched up wound on my head. Court bangs a fork on one of the tables, and when I look over at him with a start, he's pointing to the chair across from him. I walk over, unsure how to process what I'm seeing, what we're doing. What are we doing? I sit, and Court shoves one of the bowls at me, then slides the fork across the aged, varnished surface of the table. He starts eating immediately, eagerly shoveling the rice and fish into his mouth, and I realize he's just as hungry as I am. Well, of course he is, Anya. He's twice your size, and he's working out like a, well, like a fucking fighter. While you've been half-heartedly skipping some rope and throwing a few punches. I look around again, still trying to fit the pieces of this place together. What is this? Do they keep kids here? Did he grow up here? Are those his books? His games? Maybe, but the Babysitter's Club? That doesn't make sense. Bexy had those books on her shelf, and before they were hers, they were mine. The sudden appearance of Bexy in my thoughts makes me startle, and a gasp escapes past my lips. Bexy. Shit, I forgot all about her. I left her. I mean, I knew I was going to leave her, no matter what happened at the end of that fight. But I always thought I'd have time to say goodbye. The painful rumbling in my stomach fades the wound on my head forgotten. Bexy. I left her alone. And I didn't even give her a hug to let her know she was loved. Court taps the table with his fork again, but I don't look up at him. I'm suddenly very, very sad. And I don't know if it's all the new stuff I'm dealing with, or the hunger or the rough stitching of my head I just endured. But it all becomes a little overwhelming, and then the tears leak out of my eyes before I can stop them. It's not any of those things. It's Bexy. Because I am suddenly very, very, very sure that I will never see her bright, smiling face again. And that might be the most tragic thing to ever happen to me. Court sighs, clearly frustrated with me. When I look up, I see a blurry version of him through my tears. He slouched down in his chair, leaning back, his elbow propped on the chair arm, his fist under his chin. Like he's about ready to throw me over the side of this rig and make me take my chances in the ocean. And can I blame him? 
So far, he's had to wrap my bloody knuckles, stitch up my head, share his water and food with me, even though we don't have enough for one person, let alone two at this point. And now I'm sitting here, surrounded by his reluctant kindness, and all I can do is cry. Chapter 14 Court What the fuck? Like, literally, what the actual fuck is wrong with this girl? I seriously want to slap her. What is her problem now? I fed her. I stitched up her head. I brought her into the kid's room so she can eat at a fucking table and relax a little. And all she wants to do is cry? I don't get it. I mean, I get girls, okay? I have eight of them back at camp, and only one of them would even think about crying in front of me. And she's only four years old, so whatever. But Anya is a grown-ass woman. Grown women don't cry. Especially when I'm going out of my way to not only keep her alive, but keep her comfortable. She's not even eating that food. I'm about to take it from her, eat it myself. Fuck her. Does she have any idea how dearly we'll pay for this extra meal in two weeks? No, she doesn't. But she will. She's not going to like that day. At all. She is weak, and I don't know if I can take much more of this. I don't like weak people. I don't want to take care of her. I don't want to take care of anyone, actually. Maybe Everd. But only on certain occasions. And Anya Bokori is no Everd. She is no one to me. Just a way to piss off Udolf and hopefully get some secrets I can use later to fuck with him or Lazar if either of them ever forgets who they're dealing with. But she tires me out. Just thinking about all the stress that's coming and how she's adding to it pisses me off. I don't even feel like getting my ass up out of this chair to train. That's how weary she makes me. So I just sigh and stay where I am staring at her blotchy face as she wipes her cheeks and works her way through her silent breakdown. I understand some of it. I do. I've been through the same shit. I was a houseboy for a little while, so I get that part. It's all very traumatic. But she's old now. It's over. She's here. She's being fed and cared for. What more does she want from me? Why did I even bring her here in the first place? Why? I don't even like her. I mean, maybe I could like her. If she wasn't such a stupid girl. If she would just do what I tell her without comment. Her silence isn't really silence anyway. It's filled with all kinds of judgment and expectations. And who the fuck is she to judge me? Her eyes dart up to mine. She lets out a hitched breath, then reaches for her fork and begins to eat. She eats slowly and takes small bites. I know she has to be hungry. She did go two days without food. I refuse to feel bad about that. It was punishment for being a brat. I have a preschooler who is better behaved than Anya. All I wanted her to do was jump some fucking rope, just to keep busy so I could concentrate on myself. Why is she so dramatic? She doesn't look at me again, just continues to eat her food. And I should just get up and go out to the training mats. Just get on with my day and leave her here. But if she's not going to train today, and I don't think it's a good idea, not with a head wound, then what can she do? Leaving her alone isn't an option. Most people have a hard time with solitude, especially out here in the middle of the ocean. She needs to be kept busy. I learned this a long time ago when I first started taking kids into my camp. They're okay if you keep them busy. You have to take their mind off the past. They need to forget where they came from and only think about the present. That's the only way you get through this shit. But they are mostly boys, and they are all fighters. And Anya is not only a girl, she's a weak girl. I don't know how she's made it this far, to be honest. She would have been knocked out of my world by the time she was six. Girls don't last long in the gym. There is no female league in the ring. 
you fight whoever they put in front of you. And sure, chances are you're going to get a girl or two. Even I've fought three of them over the years. So if you're a little girl in a training camp, you got there for one reason and one reason only. You're not pretty enough or compliant enough to be a slave, and you're worth too much for them to kill you without seeing if they can make their money back first. And if you're a girl in a training camp and you make it to your tenth birthday, you got that far for another reason. The early years are mostly about following directions. But of course you have skills. At least the beginnings of them. You can take a punch and deliver one back. You've had more black eyes than you can count. Two of your ribs always scream when you take a deep breath. You don't smile much, if ever. And your thoughts are mostly consumed with revenge plans that will never pan out. If you're a girl in a training camp and you make it to 16, and I have one that age at my camp, you are a certified badass. You forgot all about your sex. There is no difference between you and the boys you train with on the mat. This is your life, and you either like it, or at the very least accept it. You have killed at least ten people to get to this point, and you have no regrets. You dream of making it all the way. But if you do make it all the way, age twenty or so, you are cold and demanding and jaded, and I use them as teachers to keep the little ones in line. I have three over the age of twenty. We all came up together. Me, Rainer, Mart, Cynthia, Ling, and Sissy. That's the only reason they're still alive. We fought for them. And we fought hard. And their loyalty to us is absolute. But I don't feel too sorry for the girls, because they have it easy compared to us. If you make it to twenty and you're a boy, they are just a younger version of me. They are out fighting for their own camps, trying to live long enough to buy their way out, just like I did. But no one makes it. That goalpost is so high and so far away I can't recall a single fighter in my lifetime who has actually bought their way out. I will be the first. And even though, at this point in the game, I can't see many ways in which I fail, there are ways. These men who run us can do anything they want even rip this reward out from under me for no reason whatsoever. I'm trusting Udolf to keep his word, but that doesn't mean he will. Almost no boys make it to twenty. They have even fewer chances than the girls because no one underestimates them in the ring. I've seen the boys when they get face to face with one of my girls. They smile, thinking it's going to be easy. But there are no rules in the kind of fighting we do. There are no refs. There are no tap-outs. The only way you get off the platform is by killing your opponent. So the very first thing I teach my girls is how to go for the balls. There is no weak spot on a female the way there is a man. Sure, you can hit them in the face. That stuns a girl who hasn't been hit much. But my girls know exactly what to do when a boy, or a man, hits them in the face. So they have no weakness, other than their smaller size and weight, when they step in that ring. And smaller size can always be used to their advantage if they have the right ajarn. And my girls have the best teacher on the planet. I'm not saying I've got a perfect record when it comes to the girls. I don't take a lot of them, for obvious reasons. And most of them die fighting before they are ten. But the ones who make it to Anya's age, you do not fuck with those women. I feel a little bad about leaving Cynthia, Sissy, and Ling behind when Mart, Rainer, Everett, and me walk away with our freedom. But they'll be okay. None of the twisted fucks like Lazar want women like them at their age. They are good for running camps, and that's what they'll do for the rest of their lives. Cook and clean and teach. It's the best I can do. I cannot afford to fight for their freedom. I don't have three more fights in me. Hell, I don't think I even have one more fight in me. I won't ever admit it. Not out loud, anyway. But if Anya wasn't on the platform that night, Pavo would have won. I let out a long exhale, then look over at Anya and see that she's done eating. Her crying is over now, her face wiped dry and her eyes waiting for me to tell her what comes next. What does come next? I could just take her back out to the training floor and make her do busy work, work on those moves I showed her yesterday but it's probably the wrong choice. So I get up, walk over to the long shelf, and pull out a puzzle. It's an old one, 
a black and white picture of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Hell, I think this puzzle has been here since I first started bringing kids out to the rock. And it's got to be missing a couple dozen pieces by now. I drop it on the table in front of Anya and point. I have every intention of leaving her here to do it herself while I go back outside, but then I think, shit. How long has it been since I sat down and did a freaking puzzle? When was the last time I took a slow day? So instead, I sit back down, grab the box, take off the lid, and dump out all the pieces. And when I look at Anya, she's not looking at me. She's looking at the table, at all the little jagged edges, and she's smiling. I smile, too, unable to stop it. She's pretty. A lot prettier than any girl I've been with in the last few years. I don't get to keep the girls I fight for. They go right to Udolf. What he does with them, I have no idea. So it's been a while since I've found myself wanting to stare at the face of a girl sitting across from me. She looks up, meets my gaze with bright eyes, and I suddenly feel like this is the right way forward. Make her happy, Quartz. Why not? Be nice to her. Feed her better than you have been. Go a little easy on her, even. Because she has no future. None at all. She will probably be dead in six months, or sold as a breeder. Because unlike Sissy and Cynthia and Ling, she is desirable. Not what Udolf is looking for, the sick fuck. But most men don't have Udolf's twisted sexual preferences. He's going to sell her, barter her, use her in some business negotiation, and that will be that. So, why not? Why not just make her last days happy? I start flipping pieces over, separating the edges from the middle pieces. Anya does the same, and soon enough we have two piles. Then she keeps going, separating them into black and white and shades of gray. I work on a few edge pieces and watch her busily building a section of city behind and to the right of the Eiffel Tower. That's kind of interesting. Most people would do the famous landmark first. But she is concentrating on some random group of buildings in the background. I continue with the outer edges and eventually both of us are standing up, taking this stupid puzzle seriously. I finish the edges and she still hasn't touched the tower, so I go for that next. We work quickly and efficiently, and pretty soon she's grabbing the pieces I've put together and fitting them into the big picture. Even though the puzzle is 500 pieces, it doesn't take us long to finish. And, astonishingly, none of the pieces are missing. Anya looks down at the completed picture and smiles. Has she been to Paris? Is she having a memory right now? I've been to Paris a few times myself though none of those memories are anything I'd ever want to remember. They were all for fights. In the early days, when the stakes were smaller and the rings were just gyms and not helipads on massive billion-dollar ships. When I look up, Anya is watching me. She points to the puzzle, to the spot she was concentrating on at the beginning. I squint my eyes and lean down to see it better. It's blurry, not meant to really be seen close up. Just something you put together from a distance. What is it? I sign. She places the back of one hand on top of her other palm, then presses them to her heart. It's not a real sign, but I think I get her meaning. Home? I ask. She smiles. No teeth, just upturned lips and bright eyes. You come from Paris? I stare at the puzzle, missing her response. Interesting both that she remembers where she came from and that she can pick out a building on a random puzzle in the middle of the ocean. When I look back up at her, she's watching me expectantly, wondering what we will do next. I hadn't really planned anything after the puzzle. I figured it would take forever. But I don't think we've been here for more than an hour or two. So it's not even lunchtime. I point to the shelf, then flash signs at Anya, giving her permission to make a decision. She looks delighted, a spring in her step as she gets up and makes her way over to the shelf, carefully going through the other puzzles. But then she looks at the books and scoots down to pull one out, sitting back on her butt to page through it. It's nothing I recognize, but it looks like something a preteen girl would read. 
the country club girls. Never heard of it. But I get up, walk over to Anya, pull the book from her hands and toss it over my shoulder. She looks up, startled. She can read that some other time. We need to do something together, I sign. We're not going to read. Especially not that book, I don't add. Pick a game. She looks back over to the shelf, then crawls over there and pulls out hungry, hungry hippos. When she looks up at me, she's smirking. Seriously, I sign. She makes motions with her hands, like she's actually making real signs, except she's not, and then gets up and takes the game over to another table and sits down. Hungry, hungry, hippos. I have never played this game, but I know it's annoying, because the kids love it. They fight over that game. I'm secretly hoping that the marbles are missing, but I should know better. Five hundred piece puzzle and not a single missing piece. So no, all the marbles are there and Anya dumps them in the middle of the hippos, still smirking but having enough manners to not gloat in my direction. She pushes the game towards the middle of the table and points to the chair across from her. Bossy. I sit. Anya has one hand over the marbles and the other already on the lever of the green hippo, ready to make its mouth open and gobble up a win. Fine. She wants to play. I'll play. She lifts her hand away from the marbles, and then she's flipping the lever on the green hippo. But there are four hippos to play with here, and only two people, so I flip the levers on the other three, my large hands and long fingers reaching round to make it work. Anya squeals at my cheating, swatting my hand off the pink one and taking over. For about thirty seconds we are children. Stupid, happy children. She even stands up, getting all serious about winning. And she does win. Then, when it's all over, we do it again, and again, and again. It is probably the most carefree moment I've had in, well, maybe ever. After about a dozen games, we get tired of it. I go to the shelf next and pick Connect Four. This was always my favorite. I don't play games much, but Rainer loves them, and he will endlessly taunt me until I give in. She wins the first game, but I let her. I kick her ass in the next five. And then she gets up and grabs trouble. Another annoying game. Why does she like the loud ones? We do this for hours. I pick risk. She picks perfection. I pick clue. She picks operation. And you'd think that the batteries in those loud-ass games would be dead, but no. The fuckers still work. I pick battleship. She picks Mousetrap. We smile. I laugh out loud dozens of times. She huffs a little, her vow of silence to practice to laugh back. But she is happy. Anyone could see that. Her hunger this morning, a long-lost memory. The gash on her head and my haphazard stitching something from another lifetime. And it occurs to me, later, after I've made dinner and we're back outside, sitting along the beam eating our rice and rehydrated chicken, that I've never had so much fun in my life. I've certainly never had a day like this out on the rock. I really do like this place. But when the kids are here, my thoughts are consumed with fighting. With skill levels. With the stress of who will be the next to die. And when I'm alone, I just slip into some quiet, somber life with the birds and the moon and the sea. I've never spent time with a girl like this. For a moment I wonder if this is what dating is like. Anya sighs with contentment when we lay our mats on the platform. Then she makes the sign for moon, pointing at it, the way I taught her last night. But she uses three fingers, and that's not right. I grab her hand out of the air and she looks over at me, startled. Then I position her fingers into four. We are on day four. She looks at her fingers then the moon, and huffs a laugh, getting it. The moon keeps time for us out here. That's how we measure the month. She stares up at it, fully aware that I am watching her. But she ignores me for nearly a minute before she turns her head and meets my gaze. Then she reaches for my hand, and, using her pointer finger, she writes, thank you, on my palm, one letter at a time. 
She goes to pull away, but I grab her hand back, then use my finger to write on her palm. Why? She watches me spell out this word. But I know, before she looks up at me and shakes her head, what her answer will be. Not even this day filled with food and games and smiles and laughter and a perfect night under a waning moon can make her answer that question. And for a moment, I'm conflicted. Do I even want to know? It's not going to be good. It's going to be evil. People don't stop talking after amazing things happen. They stop talking because they have lost all control over everything else in their life, and this one act of defiance is all they have left. But Udolf and Lazar, there is something there. Something that feels like a threat. To her, for sure. But to me as well. Maybe even Mart and Rainer and Everd. And if it were just me in danger, then fuck it. I'd fight my way through it. But when I asked Udolf for the chance to fight for Mart and Rainer and Everd, I tipped my hand. And now he knows what I find dear. I will walk away from the rest of them, but not those three. So I need to know what I'm up against. I can't afford to let Anya Bokori wrap her secrets in silence. Not if knowing them will keep me and the only family I have left safe. But I know how to play people. I know how to get what I want when I want it. I know how to lie and cheat and steal with the best of them. More importantly, I have the sick heart. I can turn that shit on and off at will. I can stop caring. Easily slip in the skin of a cold-blooded killer. A very patient, very slow, very deliberate, cold-blooded killer. And I do that now when I reach for her and pull her close. When I kiss her head and wrap my arms around her like a warm blanket. I lie to her with these actions because they tell her she is safe, and she is not. Not from Udolf, not from Lazar, and certainly not from me. I love three people in this world, and everything I do, I do for them. But her guard is down. I didn't plan this day for that reason, but it is the final outcome. And of the many ruthless things I've learned over my 27 years of life, the one at the top of the list is, give people what they expect. If I had tried this yesterday, she would have been suspicious. But after a long, soft, slow day, she expects a long, soft, slow night. So that's exactly what I give her. Đêm nay anh ngồi một mình dưới anh trăng, trăng khuya buông rèm, gửi lại anh nhớ em. Sông vẫn nâng lơ, dịu dàng có nước em, truyền tình năm xưa như khúc ca em đề. ngồi bên sông nhìn nước trôi theo dòng và cầm bên ta cùng dắt nhau về chapter 15 anya his arms wrap around me like a warm cloak his chest rising and falling against my back in a slow, easy, predictable rhythm. I can feel his lips on the back of my neck, not kissing me, just there. My body stiffens as I hold my breath. And he feels this. He is in tune with me, because his arms tighten a little, offering me comfort. It's okay, his arms say. We're safe, his slow breathing proclaims. And even though I know better, 
I exhale and decide to believe him. I am safe, at least from outsiders. But from him? I'm not so sure. Today was good. I did faint from hunger and bang my head. But I got two meals today and my wound is clean and cared for. He didn't make me train. In fact, our day was pretty fun. The puzzle was a nice surprise because my home base was there in that picture. And the memory of it was always sweet. It was always nice to go to that place in Paris. It would wipe away everything that had just happened. All the awful weeks that led up to Paris would be swept away, and I would be rewarded with shopping and bathtubs and an older, careful woman who only spoke Hungarian. And even that was nice. As much as I hate to admit it, the Hungarian, like Paris, felt like home. I don't have a lot of sweet, soft memories, so what are the odds that on this sweet, soft day, with the killer called Sick Heart, I would find my home base in a puzzle on an abandoned oil rig? I couldn't even begin to calculate those odds, but surely they are one in a billion, one in a trillion. But the point is, this slow, sweet night isn't entirely out of place. One thing leads to another. That's how we got here. So why am I so suspicious of him? Hmm, Anya, why indeed? He's a mentally unstable professional killer who just won you in a fight, plopped you down on a crumbling oil rig in the middle of the ocean, and has a creepy game room tucked away filled with things only children can appreciate. It should make sense. He felt sorry for me this morning. That led to a break in his schedule, which led to extra food and fun times in a game room clearly meant for the younger kids in his training camp. That's all this is. It's very clear. It all makes sense. Up until the point when he asked me why. Why don't you talk, Anya? I've been asked that question thousands of times. Hell, Bexie alone has asked it a few hundred at least. I've never answered any of them, so I'm sure as hell not going to answer Court Van Breda. But it was a tell. A sign that he is playing me. And he's good, I'll give him that, because I would like nothing more than to melt my back into his chest and let him make me feel safe. Instead, I just feel sad. All the good of this day wiped away from his deception. So I turn onto my stomach, breaking his tight hold on me, and just close my eyes to make it all go away. I wait for a little before letting myself drift off, wait to see if he will accept my rebuke or fight it. He doesn't fight it. He doesn't even seem to notice. Maybe he's even asleep, but I doubt it. He's a predator, and they live in the night. They know how to use the darkness to their advantage. But I have been hunted by predators far more dangerous than he is my entire life. And I know how to be silent and slip away. When I wake in the morning, Court is over near one of the nests, petting a super-sized chick. I don't move. Don't let him know I'm awake so I can watch. He must have just woken up because his sleeping mat is in his other hand, like he was just about to take it downstairs to the training floor. He has a crooked smile on his face as one of the parents wanders up to him, extending its open beak towards Court in what I might consider a threatening gesture. But Court just gives the giant creature a scratch on the head, and the bird closes its eyes in grateful happiness. I don't understand this man at all. 
he feels very human. But I saw him with my own eyes. I saw him drag that knife across Pavo's neck, then down the length of his torso, then literally rip his heart out and throw it at Lazar before dragging Pavo across the helipad and throwing him off the ship. And fine, I helped him with all of that, but my role in that night was circumstance. It wasn't something I'd do for a living. He looks over his shoulder at me like he can feel my gaze. He nods his head at me, smiling, then beckons me with a crooked finger. I get up, grab my mat, and follow him down the stairs. We drop our mats off, then he goes inside the kitchen. I follow, holding my breath to see if we will get breakfast. And we do. Not rice, he must not be in the mood to cook, because he hands me a strip of dried fish. I look at it dubiously. Yesterday I would have gobbled this up, no questions asked, but I'm not that hungry today. Still, if I refuse, he might not feed me tonight. So I take it, smile, and begin gnawing on it like jerky. Court finishes his food quickly, letting the long strip hang out of his mouth as he pokes around in the clinic, and by the time he points to one of two chairs, directing me to sit, he's done eating. I sit on the chair, and he maneuvers a rolling table between me and the other chair and orders me to put my hands on it. I do, and he sits and begins peeling off the old wrappings. Then he fills a bowl with hot water and salts, motions for me to place my hands inside, and gently rubs the dried blood away. When my knuckles are clean, he begins massaging my palms, the pads of his fingers and thumbs pushing into the muscles, kneading them and loosening them up. This feels quite nice, and I begin to question my conclusions about him. Maybe I was being overly cynical last night about his motives? Maybe he isn't a monster? It's so hard to tell. It's so hard to know if I should assign malice to the things he does. That game room, for instance. It could mean he cares about the kids he trains. And that's probably everyone's first impression. But I've seen things like that before. I've seen how tricky predators can be with children. Think about it. What better way to lure a child into the demon's den than to entice them with innocent, childish things? That game room could be the equivalent of a man in a white van asking a kid if they want some candy. Nothing is what it seems. Not where I come from. And I hate that. I really hate that. I wish I could just look back on yesterday and appreciate the puzzle and the games as something innocent. I wish I could just enjoy the way he's touching me right now. But instead, I have all this suspicion. When I glance up at him, he's not looking at me, all his attention focused on my hand. He drops it back into the bowl of hot water and picks up the other one, repeating his slow massage. And I can't help it. My shoulders drop, and I begin to relax a little. He glances up at me, noticing the change in my posture, and offers me a small smile. I look away. I'm not going to fall for it. I've seen too much to fall for it. After about a minute, Court takes the bowl away and places it in the sink. Then he comes back with a towel and pats my hands dry. He motions to me with his fingers. Stand up, I think he's saying. So I do. And he turns my chair around so the seat back is facing him, then directs me to sit and rest my right forearm on the top. I do this, and he begins wrapping my wrist and hand with gauze, stopping briefly to add a thick wad of cotton padding over my knuckles. He motions for me to make a fist, and open my fist, and make a fist again dozens of times, as he carefully winds the gauze through my fingers, over my knuckles and thumb in a figure eight, and around my wrist. It takes several minutes for him to finish, and by the time he's done, everything is tight with tape. He does the other hand as I watch, then he stands up, 
puts his chair back and begins to box the air, bouncing on his feet, twisting his hips and making hissing sound effects as he punches. Then he points to me, and I roll my eyes, embarrassed. But just as I do that, his hand darts towards me and slaps my cheek. I back up, startled. What the fuck? He does it again, not smacking me hard or anything, but still. What the hell? He pauses his bouncing and shakes his head. Then he brings one fist up to his cheek and points to it, then to me. Oh, I get it. I'm supposed to block him. I put my hand up to my cheek, but before I can even process anything else, he slaps me again, this time harder. I back up, but he takes a step forward, so I back up again and hit the cot. This sends me falling backwards onto the thin mattress. Court pauses and shakes his head, then offers me a hand and pulls me to my feet. He leans into my face so we are eye to eye. Then he takes my left hand and places it against my cheek, gripping my fist firmly in his, like he's making a point. I get it. He wants me to leave my hand there to protect my face, but then he just smacks me on the other cheek instead. I swing at him, backing him off. He finds this delightful, because he's smirking at me, bouncing from one foot to the next as he circles me in a fighter's dance. He points to his cheek. Hit me. You don't gotta tell me twice. I swing, but he blocks me and dances out of the way, smacking my cheek again. Only this time, it fucking stings. Dick. He's smiling big now, throwing fake punches at me with one fist as he points to his cheek with the other. I just stand there. Why even bother? I'm never going to make it past his blocks. So I just leave the clinic and walk out to the training platform. Because if he took almost an hour to wrap up my hands, there is no chance we are going to spend today doing puzzles. He follows me out picks up our jump ropes, throws mine at me, and then he starts skipping down the length of the platform. Doing all kinds of crazy things with that rope. I jump, and I don't complain. He fed me, wrapped up my hands, and let me rest for a whole day. I have no excuse today, so I jump. We do this for what seems like a very long time, at least an hour, because I start and stop about a hundred times. So out of breath, so out of shape. It starts to become embarrassing. Because Court is doing hops and double jumps and these high jump things, and never once does his rope get caught in his feet. Being around him on the training platform is nothing but a long lesson in self-loathing. I am not unfit. I sigh. I'm just not fit, either. This makes me chuckle a little, and when I look over at court, I find him watching me. He finishes his skipping, takes my rope as well as his, and tosses them both onto the floor near the wall. Then he points to the chalkboard with my name on it. It still has yesterday's schedule of drills, one, two, and three on it. I don't even remember what they were. But Court directs me onto the mat and shows me again. Baby step punch, retreat punch, hip pivot cross. Right, got it. I do them, and he watches for a little bit, coming in to correct my form and then stepping back several times. Then he nods and gives me the signal to keep going and takes himself over to another mat where he begins some slow martial arts type shit I haven't seen him do before. His back is to me, so even though I don't stop my drills, I don't really pay attention to them either. I pay attention to him. The way his back muscles stretch as he does a series of slow moves that look a little bit like Tai Chi. He has one massive piece of art on his back, two full-body skeletons doing martial arts. One of them has lost a leg. One only has a single arm. 
They are bleeding from the eyes, and their mouths are X'd out with black electrical tape. The one with two hands is signing something. I don't know what that sign means. I just know it's a sign. And there's an angel, a little girl with no face and soft, feathery wings, floating between his shoulder blades. All around the two fighters are people watching. Dead people. Decaying people. All of them with X'd out eyes. It's a fight, of course. One of his, probably. He pivots on the mat so we're facing each other again. I am still moving my feet and my hands, but my effort is all very... Who gives a fuck? Suddenly... Court is coming at me, fists in front of him, punching the air. I back up, but he sprints, and then he's slapping my face again. Only this time, he's not playing. It fucking hurts. He dances a circle around me, jabbing, trying to hit me. Well, not trying very hard, more like threatening to hit me. Then he points to my fist and places his fist against his cheek, telling me to block. Fuck that. I shake my head, letting him know I'm not playing a losing game with him again. But the sting from his next slap makes me gasp out loud. And that sting lingers as heat for many seconds as I just stare at him in a pissed off rage. I flip him off and he laughs out loud. It's low and deep, and for a moment it stuns me, and I get lost imagining what his voice really sounds like. Deep, I think. And just as those words flash through my head, he's got me by the legs, and I am slammed into the match so hard he knocks the wind out of me. I gasp for air, sucking in with a sick, wheezing sound. He wraps his arms around my shoulders, pins me, knees gripping my hips, and places his head into the crook of my neck and whispers, You better fight back, Anya, because if you don't, I'll make you wish you had. Then he's up, bouncing back on the mat, hands in front of his face like I am some kind of threat. I get up on my hands, scooting backwards. What the fuck? His words echo in my head. He said them in a soft voice, but they were not soft words. That was a threat. He points to me, then lifts his finger in an upward motion, telling me to get to my feet. When I don't, he rushes forward and sweeps his foot just over the top of my head. So close, I feel the wind he creates against my hair. I am breathing so hard, I'm gasping, still not able to draw in a full breath from the hard fall. But I scramble to my feet and quickly step away from him. His eyes narrow on me, like he's zeroing in on his target. What the hell? I can't fight this man. He dances forward and jabs at me, his fist coming so close to my face, I swear I feel the kiss of his knuckles against my lips. I strike, hitting him in the neck, and he laughs, bouncing backwards out of reach. Then he nods and beckons me with his fingers, daring me to do it again. But before I can plan anything, he's already slapped my face again, and he's not playing, because that shit hurts. And in the half moment that I'm thinking those words, he slaps me again. I rush him, swinging wildly. He doesn't back off. He covers his face with his fists and lets me land every single punch. Mostly I punch his hands, which is stupid, but I get one past them and hit his throat. He starts coughing as he bounces backwards. Well, it might actually be a laugh and not a cough, but I did hit him. He smiles as his feet stop and his posture straightens. 
His fists fall down to his chest, and he nods at me. I hold my breath, waiting for him to talk again. But he doesn't. He just points to the mat and quickly runs through my series of drills. Putting a lot of force behind the fake punches and a lot of effort into his feet. Then he stops again and points to me, narrowing his eyes and growling. A clear threat that says, Do not half ass your work in my gym. I let out a long breath and salute him with two fingers. Message received, sick heart. Then I turn my back on him before he can say anything else and get back to work. Chapter 16 Court Anya came out here this morning thick with memories of yesterday's soft landing. Hazy with the kindness I showed her in the clinic as I wrapped her hands, comforted with the extra food I put inside her belly. I knew she would. That's why I turned my back on her when I started the kata. I have trained hundreds. I am not a fool. I know that when I turn my back, the natural instincts kick in. Few people work harder when they can get away with working less, and Anya is nothing special. It is only when you are watched, only when you think your effort might be rewarded, that you put in full effort. Her face has to be stinging. I hit her quite hard a couple times, but she's the one who let her guard down, not me. I return to my place on the mat and start my kata over again. She keeps her back to me through the entire thing, repeating her three simple drills. I watch her carefully for any sign of slacking, but even though she tires and her form becomes sloppy by the time I move on to my own drills, she doesn't repeat her no-fucks attitude again. Sometime around noon, I take her over to the bag and show her the punches I want her to work on. The padding I put over her knuckles will keep her from bleeding through the gauze and tape, but she will split those wounds open again today. She won't know it until I take her wraps off, though. That's the important part. Perception is 90% of reality. Thinking it's true makes it true. That if she thinks that padding is protecting her, that it is. Her real test will come tomorrow when she knows better. But for today, she is blissfully unaware. The pain she feels when she punches the bag will be attributed to her prior wounds. When I lead her over to the middle of the mat in the late afternoon, her face is red and sweaty, and she has been breathing like an asthmatic for several hours now. But I don't care. We started this day with a lesson she failed, so she's going to get over that before we stop. As soon as we're in the middle, I turn on her. My fingertips have slapped her cheek before she even knows what's happening, but she reacts this time. A full day of focus has prepped her for this. I reach out again, but this time she blocks me. It's a sloppy block that I could easily penetrate, but I'm not really trying to slap her. I just need to teach her that first girl lesson. Men will hit you in the face. There is nothing you can do about that. All you can do is mitigate. I strike again, but her block is better this time. I bounce from foot to foot, dancing a circle around her. She's not light on her feet. There is no bouncing, but she hops a little mimicking her bad form with the jump rope as she tries to keep up with me. I strike again, but this time she surprises me with an attempted left hook as she blocks. 
She doesn't connect, not even close, but I pause and smile down at her, then close my eyes, bow, and straighten up. She's scowling at me when I open my eyes again. I make a gesture of, your turn. She thinks about that for a moment, then gives me something between a nod and a head bow. It's pathetic, but I'll take it. I close the distance between us with my hands at my sides, then clap her on the back, place both hands firmly on her shoulders, and turn her towards the stairs. But instead of going up, I direct her to go down. She balks, probably thinking back to her punishment. But I just go first and make her follow me. It was almost unbearably hot today, but I can't get Anya used to a daily shower. We'll run out of water, and unlike food, Fresh water isn't something we can replace without a lot of effort to collect rainwater. And I don't feel like collecting rainwater this time around. Salt water, on the other hand, is plentiful. Anya follows me, her footsteps tentative at first. And when I pass the level where I locked her up, she pauses on the landing near the gate, unsure if she wants to follow me down. I look over my shoulder and wink, which makes her frown at me, her brows furrowed together in a look of confusion. Then I beckon her with a crooked finger and leave it at that. Hey, if she wants to go to sleep tonight dripping with sweaty grime, that's her choice, I guess. But not me. I'll take a dip in the ocean over nothing any day. I go all the way down the steps until I'm standing on a long, narrow landing about twenty feet above the water. Everything down here is slick with algae, and when the tide is low, you can get a peek at what's underneath the surface. But it's not low now so all I can see is the thick tendrils of dark green algae waving at me, inviting me to jump in. Anya comes up behind me, and when I turn, I just barely manage to grab her arm before her bare feet slip on the slick surface and she goes down. She grabs onto me, gripping my forearm as she scrambles her feet, trying to get her balance. I don't need to study her eyes for long before I realize she's afraid. What's that about? me? Does she think I brought her down here to kill her? If that's it, she's just dumb. So what is it? She can't swim? She's afraid of heights? Maybe a little bit of all of the above? All of this is very bad news for poor Anya here, but this day started with face slapping. I gotta round it all out with an equally impactful lesson. Something for her to ponder as she lies under the moon tonight. Something for her to chew on. Something for her to learn from. I smile at her and she, being the insightful girl she is, i.e., one who not only survived a childhood of slavery, but somehow defied her lot in life as Lazar's fight night sacrifice, understands immediately that this is not a good smile. Not for her, anyway. But I'm enjoying myself. I wrap my arms around her pinning her arms tight against her body. She grabs at them, frantic, afraid, and on the verge of panic. But my feet are already moving towards the edge of the platform. There is no time for a tantrum, no time for anything but the soft, low words I whisper into her ear as I jump off the platform, taking her with me. Hold your breath, Anya, or this is going to go bad real fast. I don't know if she does that because we are already falling. And then we plunge feet first into the ocean and the world shifts from sharp sunshine clarity to murky slow motion blur. We shoot down like a bullet, at least twenty feet under the rig. The sun is nowhere near close to setting, but it's lower on the horizon, so the rays from above filter down from the surface at just the right angle to partially illuminate the dark water below the rig. Anya is squirming in my arms. I have her restrained at the elbows, so her hands are free to try to pry at my grip. But I hold tight for a few more seconds, just enough for her to calm down and see what I need her to see. It's easy to know when she does that, because she goes completely still. We are already floating back up towards the light, but it's a slow ascent more than enough time for her to study the legs of the platform through the haze of bubbles and see the breathtakingly beautiful reef the ugly rig above is hiding. Large bubbles float out of her mouth, like maybe she just gasped, 
and I allow myself a smile as we break the surface and I let her go. She is coughing and sputtering, but she turns towards me, the shock of the drop replaced by the surprise of the secret reef. She's not sinking, and her panic is gone, replaced by delight. She smiles at me, frantically wiping at her eyes and trying to catch her breath. I cock my head at her and then dive back down. She follows me. I swim around to the other side of the platform leg and watch her study a dozen different kinds of coral and aquatic plants that completely cover the steel underneath. Small schools of fish flitter around us, darting this way and that as bigger fish slowly pass by. Anya reaches out towards a coral, but I grab her hand and pull it back, shaking my head at her. Some of them sting and I'm not really sure which ones those are, so the general rule is that we don't touch them. She looks back at the reef, then up at the surface. I know she can't hold her breath much longer, but she is reluctant to go back up. It makes sense, though. This silent world is familiar. That's why I like it. And when I first discovered that the rig's platform had actually created an artificial reef back when I was a kid, I felt like I had been dropped into a book. One of those boys' adventure books where they survive a plane crash or a sinking ship and end up on a tropical island with secrets. I found my island's secret. Finally, there is no way she can hold her breath any longer and she shoots up to the surface. I follow and emerge just a moment later. And then we just float there. Two inconsequential people immersed in a whole planet of water. I try not to see myself like that when I'm out here. I try not to picture this platform from space, a speck surrounded by the massive weight of the ocean. And then me, just dust, really, in the grand scheme of things. Because when I see this world for what it really is, that thought evokes a sense of overwhelming smallness. Our problems are so small from the perspective of the universe but to us, they are often overwhelming. I try to keep it all in perspective, but it's hard when you're surrounded by evil people who want to torture you for fun, make you fight and kill for money, and ships, and women. Anya puts her face in the water and just floats like that, belly down, arms out, body undulating with the rhythm of the ocean, like she's snorkeling without equipment. Every now and then she tilts her head to the side for a breath, and then she resumes her study of the reef. I roll over and lie on my back, floating with her, my fingers twisted up in her t-shirt so she can't float away, my eye on the beams above, keeping it in perspective. It would be a mistake to assume that we are anchored to this platform just because we are underneath it. It would be very easy to float away. Too easy, actually, to float so far there is no chance of getting back. Even a very strong swimmer might not be able to fight the will of the ocean's path around a rotating earth. But we don't float far. We just bob with the waves, up and down. I let her gaze down, but I don't let her dive alone. No one dives alone out here. Ever. Not even me. That's why we keep a stash of food out here because fishing by myself is a risk Mart won't let me take. Soon, though. Soon, Anya and I will run out of protein, and we will have to fish this reef. It's gonna suck, but it's at least ten days away, so I push that thought aside when she turns over on her back and floats face up with me, her fingers twisted up in the loose fabric of my shorts, mine still holding fast to her T-shirt. And it's nice, I think to float with her, to be with her. Just two people gazing up at a low, hot sun. I turn my head and look at her. She's got her eyes closed, but her skin is getting cold and she's starting to shiver. So I grab her hand and we call it a day. We have to climb a slimy ladder to get back up to the long metal landing. I make her go first, just in case she slips. Also so I can look at her ass through the thin, wet fabric of her shorts. But mostly to keep her safe. She sustained enough injuries over the past week. We both have. It's time to settle into this now. 
Once on the landing, she begins to shiver for real, wrapping her arms around herself in an attempt to keep warm. The sun is on the other side of the rig, so we're in the shade, and there's no hope of getting warm down here. But once we climb all the way up to the helipad, the heat of the sun is a relief. She stands in the middle, face tipped towards the final rays of the day. But I grab her hand and lead her over to a ladder on the side of the mechanical building. This one is not coated with algae, but the paint is pitted and flaking from decades of salt water and sun. Once we're on top of the roof, the wind is free to whip past us, blowing her t-shirt up like a balloon and making her scramble to keep it from flipping up. I shrug when she looks at me, embarrassed after partially flashing me her tits, and she sucks in a deep breath and points her face back at the sun. I do the same, closing my eyes and opening my arms wide, letting the hot wind flow past me. I crack one eye open when Anya walks up next to me and smile when she does the same. I'm not exactly tired. I would not call this a particularly strenuous training day. Most of the time I was distracted by Anya. But I'm tired in other ways. The way I was that day we spent inside. Weary. So I drop down to the roof and lie back, hissing a little when my back touches the sun-baked concrete. Anya drops down beside me, sighing when she realizes how warm the roof is. I peek at her again. Her eyes are closed and her shirt drying from the wind. Less than a week on the rock and her hair is already a tangle of unruly, blonde, streaked waves and her skin is already losing the too pale look she had when I first saw her back on the ship. Her cheeks are pink, but her arms and legs are starting to turn a nice shade of golden brown. I look back up at the sun and close my eyes, letting the yellow orb stain the back of my eyelids. This feels nice, the way yesterday felt in the game room. Comfortable. Anya flips over on her stomach, hands under her cheek like a pillow her head turned away from me. She looks like she's ready to fall asleep. I turn over as well, then my fingertips are pulling up her t-shirt, exposing the small of her back. She goes stiff and sucks in a breath. I drag the tips of my fingers lightly over her skin, tracing a pattern and making it prickle up in goosebumps. She doesn't move. I know what she thinks. She thinks I want sex. And maybe I do but mostly I don't. I have decided that I will not use sex to get her secret. It's not fair. I would be one of them if I did that, and I'm not one of them. I might kill for them on command, but I am not one of them. So no, I'm really not thinking about fucking her. I'm thinking about knowing her. And that is a far, far more dangerous thing. Because once I know her, I won't be able to unknow her, will I? And I'm already about to walk away from almost three dozen people I know very well. I'm not sure I can add another one to that list and live with myself afterward. But then she turns her head my way and opens her eyes. They are blue. I know they are blue, but right now, the sunlight plays tricks and turns them the color of the sea. Deep green one moment bright teal the next. The corners of her mouth lift up into a small smile and she stares at me. What does she see? The killer? The trainer? The game player? The diver? Which of these men is the one she likes? Definitely not the killer or the trainer, which is too bad, because that's who I am 99% of the time. She frowns, like she's reading my mind. And she might be. You get good at reading expressions when people don't talk. You learn to see inside them. You learn how to know them without their consent. But this is a dangerous path to go down, so I slip my hand up her shirt instead. She closes her eyes, but opens them back up almost immediately. Closing them is giving in. You don't have to be a mind reader or a mute to know that and she's not the kind of girl who gives in without a fight. But that's what I do best. I'm a fighter. So this comes off like a challenge to me. 
I began tracing bigger patterns over her entire back. Figure eights and spirals. Squiggly lines that start between her shoulder blades and end up in the small of her back, just above the waistband of her borrowed shorts. I keep my touch feather light and super soft. She winces and closes her eyes again, tensing her shoulders. And this is a dead giveaway for ticklishness. So I poke her. She giggles and draws back, opening one squinty eye to warn me with a half-assed glare. I tisk my tongue and sloppily sign. Don't warn me, girl. That's just another challenge, with one hand. She can't even follow two-handed sign language, let alone my made-up shorthand. So she squints her eye a little tighter, putting some threat behind her warning. I almost laugh, but then poke her again instead. She wriggles away this time, but I grab her and pull her back, poking her a few more times just to prove I can. She twists and kicks and elbows me as she tries to get away. But in my arms, she is very small. And all I have to do is hold her tight to make her helpless. I don't even need to use both arms. So I have one free hand to keep poking. She goes nuts. Like, this is the girl I want to see on the mat downstairs. That's how nuts she goes. Her back is bucking, her knees are jabbing, and she's laughing out loud. God, she has a nice laugh. It's a little high-pitched, like it was that first time we met on the ship. But it rolls, too, smooth and easy. Something you want to hear more of, not less. And suddenly that's all I can think about. I want to hear her voice. Is it deep or soft? Hard or sweet? I stop poking and rearrange my body so I'm just a little bit over the top of her propped up on my elbows. I put one hand up and slowly sign. Talk to me. It's an easy sign and she gets it, because she goes tense again, then shakes her head no. But then she repeats my signs back with modifications, pointing at me, tapping her chin with a sideways hand, and then pointing to herself. You talk to me. I already did. She shakes her head and makes a sign for whisper. And now it's my turn to go tense and just stare at her for a moment. Because she got it right. The sign is talk, but if your other hand is cupped on the side of your mouth, it means whisper. Like you're gonna whisper in someone's ear. Did she just... I squint at her and she frowns in response. Has she taught herself sign language? That's not possible. Not this fast. It hasn't even been a week. Then whisper to me, I sign. She shakes her head again, and then she touches my lips with the edge of her fingertips and slowly drags them up my cheek before pulling away. Kiss. That was the sign for kiss. She wants me to kiss her. I know this is a distraction. I know who I'm dealing with. A girl who's been silent so long no one remembers her last spoken words. A girl who should be dead but isn't. A girl who should be anywhere but here with me, but is. A girl who four days ago didn't know a single bit of sign language and now knows enough to stun me silent. So I should really know better. I should push her. Keep going. Because I could make her talk. I know I could. But then she leans towards me, and we're not that far apart, so that kiss she just asked for is now an absolute guarantee. Our lips touch and just linger there for a breath. And so many things go through my mind in that breath. I want to resist her offer, push her down, roll over and forget where I'm at and who I'm with. But that's just fucking stupid. I like this girl. A lot. I want to kiss her. And all those other thoughts earlier about not wanting sex. Well, this seems like more than sex. So that's something I am interested in. When our lips touch, everything that happens next, whether it's today, tomorrow, or next year, everything that happens next is preordained. And there's no way to stop it. 
I cup my hands around her face, my thumbs caressing small circles on her cheeks as her mouth opens and her tongue touches mine. There is maybe one more moment, one more chance to stop the car crash that's coming, but it's such a small moment, so short and tiny it barely exists. And what comes next is pure lust. I open my mouth, kiss her hard, bite her lip, grab her breasts as I drop my full weight over her. She kisses me back, but her kiss isn't urgent, like mine. It's soft, and even though we're stained with salt water and sweat and the wind, she tastes so sweet. I want this kiss to last forever. Her fingernails dig into the muscles of my back and I hiss a little, because she's not being gentle. The time for gentleness is over now and all that's left is sex. She knows it as well as I do, because she helps me get her shorts off. She's the one who takes off her shirt as I watch, my eyes drawn to her tight nipples and perfectly shaped breasts. The fading bruises on her skin left over from the fight just add to my desire. This girl saved my life, and that's so fucking hot. I flip her over so she's on top of me, ready to show her how grateful I am. She smiles and her eyes dance with mischief, or playfulness, or maybe just power. Her wild, tangled hair falls forward to brush against my chest as I pull her face down to mine and claim her mouth. She's naked, but I'm not. Her fingertips are tugging on my shorts as we kiss our tongues dancing as they twist together as she pulls my shorts over my hips. Her hand is between my legs, grabbing for my cock. It's hard and thick, and when she squeezes me and begins slowly pumping her hand up and down my shaft, I have to hit pause on this moment and close my eyes, so it can't slip by without me noticing. Anya's lips on my cheek make me open them again. She's leaning over me her full, round breasts pressing against my chest. Her ass is up in the air a little, then I smack it and grab it and smack it again, hard. I want to leave marks on this girl. I want to leave my mark on this girl. She must be a mind reader, because her mouth dips down to my neck and she bites me. She doesn't nip me. No, she fucking bites me. Hard enough to make me hiss. Then she is kissing her way down my chest, her hand still on my cock, still working it, her thumb caressing small circles over the tip on the upstroke. I sigh a little, so fucking grateful I brought her here. She was worth the fight, worth the price too. Because I don't just like her, I want her. Her lips reach my stomach and she licks my abs, dragging her tongue across the taut muscles. I put my hands on her head, ready to push her face down to my dick and put it in her mouth, but she pulls back a little, just enough to look up at me and says, Shh, with that pouty fucking mouth of hers. This is enough to calm me down, at least for a moment, because shushing me is sound, and I want to hear all the sounds from this girl right now. She scoots down a little more and I know it's coming, so I twist her hair around my fingers and promise to let her take her time. It pays off, because she knows exactly what to do with my fat cock. She doesn't put it inside her mouth, not at first. She teases the fuck out of me. Her tongue dances around the tip of my dick, her hand still squeezing, her thumb still massaging the head, and I give in. Fuck it. I give in. I just close my eyes and picture it all in my head as she licks me. Up and down my shaft. Over the tip. Then down again. Her hand slips down to grab my hard, tight balls, squeezing them just a little as her other hand sends her fingertips exploring the sensitive skin just underneath. She places her mouth low on my shaft then lets it slowly dip down until she's wrapping her lips around my balls. I twist her hair a little tighter in my fingers, pulling on her scalp. But if she objects, or even notices, she doesn't say anything. Then her mouth is moving back up, 
her hand once again squeezing my shaft, and then there it is, her hot breath caressing the tip of my cock, her tongue flicking over it, her mouth open and ready. I groan with anticipation, unable to stop my primal reaction to her seduction, and then I push her face down, forcing my dick inside her. She accepts my command and opens wider, letting it slip to the back of her throat. And I swear to God, I've had plenty of blowjobs in my lifetime, but this isn't a fucking blowjob. She is making love to my dick. I rock my hips forward, fucking her face a little. She responds by getting up on all fours, balancing on hands and knees as she devours my cock. I slap her ass again. This feels good. Very fucking good. But I want to push this girl down on the ground face first and take her from behind. I breathe out, getting control of myself. No. I'm not going to do that here. Not on the fucking concrete. That's how you fuck a whore. And Anya Bokori is a lot of things, but whore is not on that list. She pulls back, probably sensing my thoughts, and then straddles me her hips slightly elevated, her hand on my cock, aiming it right between her legs. She is so wet, she drips down the side of my dick before I even get inside her. And then she leans forward, both hands smacking my chest with a hard slap, just to make sure I'm awake for what's coming. Trust me, Anya, I am. And then sinks down, forcing my cock inside her. We both close our eyes and moan, and in this moment, I want to make all the promises to Anya Bokori. I want to hold her. I want to love her. I want to keep her. I want to save her. She comes, her head back, mouth open and moaning, her fingernails digging into my chest, her pussy clamping down on my dick her hips still moving, her wind-tangled hair blowing out behind her. And then I come, too, and I make all those promises with my fingers, knowing full well I will never keep them.